Donald Trump doesn't want me to be the nominee. We need a mass political movement, not just to go to Washington, but to change it before it is too late. I know what's broken in this country. I know how to fix it. The stakes could not be higher. We need to outcompete them and win. I have that experience of winning in red and purple and bright blue areas. It's primary night in New Hampshire. Voters cast their ballots today in what's known as the first in the nation primary just a week after the chaotic Iowa caucus. Good evening, I'm Libby Casey. Welcome to live coverage from the Washington Post. We're broadcasting from downtown Manchester, New Hampshire. Most of the polls just closed at 7 o'clock, and we do expect to see some results soon. We have a team of reporters across the state tonight. Let's start with Joyce Coe. I'm at the watch party for Bernie Sanders. The senator from neighboring Vermont is the man to beat tonight in New Hampshire. Pete Buttigieg had a surprisingly strong performance in Iowa, and his team is confident he can do it again here. I'm Jorge Ribas at the Buttigieg camp. Elizabeth Warren was once a favorite to win in New Hampshire, but has faded in recent weeks. I'm Hannah Jewell, here with Team Warren. I'm Rhonda Colvin. Few thought Amy Klobuchar would still be in the race at this moment, but she continues to surprise. Will New Hampshire push her forward? We'll check in with our reporters throughout the night. And joining me now here in Manchester, two of my Washington Post colleagues, national political reporter James Homan and Amber Phillips, political reporter for The Fix. Welcome and thanks so much to both of you for being here. So, James, how important are tonight's results? It's hugely important because of the chaos in Iowa last week. It didn't, I mean, it, it did clarify things, but it didn't crystallize things. And obviously, it took several days to figure out a result. So I think that this is hugely important uh, in order to winnow the field. New Hampshire is going to play the role that Iowa traditionally has. Mm. And there's this question of who wins tonight also, but, but who loses as well, Amber. So what's the more important question tonight? Who rises or who falls? Absolutely. We're looking at the bottom of the pack. There's this really tight race for third with big names that we thought by this point might be in the first or second tier. Joe Biden and Elizabeth Warren among them. They had poor showings in Iowa. Uh, there's a chance when James talks about winnowing the field that they finish disappointingly tonight in New Hampshire and have serious questions to deal with with their campaign. There's the question of delegate count, but there's also just the momentum. And James, we, we were in Iowa together last week and we were looking at this, like who would leave Iowa strong? And when that night just devolved into you know, no results chaos, it, it left openings for, for everybody to sort of say, I, I did well tonight. Yeah, and in fact, it ended up not working out well for anyone. I think that there was this feeling the day after, maybe this was good for Joe Biden because the results obscured what a bad night he had. But I think it was very clear to voters in New Hampshire that he had a bad night in Iowa. I think Pete Buttigieg... You could even hear it in, in his voice as he was giving a speech that night. Pete yeah. Buttigieg and Bernie Sanders, both incredibly frustrated. They sort of didn't get what they wanted coming out. Uh, of that night, and I think you've heard and sensed some bitterness over the, the last few days that they sort of feel like they would have had more momentum if they had both declared victory that night. So the big question, of course, was who won in Iowa, and a week later it does seem that the numbers have finally settled, even though there's still controversy over those results. So let's look at how things have turned out. Pete Buttigieg won 26.2% of state delegates, giving him 14 of Iowa's delegates. Bernie Sanders just slightly behind with 26.1 and 12 delegates. Elizabeth Warren got 18.1% and eight delegates. Joe Biden got 15.8% and six delegates. Also, Amy Klobuchar in there, 12.3% and one delegate out of Iowa. Now, this year, Iowa reported the popular vote count as well, and Bernie Sanders led that, causing him to declare a victory of sorts, even as Buttigieg edged him out in the delegate count. And a reminder that tonight here in New Hampshire, another 24 delegates are at stake. Amber, when you look at those numbers, Sanders and Buttigieg so close there. Yeah, I talked to politicos on all sides of the Democratic spectrum who spun it, Libby, every which way. <laughs> Biden, this was good for Biden because it wasn't like he came in fourth headline, was the big part of the night, but Buttigieg and Sanders were frustrated. I think the end result of us talking about the Iowa results finally on the night in the New Hampshire primary is that New Hampshire voters who might have had one or two or three choices in this big field still have one or two or three choices. A New Hampshire Democrat uh, Politico told me, you know, 
they like to make their own decision, but they also look to Iowa for instruction. Okay, maybe my first choice didn't do that well in Iowa, so I'm going to knock them off. There's just less decisiveness right now, and that creates undecisiveness tonight. People in New Hampshire love to say Iowa picks corn, New Hampshire picks presidents. <laughs> and it's funny because people here love to insist that they don't really pay attention to Iowa, that it, you know, if they... Uh, but I was at a Buttigieg rally right after Iowa, and I talked to half a dozen people who said I wasn't taking Buttigieg seriously at all. He wasn't even on my list. I thought he was auditioning for vice president. But now, because of his performance, I'm taking him seriously. And that is why you saw him surge in some of the tracking polls. He jumped 20 points uh, from Monday night to Thursday night. Well, we will be all throughout the night looking at the numbers and how they come in. And we'll be checking in with our election insights team back in Washington, who will help us make sense of it all. So let's go there now to the post, Jeremy Bowers. Jeremy, good evening. So, so what are the preliminary exit polls telling us at this point? Hey, thanks a lot, Libby. You know, we do have some of those early exit poll numbers. And for a little more insight into that, we have polling analyst Emily Guskin. Emily, what are the three big takeaways you have from tonight's early exit poll numbers? Well, one thing that we've learned Learned, and these are preliminary, so they could change as the evening goes on, is that about half of New Hampshire Democratic primary voters say that they made their decision on who to vote for in the last few days. Now, that's a lot more than we saw in Iowa, where 36 percent said they made their decision in the last few days, and about twice as many who said the same in New Hampshire in 2016. So that's a pretty exciting, big, different number. We also know that, um, in, again, preliminary exit poll data, that about 6 in 10 said they preferred a candidate that would beat Trump in the general election, as opposed to someone that they agreed with on the issues, which about 1 in 10 said. Wild. So some of these things are a little bit interesting to me. Let's bring in David Byler for a little bit of context. David is an anal a data analyst and a really swell guy. He works for Post Opinions. David Byler, what does this mean to you? What's your big takeaway from some of these early exit polls? Thanks, Jeremy. Those numbers are really interesting, and they make me want to watch three candidates in particular. Um, if people are deciding in the last few days, they're probably trying to price in the debate. We know that Amy Klobuchar sort of had a much lauded performance in that debate, and that she's been gaining in the very tail end of some of these polls, so I'd want to watch her. I'd want to watch Joe Biden, who had sort of a disappointing fourth place in Iowa, and has been losing support in sort of a variety of different polls, national and in various states. I'd want to see if that holds up. And I'd also want to watch Pete Buttigieg. Pete Buttigieg is a demographic, you know, sort of decent fit for the state. He does very well with older voters, uh, some rural voters, some white voters. And he won Iowa by the state delegate equivalent account. So he'd be one to watch and see if he's gaining momentum. That's outstanding. Now, that's the kind of stuff we're going to be keeping an eye on here in the studio for you tonight, Libby. Great. Thanks, Jeremy. So I know the Post has this cool tool that lets people create their own election forecasts. How does this work? Yeah, it's really great. Actually, I have it bookmarked on my phone. You know, the person who built that is right here in the studio. David, this is your baby. Tell us a little bit about how the simulator works. Yes. So the uh, Post Opinions New Hampshire primary simulator is my baby. We're going to have one of these simulators for all the major primaries. We had one for Iowa. We've got one up for New Hampshire now. We've got other ones coming. And essentially what it does is it allows our users and readers to adjust different parts of sort of the election, fundraising, polling, other aspects of things, and sort of see how it plays out under different conditions. So we actually did a specialized run of the Post Opinion Simulator for this show uh, to try to get some likely ranges for the candidates. And what we found is that in our likely range, uh, we had Sanders getting 21 to 36 percent of the final vote, uh, Buttigieg somewhere between 14 to 28, and Biden, Warren, and Klobuchar all in sort of a 7 to 18 percent range. Now, these aren't hard and fast numbers. They're a simulated likely range. Uh, it's possible for a candidate to go above or to go below if they boom or if they bust. But really, this paints a picture where Sanders is ahead, Buttigieg is within striking district, and a win by anyone else would be uh, sort of an upset. It seems about right. Now, Emily, is there anything in that that really draws your eye, anything that makes you think? One of the things that I keep coming back to is that no matter what happens in these primaries, when we move to the general election, um, that's going to be an interesting thing. And about 8 in 10 New Hampshire Democratic primary voters said they'd vote for the Democratic um, nominee no matter who it was. Outstanding. That's what we've got for you tonight. Libby, back to you on the ground in New Hampshire.
Great. Thank you so much, Jeremy. Appreciate it. Uh, James, as we look at how the polls have tracked over the months, I mean, it's really been a yo-yo. Like, it's been all over the place. Right? I look back to just October, and we saw Biden doing well, then Warren, then Buttigieg, then Bernie Sanders. Uh, so what does it say to you that, that voters are sort of evolving and, and changing their decisions as these weeks have gone by? It shows that there's an identity crisis in the Democratic Party, that there is tension between the heart and the head, between whether to pick someone who can defeat Donald Trump versus someone who agrees with you on the issues. And then what does it mean if you want to pick someone who's going to defeat Donald Trump? You know, everyone kind of claims they're the most electable candidate. And so I think those preferences have sort of changed over the past few months. I think some of the candidates have gotten scrutiny that weren't really ready for it. You know, everyone who kind of rose to the top. And I think it also reflects that a lot of Democrats just don't love any individual candidate. Uh, the, the field has winnowed pretty dramatically already. It's important to remember. I think, you know, it, it will winnow further tonight. Uh, but we, it started off with a lot of people. There was a lot of shopping around. There's always shopping around. But in this case, you know, I, I found a lot of voters around New Hampshire over the last couple of days who literally in, in kind of their personal journey walked through that where they said, you know, last year I was I was for Bernie when he got in. Then I was for Elizabeth. And one of the funny things about a place like New Hampshire is they use the candidates' first names, you know, as if they know them. And I was for Elizabeth, and then, uh, you know, I, I was for Biden because I thought he could beat Trump and we needed to beat Trump. And then, you know, I, then I was for Buttigieg, and now I'm for Amy. And so you actually find people who have legitimately sort of gone this whole circuit. And, uh, and then the other thing that's in flux, you know, you had s someone like Cory Booker who had, you know, a following, maybe it was a couple percentage points. And so those people on, you know, it kind of went on the market and, uh, have moved around, but it's definitely more fluid than in past years. Mm -hmm. Some of that's the confusion from Iowa. Uh, and some of it's just a willingness to, you know, no one there. Joe Biden was never a particularly strong front runner. Uh, Iowa also likes to be contrarian historically. You, know, you look back at like 1992, uh, 1988, the incumbent incumbents can't necessarily count on New Hampshire. And so I think that there, Joe Biden was never particularly strong in New Hampshire. And then it was, wasn't was clear who the, the non-Biden candidate was going to be. Yeah, Joe Biden is not going to be here tonight, Amber. <laughs> He's picked up stakes. He's going on to South Carolina. Uh, you're raising your eyebrows, and I think that's an yeah. accurate uh, <laughs> reflection of, of this. Listen, I was, with, I was at an event last night down the street with him. And, and he looked at voters and he said, you know, stick with me 24 hours. And the tired in his voice came through and he said, 24 more hours. And, you know, we're going to have a good primary when we go to the South. He like completely skipped over their state and their voters. And then sure enough, the next day we find out he's going to South Carolina. It speaks to the trouble he's in. If you're if you're Joe Biden, you do not want to be polling, as tracking polls show him now, with Amy Klobuchar, someone who's considered in the third, maybe even fourth tier of candidates thus far. It's literally, a huge problem for him. Literally, the first thing he said in the debate yeah. on Friday night, yeah. <laughs> the opening statement of the debate was, you know, I'm not going to do very well here. Iowa was a gut punch. And a Let's reminder that that Carolina. debate was here. It's at St. Anne's. <laughs> it, it, like it was here in New Hampshire. And so it was, even though it was nationally televised, like right. it, it was, you know, it was a, their chance to, to seal the deal with New Hampshire voters. And, and right it out of the gate, it, he it said, It wasn't you know. strategic. That was, yeah. I talked to some Biden campaign staffers who were kind of huh. like hitting themselves on the head. Like, why would you say that yeah. at the top of the debate? I was with him on Sunday at a high school just a few miles south of here. He choked up. He got incredibly emotional. Uh, you know, he's in, and uh, you know, I think he's kind of been all over the place. And then I think what happened was because he sort of was fading. I think in some ways he became more emotional, mm -hmm. and and so he like he gave a, frankly a rambling speech on Saturday night a few miles, actually a few blocks from here at the uh, a state party dinner where he kind of talked about going to a food bank mm -hmm. and how sad it was to see all these kids. And he was just kind of in many ways very emotional uh, because he realized that you, you, his whole pitch in Iowa, his whole pitch was, I'm the most electable candidate. But when you finish where fourth, he did, yeah. when you finish fourth, it's, it's hard to then mm -hmm. make the electability mm -hmm. argument. And so I think that that sort of was shattered. And so they're still kind of grasping around for what their message is going to be. And it's still right now their message is, I can do really well with African-American voters. But if he finishes fifth here tonight, that's not mm -hmm. a, a sure thing. Hillary Clinton was overwhelmingly favored among black voters in 2008 until Barack Obama won Iowa, and then everything changed. You have to remember, of course, after this is Nevada and then South right. Carolina and then Super Tuesday. Well, our reporters have been covering the lead up to tonight here in New Hampshire.
New Hampshire, and they're stationed at the major candidate events around the area. So let's check in with the Post's Joyce Coe, who's live with the Bernie Sanders campaign right here in Manchester. So Joyce, I know Senator Sanders asked for this partial recount in Iowa, but he also declared a, a victory there heading into New Hampshire. What gives? That's right, Libby. Uh, Sanders has had multiple events this weekend leading up to tonight. And at most of those events, he started off by talking about his performance in Iowa, namely that he says he won the popular vote by 6,000 more votes. And that really has given his supporters and his campaign a boost of energy going into tonight. They're especially confident that not only can he beat President Trump in the general election, but they say that they're looking forward to a Democratic candidate who will bring the Democratic Party to the left, a party they feel like has moved too far to the right. His supporters also acknowledge that there is a large population of fellow Democratic voters who are afraid to vote for Bernie Sanders. Maybe they align ideologically with him, uh, but feel like he's a bit of a risk politically. Uh, we talked to many of those supporters about that very issue. Here's what one voter had to say. For those, all of you that are so worried about his radical ideas and his radical positions, rest assured, he's not going to be elected king, he's going to be elected the, the head of the executive branch. And it's going to be up to the, to, to the people in the Congress to get this agenda moved forward. And I think if you don't start from some kind of position, if you start low and then you moderate to a lower position, you don't get anything done. So I think we need a candidate that starts starts high, starts aspirationally, and then perhaps to get something done, he's going to have to give in a little bit and give in a little bit. But at least we started someplace good. That's why I think that's why I think the moderates can't do it. Now, despite that criticism of moderates, those exact same voters also told me that come November, they will be voting for whoever the Democratic nominee is. So we'll have to remember that although there is so much talk about electability during this primary process, ultimately what I'm hearing over and over again from Democratic voters is that the main reason why they're going out to the polls is solely for the desire to get Trump out of office. Libby? Great. Thank you. Joyce Coe in Manchester with the Sanders campaign. Well, our colleague Jorge Ribas is with the Buttigieg campaign in Nashua. So let's head there. Jorge, after a strong performance in Iowa last week, how did the Buttigieg campaign build on that momentum? Thanks, Libby. Yes, yeah, since his perceived delegate win in Iowa, Buttigieg came here to New Hampshire with a ton of optimism. And you could see that energy amongst these long crowds, these long lines of crowds, people gathered in this New Hampshire cold waiting to see him speak. And we spoke to some of these voters, and some of them were diehard Pete supporters. Some were still on the fence, still undecided. But what I heard from a lot of people was that no matter what, they were impressed with his, his pragmatism, his calmness, his cool-headedness. And they told me that, that this was a candidate that they could get behind and that this was someone that they would hope to see who could, who could, who could go against the Democratic rivals but also face against Trump. Take a listen. He's the exact opposite. I mean, he's got uh, common sense. He's got patience before he speaks, you know, and, and, he, and he speaks with respect. Um, and I haven't seen anything where he flies off the handle in response to any criticism, which is what we're so used to the last three years, you know. So I'm like, wow, there's a real person out there that can kind of hold it together, you know. We already have a loud, kind of um, boisterous personality in the White House, and we need someone that's a little more... I told someone I miss I miss boring I miss boring politics. I really not don't don't want to have to turn on CNN every day to see what I miss. That's so important. I want to just chill for a little while and know that they got it, you know, and know that everything's good. Right now, no one has an idea where we're going with this president that's in there. It's, I think with Pete, he needs to bring everybody together. I think he's got that that knowledge and know-how to get people and listen and make a decision from that, and I think he's the guy to do it. Voters were also talking to me about unity. They wanted a candidate who could bring all types of Democrats together. In fact, I talked to a few Bernie Sanders supporters, people who, who voted for him in 2016 and hadn't ruled out for voting him this year, that were worried that Sanders' message may push away too many moderate voters. They were looking for someone who could bring in all kinds of voters. And this is someone who they thought, going forward, they could get behind.
Libby, we're going to be here all night, but that's it for me now. Back to you. Great. Thanks so much, Jorge Ribas, with the Buttigieg campaign in Nashua. Well, much of the focus this past week has been on the confusion out of Iowa and the lack of clear results in the first couple of days. A big question, how could that chaos impact New Hampshire's primary? So let's go to the Post. Jeremy Bowers for more on that. Jeremy. Hey, thanks a lot, Libby. You know, one of the things that we've been watching this week is those crazy results that we got out of Iowa. There was a lot of promise for us early on in the night. We were super excited to see these early vote totals that were going to show us a lot of the strength of the actual voters who were backing candidates. We were going to get these first and second alignment numbers for the first time from the Iowa Democratic Party, and that was a really big deal for us because it would allow us to understand just where the broad base of support for individual candidates was coming from. Now, as you know, that's not exactly what we got on the night of Iowa. What we got was a little bit of confusion, and we understand now a little bit more about why that was true. Some of that confusion is because they were expecting these pre and caucus chairs to do a lot of work on site, lots of math, lots of movement of these numbers back and forth across an app or maybe over a telephone line that wasn't picking up. Now, that's the state of things was we left the state. But what I want to talk about a little bit now is how those results are going to impact our week. And the way that we're going to understand that is through a model that we have here that explains the flow of state delegate equivalents between the candidates in 2016 and the candidates this year. So up here in the top corner, you can see Hillary Clinton. And her flow of state delegate equivalents are estimated using this blue ribbon. And what you can see is a lot of the flow of her state delegate equivalents went to Joe Biden, to Pete Buttigieg, to Amy Klobuchar, and actually a little bit to Elizabeth Warren, which is really interesting. This makes up that lane that is the establishment candidates. Now, there's also a second lane. And as you can see here, the 2016 version of Bernie Sanders is our progressive lane. And that yellow ribbon here shows that Sanders got a large majority of his old 2016 votes. But he didn't get all of them. As a matter of fact, a lot of his votes went here to Elizabeth Warren in 2020, as well as a couple to Pete Buttigieg. This is really interesting for us, because for Pete Buttigieg and Elizabeth Warren, they were the two candidates that we saw who were able to cross over from one lane into another lane. And that is going to be a really interesting thing for us to keep an eye on tonight in New Hampshire. Now, for a little bit more on that New Hampshire bit, we're going to come over and talk to David Byler. David is a Post Opinions columnist and a data analyst. David, what is it that you're looking for from those candidates through this week? How did Iowa set them up, and what is it we're expecting to see tonight? So despite all of the craziness of the Iowa caucuses and all the drama around the results, we got sort of an expected change in how New Hampshire voters behaved in response to that. So um, New Hampshire voters were really tuned in, sort of there were a lot of late deciders, and that meant a big surge for Pete Buttigieg, who was declared the winner of Iowa after he got the most state delegate equivalents. It also meant a significant slide for Joe Biden, who placed a disappointing fourth there. It meant Bernie Sanders increased his lead by a bit, and Amy Klobuchar got a little boost after the debate, but we'll have to see how it all shakes out with the real results. I'm really excited that we're going to have some of those real results to show you tonight. I can't wait to bring them to you there. But for now, we're going to go back on the ground to Libby, you in New Hampshire. Thanks so much, Jeremy. Yes, fingers crossed about the results uh, because Iowa was certainly a surprise. I love that graphic that Jeremy showed us that shows where voters were in 2016 and how they migrated or moved or stayed the same in the case of some Bernie Sanders supporters. So let's talk about Iowa. Bernie Sanders creamed Hillary Clinton here four years ago, beating her by 20 points. I mean, th that was a big blow to the Hillary uh, Clinton campaign. Didn't count her out, of course. She still went on to become the nominee. But how well does Bernie Sanders have to perform tonight, James, for the night to be a success? That's a great question. And I think what you're going to see is Bernie's opponents trying to spin that, you know, that if Bernie wins, as he sort of is favored to do, they'll say he got half the support he did four years ago. It'll be interesting to compare looking at those lanes, kind of how much support the, the progressive wing of the party and the establishment wing of the party have all told, uh, because there is kind of a collective action problem for the moderates where they really are dividing up the vote between, you know, because Amy Klobuchar surging, Joe Biden, who was in the lead, fading, Warren sort of durable, there's their Buttigieg surging, they, they're going to scatter it. So I think it will be interesting to see. They showed earlier that graphic where there was the range of expected support. Is, is Sanders on the high side of that or is he on the low side of that? Does some of that support go to Warren, who is the people's, all the polls showed in New Hampshire the last couple of days, she was people's top second choice, including most Sanders supporters. And then the big question for Sanders, and this is 
direct answer to your question is, does he expand the electorate? Mm -hmm. His whole theory of the case is, the reason you should vote for me, the reason I'm electable in a, in a general election is, I'm gonna bring millions of people into the political process who've never voted before, the, the way Trump did in many ways actually, and I'm gonna mobilize people, I'm gonna get young people and engaged and involved. He wasn't able to do that in Iowa. Uh, and, and he said he would. They had all these organizers. They really did not expand. We, we've talked about the percentages, but turnout was basically close to what it was in 2016, far short of what it was in 2008 when Barack Obama was competing against Hillary Clinton and John Edwards. And so he wasn't able to do it in Iowa. New Hampshire's next door. It's his own backyard. It's an open primary. New Hampshire, unlike Iowa, has same-day registration. It's not like you have to make a big commitment and go wait in a caucus for a couple hours. You can actually go. So New Hampshire, the, I think what we'll see tonight is, was Sanders able to bring new people into the electorate? Or is he basically kind of getting 30, you know, one in three traditional Democratic voters? Yeah. It's so uh, important that James notes that a lot of Sanders opponents are trying to spin this and say that if he doesn't have this like blowout of a night like he had four years ago, it's a loss. His team, of course, is saying uh, something so different, Amber. They're just looking for, for a clean win, basically. How are you watching the numbers and what would mean success for a Sanders campaign? Today? Yeah, it, it's somewhere in the middle of yeah. that, right? <laughs> um, he's not going to win with 60 percent of the vote like he did here four years ago with Hillary Clinton. But at the same time, he has got to increase turnout and show that you can do that. You know, um, progressive strategists will will say to you, well, in Iowa, San you know, turnout wasn't great, as James talked about, but young people voted by a third of the amount more than 16. Moderate Democratic strategists say, that's not enough for us, you guys. Um, and everybody is watching New Hampshire as a more traditional swing state when it comes to Trump and whoever the nominee is for Democrats. It was you very know, close four years ago in by general. Mm -hmm. le less than 3,000 votes, um, Hillary Clinton won it. So the, I think the question here for me is, can Sanders show, okay, I came close to winning in Iowa, you know, I'm going to win in New Hampshire, and look at me expanding the electorate, especially in such an important state for Democrats in November. Well, there's been a lot of focus, of course, on Amy Klobuchar, and we'll continue to talk about her tonight. Our colleague Rhonda Colvin is with the Klobuchar campaign in Concord. Uh, so, Rhonda, you were initially going to follow Joe Biden tonight, but your plans changed because Biden isn't appearing at his own event this evening. Tell us about how things are going for you. That's true. Yes, we changed up a little bit. We were supposed to be in Nashua to follow Biden tonight. We know now that he is not going to be there in person. He instead is going to bring a, a live stream from South Carolina where he's having a big event. He's calling it a kickoff event to South Carolina. So he and his camp went straight there and they'll greet the uh, supporters here in New Hampshire via a live stream. His daughter will be in attendance at his New Hampshire event, but he is not here. Uh, so now we are at Amy Klobuchar's party. And I've got to tell you, over the weekend and today when we went to polling sites, there was a lot of energy for Amy Klobuchar that maybe we didn't see a year ago. What we're hearing from voters is, one, they really like how she handled herself in that debate on Friday, especially that moment when she talked to uh, Pete Buttigieg and kind of took him to task for some of the comments he made about the impeachment trial. Other people are saying that they like the way that she's handling herself as a senator. She's been doing her job and campaigning at the same time. And also here in New Hampshire, there are a lot of undecided voters. We met people who were walking into the polling site and weren't quite sure which candidate that they that they would vote for. And they decided to go her way. And they say it's because, you know, she has Midwestern roots and she is appealing to a lot of people. New Hampshire has a very high number of undecided and independent voters, higher than the national average. And a lot of people are following her because they're sort of fatigued with some of the front runners that we've seen before. So let's take a listen to some of the things we've heard from those polling sites today. My vote was going to go to Biden, but... Um I, you know, I just, I don't know, I've been going like, like so many people here in New Hampshire, going back and forth. We must unite, uh, but the way that we unite is by having an optimistic economic agenda for America. In the very last debate that the Democrats had last week, this past week, I, um, I voted for, for Amy Krobuchar. I thought she had a very strong um, outing, and I thought she was passionate. And um, I, I didn't sort of have her on my radar, but um, I, 
really liked what she had to say. And we have to be able to make the case to the working people of this country, some of whom voted for Donald Trump, that we have something better to offer. That we I'm leaning towards Amy Klobuchar. I've seen her uh, over years, or over a few years, with doing um, different investigations and just her confidence and her knowledge of the government and how to handle people. And so that's what makes me lean towards her. And also she's from the Midwest. And I think that would be good for the country. So Amy Klobuchar did win what's called the midnight vote here. That's when a few small villages here uh, vote very early. She won that vote. I was only about by eight votes, but she won it. So we're here at her party. The room is filling up behind me a little bit. So we'll be here to see how this night goes for Senator Klobuchar. Great, Rhonda Colvin with the Klobuchar campaign. Thanks, Rhonda. Let's go now to the Post. Hannah Jewell, who's live with the Warren campaign here in Manchester. Hannah, good evening. So Elizabeth Warren once led the polls here, but she slipped in recent months. Uh, tr trace that for us. What's happened? That's right, Libby. As a senator from a neighboring state, Elizabeth Warren was expected to do very well in New Hampshire. And in fact, back in October, she was leading the polls for a time in this state. Since then, she's fallen well behind Sanders and Buttigieg, as we've been talking about the theme of the night, or those two, and she has been straggling behind. Now, her camp has been quick to say, and in fact, they released a memo today stressing the fact that she has a path beyond New Hampshire. They're downpl downplaying New Hampshire, saying that the campaign is built to last through Super Tuesday. They've actually detailed their path to the delegates and done the numbers to sort of prove the point that whatever happens tonight, it's not the end of the road for her. In addition, her supporters remain very, very hopeful. Uh, we spoke to some of them at an event in Concord this weekend. Let's take a look at that. I think she appeals to people who are horrified by what's going on in the current administration. I think she's trustworthy, and I think she has um, basic moral ethics that we really can believe in. Uh, she's got decades of experience in terms of fighting for the small guy. So it's really tough not to love her, you know what I mean? The Warren campaign has a good boots on the ground campaign. Um, the Warren campaign has great canvassers. They've worked really hard. My wife's a special ed teacher and I'm a high school teacher. You have to be kind and thoughtful um, and creative and honest to be a good teacher. Um, and I think those are things that are all really attractive to uh, me about her as a candidate. Well, I'm a special educator as well. Um, and to be honest, she's a woman. That's another big thing. Um, I'm ready for a female president. I think this country's ready. Um, let's do it. I'm from a male perspective, I just think they're Women are just more diplomatic than men. And we've messed it up for long enough then, so. <laughs> I'll, I'll so. support any Democrat. Uh, we really just need to get Trump out of there. I will vote for the Democratic candidate, no matter who it is. We're all in it. Um, we're all going to unify. We're going to do what we have to do to make this country the place that it needs to be and can be. So as you just heard, people are stressing that they think that Elizabeth Warren is the best candidate to beat Trump, but they will say that they will, any Elizabeth Warren fan will tell you they'll vote for whoever the nominee will be. The campaign, as well as the supporters, have been stressing recently that Warren can be a unity candidate. She's sort of tried to place herself recently between Sanders and Buttigieg as someone who everyone kind of likes. Um, something I've heard from uh, her supporters also is a little bit of frustration that they think that her storyline out of Iowa got overlooked by the Sanders and Buttigieg story, but also by the general chaos that obviously was everything that we would talk about uh, coming out of Iowa. So we'll see if that narrative gets more attention tonight and if anything is different after tonight. Back to you for now, Libby. Great. Th thanks so much, Hannah Jewell with the Warren campaign. You know, it's interesting to hear those voters uh, talk about not just what these people would do in office, but also some of the characteristics, the leadership characteristics, but also just like kindness, you know, being a good person, sort of contrasting it with what they see as the problem with the Trump presidency. We are seeing Amy Klobuchar try to make a closing message here of empathy. Mm -hmm. Her ad that she just rolled out was all about empathy. It was part of her closing argument um, at the debate the other night. W I, I want you to reflect, Amber, on this, on this appeal that these candidates are making for judgment, empathy, basic character. Yeah, I think these candidates recognize that there are voters out there like the people I talked to this week who say, I voted for Trump, but I'm just sick of his brashness. I, um, you know, I talked to one voter who actually switched her registration and was at a Biden event last night to vote for Democratic. They're just like, this isn't what I want the Republican Party to be. That is a, a silent 
part of this Republican Party that you don't hear about in our daily news coverage. So I, I sense a lot of these candidates saying, I can speak to you, you know, I, I understand what you're going through. Um, Amy Klobuchar in her closing statement said, you know, compared her upbringing of her, her grandpa raising her dad's college fund with, by putting money in a coffee tin and saying, like, I get your struggles in a way that Donald Trump doesn't. Um, I think to some extent, Amy Klobuchar and Elizabeth Warren are also trying to display their gender without being overt about it by saying, I can hear you, I can listen to you in a way that, that men in particular might struggle with. Elizabeth Warren was the plan candidate last year, and that sort of worked for her for a time. She ended up sort of rising to the top of the polls right as Medicare for All sort of ended up killing her more than anything else, you know, in, in terms of bringing her down because she couldn't really pay for it and was trying to, was stuck with Bernie's plan at the same time she was sort of getting mounting scrutiny. But what's amazing is when you talk to voters, they're not really, even Warren supporters aren't supporting her because of the plans. Temperament is a word that comes up constantly. And there is that desire. We heard uh, a few minutes ago in one of those packages, someone said, I want to be able to not have to turn on cable news every night. I heard that constantly from liberals and moderates uh, who said, you know, one, I want to be able to turn on the TV news. I talked to a woman yesterday, a seven-year-old, a four-year-old, and a two-year-old. She said, I want to be able to have the TV on and the president talking and not worry that he's gonna, he or she is going to use profanity. The other thing to remember, New Hampshire, unlike Iowa, is people, it's an open primary. Yeah, let's talk about so that. that so yeah. And it's important because it changes the dynamic of the electorate of the mm -hmm. kind of people who are voting. In Iowa, it's, it's people who are like committed Democrats, uh, you know, activists. Uh, not just because of the commitment to show up, because you have to be a registered Democrat. Right. Here, if you're unaffiliated, which is the word for independent, mm -hmm. which is the biggest voting block in New Hampshire, you're allowed to take a ballot in either the Republican or the Democratic primary. And so because President Trump doesn't face a, a real credible primary challenge, there are a lot of the people Amber's talking about who probably you know may have voted for, uh, I, I found a lot of people who had voted for like John Kasich or Marco Rubio in the Republican primary four years ago that sort of considered themselves independent. And now they're going to cast ballots in the Democratic primary. That works to the advantage of someone like Klobuchar and Buttigieg. And it was funny because the last couple of days you actually heard them compared to Iowa tailor their pitches a little bit. Mm -hmm. So uh, yesterday you heard Klobuchar and Buttigieg talk about how important the deficit is. And that's a nod to kind of those moderate fiscal conservative people that they they weren't talking about the deficit in Iowa mm -hmm. and it's because the electorate is different and uh, and that that does change how they you know they're they're appealing and it changes the kind of voters that they're appealing to it's not just a lot of kind of like Mm -hmm. liberals who, you know, are, are kind of always vote Democrat. You yeah, might these, have these undeclared have, and these independent yeah. voters ha have a voice here in yeah. this moment. You know what? There are more. Uh, there's about double the unaffiliated registered voters. Or they're not registered for the party as there are Democrats and Republicans. Those are stuck around the two to fifty thousand mark. There's like four hundred thirty thousand undeclared voters, which which fits with this. New Hampshire, New England, kind of independent streak, um, which makes us a, a unique primary in that way that we might not see in Super Tuesday with some, some more left-leaning states. But this is still, just like Iowa, largely white primary, skews older. Um, th this is, you know, there's growing anxiety. There is every four years. But this time, I really feel it, like, kind of welling up in the Democratic elite's chest that this is just not a state that represents the party they are and are, are trying to continue to be. Well, many of the polls in New Hampshire have closed, but there are still some left to wrap up with in this hour. Let's go now to Jeremy Bowers and our Election Insights team for the latest. Jeremy, what are the first results telling us this evening? Libby, I'm so excited to get to talk to you about live results tonight. I've had a whole cup of strong tea and I have something to show you on our board. So let's take a look here. We have some early results and in those results, we're seeing a strong showing for Bernie Sanders. So let's a quick reminder, Sanders is here in the purple. We've got Pete Buttigieg in green, Amy Klobuchar in purple, and Elizabeth Warren in orange. And what we see early on in the board is that Bernie Sanders is doing well, although that is not too surprising. He won almost 60% of the vote in the state in 2016 and won every county. The thing that we think is pretty surprising about these results tonight is that we're seeing Pete Buttigieg doing well in a couple places, even at the county level. So again, with only about 20% of the votes reporting, here in Carroll County, we're seeing Pete Buttigieg with 26% of the vote, Amy Klobuchar with almost 23% of the vote, and Bernie Sanders down here at just 22%. That's a little bit shocking for me. And one of the places we'll keep an eye on are some of these more lightly populated areas that are going to have kind of interesting results. Now, 
the real question about those lightly populated areas, were those early results that we got representative? Were they interesting at all? And for a little bit more on that, we're gonna kick it over here to Lenny Bronner. He's a senior data scientist on our Election Insight team. Lenny, are these representative? Can we make any decisions based on them? So the three uh, townships that go very early in the night, um, Dixville Notch, Hearts Location, and Millsfield are not representative. Bernie Sanders won them in 2016 and then ended up winning the, uh, the state as a whole, but that's like very rare. That last time that happened was Jimmy Carter in 1980. That being said, the states that, uh, the, sorry, the townships that have gone now uh, that we're seeing results coming in are more representative, but it's still too early to make any sort of prediction. All right, as we get more, we'll bring it to you. But for now, we're going to kick it back to Libby on the ground in New Hampshire. Great, thank you. Jeremy at our Washington Post headquarters. Let's check back in now with Joyce Coe, who's live at the Sanders campaign event here in Manchester. Joyce. Hey Libby, we are at Southern New Hampshire University, a small uh, private college right outside of Manchester, and it's um, a little past 7.30 now, so the crowd behind me has started to fill out a little bit. Uh, they were allowed in at 7.30, so we're seeing some supporters trickling in here, sitting um, in the bleachers in this field house, this athletic complex that we're in. Um, Bernie Sanders' campaign tonight, feeling really confident going into the night uh, in, in regards to numbers. Over the weekend, a national poll came out showing Bernie Sanders uh, in first place leading nationally. In addition to that, his uh, campaign sending out some numbers last night from uh, his concert rally with the Strokes. They say that 2,000 people were in attendance at that rally, uh, making it what they say is the largest showing of attendees at any campaign event of any candidate in New Hampshire. Another number that the campaign has been throwing around a lot is 150,000. That's the number of door knocks they say that volunteers have made across the state of New Hampshire as of Saturday. And that is a number that Bernie Sanders was mentioning a lot himself at campaign events throughout the weekend. Um, tonight we're expected to hear from surrogates uh, as well as Senator Sanders himself once the um, results come out here in New Hampshire. Um, and of course we will bring you updates from his campaign uh, watch party as we get them. Libby. Great, thanks so much. Joyce Coe in Manchester with the Sanders campaign. Let's check back in now with our colleague Jorge Ribas, who's with the Buttigieg campaign in Nashua. Jorge. Hey, Libby. Um, we're here at the Nashua Community College, and I'm actually joined now by post political reporter Chelsea James. Uh, Chelsea, you've been covering Buttigieg now for since mid December, right? Right. So let's talk a little bit about how. Like, and you see the crowd behind us filling up, but like, how has the mood and the vibe sort of changed in the campaign, at the rallies, at the events that you've been to since you started covering it? You know, I think in January they really started to think we might have a shot at Iowa, and that really showed their crowd started to grow, their demeanor started to change. You know, Buttigieg himself got a little more energetic. And, um, you know, I think that that sort of continued into the first week in New Hampshire. A little bit today here we're having a sense that they're a little concerned that Amy Klobuchar might be kind of catching up to them in the last few hours, but we'll see if that bears out in the results. I still think they, you know, I just talked to one of their um, staffers who was like, sometimes we can't believe we're here, you know. So there's definitely a little bit of an underdog mentality still, you know, permeating. So let's say, okay, still early, so we're not sure, but he's trailing Ralph Sanders. He's in second place tonight so far. Um, let's say he comes in second or comes in third, say. What does that mean for him carrying forward, you know, with Sanders winning tonight, heading into the future? You know, I think a second place finish solidifies him as the current moderate front runner, sort of the current counterpunch to Bernie Sanders. But as we've seen, you know, Michael Bloomberg ri rise in polls outside of these early states. You know, we know Joe Biden's sort of struggling, but has, you know, maintains a much longer track record, much better name recognition. And Amy Klobuchar is making a push. So it, it sort of leaves him the top dog in a race that's very, very close. Um, anything sort of outside the top three, I think, would be a real shock and, and pretty devastating to them. But I think they feel pretty confident that they'll have a, a decent night here. And then it's about proving that they can win in more diverse states like Nevada and South Carolina. So, yeah, you, you mentioned Biden. And let's talk about him. Let's talk about, you know, what does his stumbling tonight and in Iowa, what does that mean for Buttigieg going forward? You know, for a while, victory in Iowa for the Buttigieg campaign was beating Joe Biden because, again, it meant they were the stronger moderate. They were the one that you could throw up against Bernie Sanders and say, here's your choice. And, you know, to beat him again here would, would further that point. I think if, if Amy Klobuchar sort of shows that she's got that strength and she enters that conversation, 
But for the Buttigieg people, you know, a, a sliding Joe Biden is only a good thing. And so far, that's been exactly what's happened. All right. Thanks, Chelsea. Thanks for joining us. Thanks, Libby, back to you in Manchester. Thanks so much, Jorge and Chelsea and Nashua tonight with the Buttigieg campaign. You know, this question of where the voters are moving towards and momentum is so important. Amy Klobuchar is a name that we've all been hearing a lot this week. What has made the difference, James? Why is she sort of, sort of trending? Strong debate performance on Friday night, but she's had strong debate performances in the past. What's different? She has. I think there is this desire to have a moderate candidate. I think that there's a desire that you know, the majority of New Hampshire voters do not want Bernie Sanders to be their nominee. Many people thought that they were going to have to settle for Joe Biden. Once Joe Biden underperformed in Iowa, they realized Biden wasn't the guy. And so then all of a sudden, you know, I think the attack on Buttigieg, of, he's a 38-year-old former mayor of the fourth biggest city in Indiana, that resonated. Uh, Klobuchar can barely hide her authentic personal dislike for Buttigieg. She said publicly that if a if he had her, everything about him was a her, uh, that she, they would not be where that if they are. If had the same credentials, was the same age. Age had been, yeah, the, a, a female mayor of the fourth largest city in Indiana. So th I, I think those hits, Biden put out a, a very negative, the most negative kind of Democratic ad of the campaign so far against another Democrat attacking Buttigieg, Buttigieg. kind of juxtaposing, saying, you know, well, Joe Biden was negotiating the Iran deal. Pete Buttigieg was installing decorative lighting in the downtown of, of South Bend and kind of trying to diminish his experience. So I think the hits on Buttigieg after his unexpected win in Iowa, uh, he, he surged. And then I think all of a sudden people were like, oh, if I'm not going to go to Buttigieg and I'm not going to go to Biden, Warren's maybe too liberal, uh, who am I going to go to? And so Klobuchar was there, and then she had the great debate performance right as people were starting to pay attention. She is sort of a good fit in many ways for this state. Uh, and so I think I think that that's helping. One of the things that's been really interesting, just to those two reports we yeah. heard from our correspondents in the field, are the I spent some time doing reporting on the field operations that the candidates were doing. And so the Sanders campaign uh, has been focused on mobilization. Mm -hmm. So actually, I stood after one of Sanders' rallies and watched one of their staffers talk to three dozen volunteers. And he said, at this point, we're not trying to persuade people to support Bernie Sanders. We're just trying to get people out who we know support us. Now, Pete Buttigieg and Amy Klobuchar don't have that luxury. In many ways, they're playing catch up. Bernie Sanders has been organizing here for a year. And so I, it, I've, I've sort of watched some of the Klobuchar and the Buttigieg door knockers. And, and there were a lot of them out and about this weekend. And for them, it was all persuasion. You know, because half the electorate was undecided, it was all like, let me tell you about Amy Klobuchar. Let me tell you why she's great and her record's good. And so. You know, they, I, there was a kind of a very different approach. Uh, and so, as Joyce mentioned, they did knock on 150,000 doors. They say they knocked on 150,000 doors. But those are people that they've identified as Sanders supporters that they're trying to drive out to the polls. Mm -hmm. And so that's going to be one of those tests that we talked about earlier when we were saying, how important is this for Sanders? Does he get those people to, to show up who maybe didn't even vote for him in, in 2016? Yeah, Amber, there's a question of, of and when a candidate peaks a little bit, how, how they take the hits, right? And we saw Amy Klobuchar going after Buttigieg. As James said, she's been doing that, you know, throughout. But on Friday night, she was sort of, you know, knocking him, uh, knocking comments he made about watching the senators back in Washington. And she made this reference to cartoons. It actually was a quote that was totally taken out of context. <laughs> uh, Pete Buttigieg was, was saying, you know, don't turn away. Don't watch cartoons. Watch what's happening in Washington. It's very important. But she made it sound, him sound sort of like infantilized, right? Like it's like childlike yep. person. And and you know, there's this question of how you respond to the hits and are you ready for them? Which he didn't do in, in that particular instance. Like he could have pushed back and said, you took me out of context. Um, he knew very well what he said, but he didn't. And yes, coming out of Iowa, going into this New Hampshire debate a couple of days later, Buttigieg was prepared to get whacked by everybody. We actually saw that in a couple earlier debates when he was rising in the polls at the very least. Unlike, uh, well, for Buttigieg, let me say, I, I just didn't see him take this debate and, and like, try to wrestle Amy Klobuchar to the ground and, you know, and kind of push back on this because he saw her as someone who's, like, a lower polling candidate. Why am I going to engage with that? Um, Biden and Sanders were fighting it out against each other. It was just, like, Warren was doing her own thing, not trying not to 
attack anyone else. So I thought Buttigieg skated by a little bit on that, except for Klobuchar, which he didn't engage. And then there's the question of if, if Klobuchar wasn't seen as a threat, has she had to suffer the attacks from others? And, right. and, and we will talk about that as the night goes on, because depending on how she does tonight, it may be a very different, uh, uh, different attack strategy for other candidates. I want to go back to Rhonda Colvin, uh, who is in Concord with the Klobuchar campaign, and check in with her to hear how things are going. Rhonda. That's right, Libby. I'm with our colleague, Jenna Johnson, who has been covering the Klobuchar campaign for a while. Jenna, tell me about the evolution. You've been covering her since the fall. The evolution from then versus now and the momentum that she's been gaining. Yeah, I think for the last few months, um, her staff and her supporters and her, uh, they've just been frustrated that she hasn't been doing better. They feel like she has the sort of message that could resonate, um, given what's happening in the country right now. And she would have these great debate performances, or she would have these moments, and they would kind of wait for her polling to go up or wait for the money to come in. And it just wasn't quite happening until Friday night. Um, she was here in New Hampshire. Um, she had just come on off of not doing so great in the Iowa caucuses, even though Iowa is just south um, of her home state of Minnesota. Um, she was on the debate stage here in New Hampshire Friday night, and she just had a great performance. Um, things seemed to click for her. Um, you know, she was um, uh, contrasting herself with the other candidates on the stage. Um, and you know, even before she even got off the debate stage, there was just money flowing in. Um, her campaign raised over $3 million this weekend. Um, and you just saw, you could just see this energy that was building around her candidacy. I kind of followed her through the state over the weekend. Um, and you could just see the crowds building, um, you know, and you could see her confidence building and her excitement building. Um, this is a state where she just found her groove. Um, and... Um, you know, her all of her jokes were landing well, <laughs> something that wouldn't always happen um, before now. Um, so there's a lot of excitement among her supporters um, as they're waiting for these results. They're really hoping um, that she's going to do well tonight. Um, and that's going to not only keep her in the race, but propel her forward. What about the question of electability? A lot of what I heard from people at polling sites is, I'm undecided, but I just need someone to beat Donald Trump. Do you Have you been hearing from voters here on the ground in New Hampshire that they think she is the candidate that can do that? Yeah, well, everyone has a different definition of um, what electability is. Um, I talked with a lot of New Hampshire voters who said, you know, I've always kind of liked her, but I didn't think she really had a chance, so I didn't plan on voting for her. But now that I think she might have a chance, okay, now I'm going to vote for her. Um, we're in this weird cycle where a lot of voters are kind of basing what they're going to do on, like, what other people are going to do. And, like, you know, they can kind of vote for anyone. I, I hear from so many Democrats, it doesn't matter who the Democrat is on the ticket this fall, um, I'll vote for them. But you tell me, <laughs> what do we need on that ticket to beat Donald Trump? Um, and a lot of voters here in uh, New Hampshire have been saying they, they think it could be someone like Amy Klobuchar, someone who is a bit more moderate in her stances, um, who could perhaps appeal to Midwest voters um, in places that flipped from voting for Trump or voting for Obama to voting for Trump. Um, so we'll see. Um, at the same time, you talk with voters who say, um, you know, that that's not what they think will get people excited in the fall, that, um, you know, instead Democrats need someone who can build a movement, um, who can excite young voters, um, who can engage with African-American voters and Latino voters. Um, you know, two groups that we really haven't seen the senator really connect with yet. Right, right. Well, Jenna, thank you very much. And we are actually sitting next to each other, so uh, we'll be here all night. And as you see, the room has been filling up a little bit more, so we'll have more for you later on. Libby? Great. Thanks so much, Rhonda and Jenna, live in Concord with the Klobuchar campaign. Okay, so let's talk about Amy Klobuchar and how she could come under more scrutiny and more attacks from her opponents, uh, depending on how she does tonight, Amber. Yeah, well, let me say, her. I, uh, to get on this question of like yeah. why we're even talking about Amy Klobuchar, you know, her campaign today told me they felt like that debate 
on Fridays, particularly her closing arguments. Again, I keep referring back to this visual of this coffee tin that her grandpa was putting money in for her dad's college, uh, helped crystallize this momentum that she was feeling. Door knockers told me she, they're spending all this time in the state for Klobuchar. She has about 50 staff here. And people would say, she's in my top two or three. And then you heard Jenna Johnson say, you know, slowly, slowly after seeing maybe the Biden that they might have voted for falter in Iowa, I think, well, maybe I will vote for Klobuchar. And then they stayed up late for this debate, or maybe it circulated on the Internet the next day because her closing arguments happened at like 11 p.m. on a Friday night. And and all of a sudden, door knockers told me that, you know, they went and canvassed and every canvasser raised their hand and said, yep, Klo everyone I talked to said Klobuchar is like their number one person to vote for. That is all we know, though, about Klobuchar on this national level. To, to your original question, I see James wanting to chop in, is, you know, we, she hasn't got a lot of attention during the debates. Like I said, Buttigieg hasn't punched back at her. Like Biden, I don't think has even mentioned her name ever. Um, she spent a bunch of time in the impeachment trial, like not out on the campaign trail, talking to voters in a way that could have media, people like James ask her more questions. Um, I do not know if she's going to be able to compete in South Carolina, where there's, it just looks more more like the typical Democratic voter. Nevada caucuses are really tricky to navigate on this close of a dime to switch and say, OK, I need all these supporters to be as dedicated as you were in Iowa and come out, spend the whole Saturday voting for me. Um, you know, with momentum being so important, though, what happens tonight is not just significant in terms of the delegate count, but it's also significant in terms of momentum, especially if voters are still thinking about their options and they want that person. I mean, we keep hearing over and over that Democrats are asking who is the most electable. And if it's like everybody else likes that person, maybe maybe, I, maybe there's something there too. I mean, so how you do tonight could really influence voters in Nevada, voters in South Carolina. Yeah, absolutely. And Klobuchar actually had the roughest rollout of any candidate in the entire race. She had the misfortune. Hmm. She announced in a blizzard uh, in, made for in some Minnesota, great, it made photos, for great though. TV. It was great, uh, but just there showing were, there her like her, her, you know, like I'm a tough Minnesota. I'm from Minnesota. Right. I, I don't think she had a hat. I, I, I don't think. Yeah, it's uh, <laughs> just the snow and the, her hair, right. and the snow everywhere. Uh, and and uh, but as part of her rollout, there were tons of stories. Of, there were half a dozen stories about the way she treats her staff. She's notoriously bad to her staff on Capitol Hill. There were stories about you know her using a comb to eat a salad or whatever. Those were some very negative stories. And then she hasn't really faced much scrutiny since because she wasn't at the top of the polls. There have been some stories. The AP did a story about her tenure as the district attorney, the prosecutor for the largest county in Minnesota, Hennepin County, which is what includes Minneapolis, prosecuting some African-Americans. Kamala Harris got hit pretty hard for that when she was in the race for her record. She'll start to face some of those stories. But I do want to say, I saw her yesterday in Exeter, and she is loving this. She just, she's someone who, she's, you know, she loves politics. She likes being out there. And it, it she has been toiling around rural Iowa. She's the only candidate in the race who went to all 99 counties in Iowa. And she has spoken to a lot of very small events. I mean, she's, she's given, you know, hour long back and forth to seven people kind of thing. All of a sudden, yesterday in Exeter, 700 people show up to see her. You know, there's a there's an overflow. Uh, people can't get into the old town hall in the heart of Exeter. And so there's an, an overflow room that's separate from the room. And she loved it. You know, so she was like, the overflow room was getting the feed of what she was saying. And she would she would kind of tell a story. And be like, well, I'm going to say the best part of the story for the folks in the overflow room. Mm -hmm. but she was, she, and it's because she is genuinely excited about kind of the attention. And I think in some ways, would welcome the scrutiny because it would show that she's arrived in the top tier. You know, there is this question about whether voters, if their candidate does not triumph, will they support the Democratic candidate? We're hearing a lot of our reporters say their voters are saying, yes, I will, yes, I will. But there is a real question if Bernie Sanders supporters, for example, will jump on board with whatever Democrat wins if it's not Sanders. And we saw some heckling over the weekend uh, as the candidates were all taking a turn speaking. And Amy Klobuchar was able to dispatch with it in, in hum a way that was like humor, uh, but also di didn't make a bigger deal out of it. So our exit poll to yeah. on that, our exit poll shows only 75 percent of Sanders supporters said they would definitely support the Democratic nominee. And if you exclude the Sanders supporters, it was about 90% overall. So that is a challenge that was obviously a problem in 2016. 
people like Klobuchar intensely sensitive to it because they are playing the long game. They want to win the nomination and they want to make sure that they don't divide the party. So there has been a lot of kind of bows to unity. So at the state party dinner, literally two blocks from here on Saturday, they all spoke. When uh, Pete Buttigieg spoke, the, the Sanders supporters were chanting Wall Street, Pete. And so when Klobuchar is up, the Sanders supporters started to kind of get at her. She has a great sense of humor. She said, hello, Bernie people. And, <laughs> you just you know, kind of moved on. And, and moved the on. Sanders people kind of even laughed at the way that it she was attention. disarming. Diffused. Yeah. And it is something and that voters are asking, not yeah, just can exactly. they make it through the primary, but can they bring other Democratic support along with them? Well, thank you, Amber. Stay, stick with us. James Homan, stick with us. Uh, we're approaching the top of the hour with more results, of course, to come as the vote count rolls in tonight. So you stay with us as well. This is live coverage from The Washington Post. One of the best New Hampshire primary stories is 1952, Dwight Eisenhower. Eisenhower had been a really popular, famous general in World War II, and both the Democratic Party and the Republican Party had been courting him to run for president. By the time of the New Hampshire primaries, though, Eisenhower hadn't said he was going to run. He hadn't even said which party he would affiliate with if he did run. But what happened in New Hampshire is that a number of voters wrote in Eisenhower's name on the ballot. So much so, in fact, that Eisenhower won the New Hampshire primary. He beat out the expected winner, Robert Taft, who was actually running for president. Eisenhower decided to officially declare he would be running for president. He got the nomination and he went on to win the presidential election in 1952. Donald Trump doesn't want me to be the nominee. We need a mass political movement. Not just to go to Washington, but to change it before it is too late. I know what's broken in this country. I know how to fix it. The stakes could not be higher. We need to outcompete them and win. I have that experience of winning in red and purple and bright blue areas. Street scenes outside the historic Manchester City Hall just a few blocks from here at Stanton Plaza. All the polls have closed here at this hour in New Hampshire. Welcome to live coverage from the Washington Post. I'm Libby Casey. It's now 8 o'clock here on the East Coast, and we are live here in downtown Manchester for the nation's first primary. Well, the most recent Democratic debate, which happened here in Manchester on Friday night, influenced some of the voters that we've been talking to and helped them make a decision on who to vote for today. So let's look at some of the highlights from that debate. Bernie's label himself, not me, a democratic socialist. I think that's the label that the president's going to lay on everyone running with Bernie if he's a nominee. Uh, we need that kind of unification when our nominee is dividing people with a politics that says if you don't go all the way to the edge, it doesn't count. A politics that says it's my way or the highway. Are you talking about Senator Sanders? Yes. The way you bring people together is by presenting an agenda that works for the working people of this country, not for the billionaire class. The entire capitalism socialism dichotomy is completely out of date. When you see a government that works great, for those who can hire armies of lobbyists and lawyers and make big campaign donations, and it's not working so great for everyone else, that is corruption, pure and simple, and we need to call it out for what it is. I'm a fresh face up here for a presidential debate, and I figure, Pete, uh, that 59, my age, is the new 38. We have a newcomer in the White House, and look where it got us. I think sure. having some experience sure. is a good thing. Senator Sanders, then Mayor Buttigieg. Well, joining me now to talk about that and more, two of my Washington Post colleagues, James Homan, national political reporter, and Amber Phillips, political reporter for The Fix. Thanks to both of you. So that, that debate roundup had, had some of the highlights, and you saw there that Amy Klobuchar was pushing back and sending some slugs the way of Pete Buttigieg. And we talked about how they, and, and they really weren't getting, she wasn't getting the challenge back, Amber.
she had been polling in this third, almost even fourth mm -hmm. tier early in the campaign. And here we are in New Hampshire, and she's the person that we're talking about. When we go out to see voters, we hear them say, Klobuchar. I was at a Biden event last night. A woman had an Amy pin on and she sat down and pinned her Biden pin on as well to make sure <laughs> as she was I, deciding who to vote for. I have a similar story. I had, I met a woman at that Klobuchar event that I went to in Exeter yesterday who's had a Joe Biden yard sign in her on her lawn for months and she was holding a Klobuchar lawn sign and she was going to put the Klobuchar lawn sign out and she said she was still undecided. She was going to have the Biden and the Klobuchar lawn sign and she wasn't going to decide which of the two to back until she went into the polling place. What does that say to you that people are taking so long to decide? Because we're hearing that from a lot of voters and we heard from Emily Guskin yeah. as she was talking about these exit polls that people were deciding last minute. I think, Libby, people want to get it right. People really, I mean, it, for, for the experience of a lot of Democrats is Donald Trump has been traumatizing and they didn't expect Trump to win four years ago and they, they want to pick someone who shares their values. But who's going to win? They don't want four more years of Trump. I think it's hard to overstate how heavily that weighs on people. And one of the great things about New Hampshire, and it's not representative, we can criticize Iowa and New Hampshire. People, most people here take the kind of the duty incredibly seriously, and that's one of the reasons they're willing to change. I talked to a lot of Bernie Sanders supporters who love Bernie Sanders and still kind of went out of their way to tell me that they they weren't committed to him. They made a point to listen to the other candidates to hear them out before settling back on Sanders. And that is sort of the political culture here where people feel like they have a, a kind of a moral obligation to hear all the candidates out and then to make the right choice for the kind of candidate who's going to win the election, especially when Donald Trump's in the White House. I think when Hillary Clinton lost, there the ground opened up for Democrats, and they had no idea which way was up and down. And the, and I don't think they feel like they're walking on solid ground anymore politically. There's, Amber, I just want to mention we do have some sure. breaking news here. We've got that banner up that Andrew Yang is dropping out of the presidential race. That wow. makes sense. Uh, <laughs> Someone we haven't talked, to, talked about yeah, last night. At all. Honestly, it's, not a, it's a surprise to hear that now at this point, because right. typically you'd wait till the results came in, you'd get a read of the ground, you'd give your speech tonight, and then sort of regroup and make announcements. Yeah, that's, a, that, that, that's news. I mean, a Andrew Yang is interesting because Yang actually was uh, surprisingly appealing to a lot of people. A lot of people would say Yang was their third choice who I talked to. Uh, he was sort of... And why surprising? Because he's a political was, outsider. He's a political outsider. He actually was the... Besides Sanders and Warren, he was the most effective. He was unlike any other candidate in the field, but at prosecuting the anti-elite message, which is our elites have failed us. We need to do something different. Uh, we need to... He kind of... His universal basic income, a lot of voters thought was gimmicky, but they liked that he was putting these ideas into the conversation about trying to lift people up, trying to talk about reparations on a bachelor. Uh, you know, he... he he was also he rivaled maybe only by Klobuchar, had a great sense of humor. He was very funny at a lot of these events and cattle calls. Uh, and, and people kind of liked him. I don't think he hurt himself by doing this. No one, no one sort of hates Andrew Yang. No, they liked him, but they didn't love him. Right. And listen, we're right. coming up on a stretch of campaigning uh, over the next couple of weeks that is going to take us into 16. 16 Atlanta, 14 states and Super Tuesday. That is expensive. That is time consuming. Um, I think Andrew Yang is not the only person. I don't know how I'm going to do this. Yeah, because there, there, there certainly is the question uh, uh, of uh, votes, but also money. Well, we're getting some early results now, so let's check in with our Election Insights team in Washington and Jeremy Bowers. Jeremy. Hey, thanks a lot, Libby. You know, we do have a little bit to update you about. The last time we talked, there was about 6% of the vote in, and now we're looking at almost 15%. Actually, a little over 15%, it appears. This is live updating, and so occasionally we're going to get a batch of votes while I'm talking. So for a minute, let's set up the board again. You've got Bernie Sanders here in the purple. You've got Pete Buttigieg in the green, Amy Klobuchar in what we're calling light blue, and then we have Elizabeth Warren in orange. And now we're seeing results in every county in New Hampshire right now, which is really interesting. Interesting. That means we've got a good spread and we're looking at um, results that are going to start being meaningful and start making sense. So again, what the results that we're seeing now, Bernie Sanders at 28% of the vote. We're seeing Pete Buttigieg at 22.5%. We're seeing Amy Klobuchar a little bit over 20%. And Elizabeth Warren in a pretty distant fourth at just about 9 and a little bit percent. 
Now, some interesting regional trends to break down for you. We're not seeing a whole lot of votes at the moment, and we're still waiting for a lot of the urban areas to come in. But we have noticed that there's some interesting stuff going on here in, in Hillsborough County, where the city of Manchester is located. Now, the results that we're seeing here are strongly pro-Bernie. You can see that he's got 31.3% of the vote, and Buttigieg and Klobuchar are really underperforming. This is one of those areas, though, where we expected to see maybe a little bit more of an establishment candidate. And you can see that here, Joe Biden's got about 9% of the vote. He's really uh, ahead of where we had expected him to be at this point. Now, there's another place I'd like to talk to you a little bit about, and this is the Buddha Judge surge. So we're seeing a wall of interesting results for Mayor Pete in this area. Um, a lot of these are small places. They don't have a lot of voters, and so it's possible that this is something that isn't a real trend. But I do want to talk a little bit about Carroll County. Carroll County has about 30% reporting. And we're seeing Buttigieg here with a, like a very slight lead over Bernie Sanders. And so this for us is a little bit interesting because this is one of the early voting places. And we were seeing Amy Klobuchar do well here previously in Hart's location and Millsfield. Now, for a little bit more on the inside of these numbers, we'd like to talk to Lenny Bronner. Lenny is a senior data scientist on our Elections Insight team. Lenny, is there anything that's jumping off the page to you about what's going on with these numbers? Yeah, so like you said, uh, Bernie Sanders is doing quite well in Manchester, and Amy Klobuchar is doing quite well in uh, Concord. But we have to say that only about 50% of the precincts there have reported. So it's still quite early to make any sort of conclusions from there. The results we're seeing so far are from rural places. So it'll be interesting to see if there's a divide between rural and urban places. There is a lot of places in the United States where those urban precincts tend to report later, and those rural precincts tend to report earlier. Now, a little bit of that can be misleading when we're looking at the raw vote count. So I know you've been working ahead on a piece of software that helps our readers get ahead of what's going on in these rural urban divides and helps them kind of get an understanding for what's happening in that raw vote count. Do you want to talk to me a little bit about this model you've been working on? Yeah, definitely. So how the model works is it takes the 2016 results and basically compares them to what we're seeing as the 2020 results so far. And in New Hampshire, it's doing this on a uh, township level. And so far, 23 townships have reported. We need approximately 28 to start this model running. And I'm hoping that one of the townships that come in soon are one of the big cities, because most of the townships that are at 100% reporting are rural townships. It would certainly be more helpful for us if we're going to give anybody a peek behind the curtain to have a more representative sample of voters. Absolutely. <laughs> I'm really waiting for that five, for those five extra townships myself. Now, there's one last thing that I'd like to show you here on the map before we send it back. I want to talk a little bit about Concord. Now, this is Merrimack County. It's relatively large. It has a, an urban area in Concord, and we're seeing that Amy Klobuchar is doing really well here. She's won some townships on the outside, on the outskirts here of the city, um, and we're really expecting to see that increase over time. We're at just not even 25% of the vote reporting here, and we're seeing that Pete Buttigieg is really close to Amy Klobuchar. She's got about 25%, Pete Buttigieg at about 24%, and Bernie Sanders back here at about 23%. We're going to see more of those results through the night. Until then, we're going to kick it back on the ground to you in New Hampshire, Libby. Thank you so much, Jeremy. Let's go now to Joyce Coe, who's with the Sanders campaign. Joyce. Hey, Libby, I am joined by Ryan Buchanan, who's the State House representative here and uh, also the co-chair for Veterans for Bernie. Um, I wanted to ask you, what do you think about the numbers that are coming out so far? Uh, it's it's look, looking like a pretty good night for Bernie. Yeah, um, I had no doubts in my mind it was going to be a good night for Bernie. Uh, Bernie has always had a strong uh, game here in New Hampshire, you know, being a neighboring state for, uh, senator. Um, you know, they had a really good game plan with the people going out, uh, supporting Bernie. Um, he did great in 2016. So I didn't, uh, I wasn't surprised by that at all. I always figured he would probably finish at about 35, 36 uh, percent as far as uh, total overall. And Ryan, you've been to uh, at least 10 Bernie events <laughs> in New Hampshire. Um, how have you seen sort of the evolution of him throughout the year? And now, uh, obviously, the night of the primary is a big night for him. How have you seen him change as a candidate or uh, his, his campaign evolve? Yeah. Um, I actually think that's kind of the appeal of Bernie is that he has a change. You know, he's been pushing for the same agenda for 40 years, and it got to the part, point where now the party has come to him versus him going to the party. And I think that's what's so appealing about a candidate like Bernie Sanders. Um, a lot of candidates will flip-flop on policy. We saw that with Amy Klobuchar, or, not Amy Klobuchar, excuse me, uh, Kamala Harris. There we go. Uh, Kamala Harris, where on stage she was saying, I'm for Medicare for all, but then she goes back to the spin room and she says, oh, not really, you know. And I think that's, uh, that's what makes people so drawn to Bernie is that you know what you're getting. He's not trying to just win your vote with by saying what he thinks you want to hear. He'll tell you things that are not popular, but 
are true. And that's uh, kind of a mark of just the type of quality of person that he is and the integrity that Bernie Sanders has. Do you think that uh, him being a senator from Vermont, having sort of um, being being a neighbor, neighboring, neighboring um, being up from a neighboring state of New Hampshire, do you think that gives him an advantage, or do you think that his um, policies and his message just resonates because um, because it does? Yeah, no, and that's a that's a fair question to ask. But I think we have a unique sample in this, where we have another neighboring senator, Elizabeth Warren. Um, coming into the uh, primaries at the same time, but now we're seeing that Elizabeth Warren is not performing as well as Bernie Sanders. And if we look at the Warren's campaign, she did change some policies, kind of walk back some things, whereas Bernie Sanders has been pounding the pavement going, nope, this is what I believe, this is what we're going to do. And you, you can see the results yourself. It's the policies. The policies are what make Bernie not only the most electable, but the most trusted and the most uh, dependable person on, um, out of all the candidates. How do you think it'll go for him tonight? I think it's going to go very well. I'm looking forward to tonight. It's going to be a big victory for us. Um, good momentum going into uh, Nevada and South Carolina. And it's Super Tuesday. I think we're going to clean sweep. Great. Thank you so much, Ryan, for joining us. My pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. So, Libby, people have started trickling in here um, and starting to fill out. There's a long line outside, people waiting to get in here. Um, I will send it back to you in uh, Manchester. Great. Thank you so much, Joyce Coe, with the Sanders campaign. Let's go now to Hannah Jewell, who's with the Elizabeth Warren team. And Warren is someone who needs to do well tonight to, to keep her momentum going. Hannah, tell us about what you're seeing there. Hi there, Libby. I'm thrilled to be here with our colleague Annie Linsky of The Washington Post itself. She's been following the Warren campaign now for a long time. And, and tell me what's going on tonight. What should we be looking for? Hi there. Um, so Senator Warren's going to be coming out to speak any minute now at her election night party. Um, the big news from her campaign today is um, her campaign manager, Roger Lau, um, put out a memo a few hours ago sort of outlining a um, torturous path to the, um, to the nomination for her. The sort of big takeaway from it was that she has this idea of um, winning the nomination without any victories in states, at least early victories in states. She's trying to make the case that this is a very muddled race, and I think that's a fair point, um, and that she can persist and stay in the in the hunt even if she does not do well, not only here in New Hampshire, which is right in her backyard, but also in um, they're not looking at good finishes in um, Nevada or South Carolina that are coming up. And it's not really obvious which states she would win on Super Tuesday. The point they make is it's not about winning states, it's about winning delegates, and that she has a solid chance to continue to pull in delegates. Um, I mean, that's the state of the race right now, but, you know. This sounds like a very Warren-esque plan, I have to say. She has a plan for that. It's kind of a complicated one. Is it an inspiring one to supporters and to donors, frankly? It's a very complicated one for supporters and donors. I mean, you know, talking to some of the other campaigns about this, their take is that this is a, a sort of memo geared towards her very highly educated donor class and her, her base, which, you know, people who really like data and like to have kind of interesting theories and like a counter argument to make. Um, and in that, in that, you know, to that effect, they do provide a lot of counter theories and a lot of data. The other really interesting thing about this memo is this is a campaign that has talked over and over again about not having consultants, not using pollsters, but they are using a lot of polling data in that memo. Um, so that's a little uh, odd. Well, we'll keep an eye out. She's going to be coming soon. Back to you for now, Libby. Great. Thanks so much, Hannah. Appreciate that. Andrew Yang is now addressing supporters. So let's go and hear what Andrew Yang has got to say. And that is thanks to all of you who are here tonight. Though thousands of voters came out for our campaign tonight, tonight is not the outcome we fought so hard to achieve. It is bitterly disappointing for many of us, but it shouldn't be. Every single day I've been campaigning, I've had supporters say to me, your campaign helped me out of a depression. Thank you. Working on this campaign has made me a better person. I met my significant other because of you. Your campaign brought my family together. 
your pa campaign got me excited about politics for the first time. <laughs> These are all things that people have said to me in the past days, and they are the reasons why I am so incredibly proud of this campaign and what we've accomplished together. We have touched and improved millions of lives and moved this country we love so much in the right direction. And while there is great work left to be done, you know I am the math guy, and it is clear tonight from the numbers that we are not going to win this race. I am not someone who wants to accept donations and support in a race that we will not win. And so tonight I am announcing I am suspending my campaign for president. Thank you, I love you too. Thank you, New Hampshire. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, New Hampshire. I love you too. This is not an easy decision or something I made lightly with the team. Endings are hard, and I've always had the intention to stay in this race until the very end. But I have been persuaded that the message of this campaign will not be strengthened by my staying in this race any longer. Endings are hard, New Hampshire, but this is not an ending. This is a beginning. This is just the starting line. This campaign has awakened something fundamental in this country and ourselves. This is a movement. Yeah. This movement has outlasted over a dozen senators, governors, and members of Congress to become the most exciting force in this entire race. The Yang Yang has fundamentally shifted the direction of this country and transformed our politics, and we are only continuing to grow. I'd like to thank my incredible staff and the hundreds of people who left their lives and their jobs to join and build this campaign. I know what a risk that was. Very few people joined this campaign because they thought it was going to be a good career move. So thank you. Thank you to my team. My goal when I first started running was to solve the problems that got Donald Trump elected. In order to do that, I will support whoever is the Democratic nominee. Andrew Yang well, announcing that he's dropping out of the presidential race. That's Andrew Yang announcing he's dropping out. But Elizabeth Warren is also coming out to address her supporters. So we're going to move over to the Warren event. Hello, New Hampshire. So the results are still coming in from across the state. But right now it is clear that Senator Sanders and Mayor Buttigieg had strong nights. And I also want to congratulate my friend and colleague, Amy Klobuchar, for showing just how wrong the pundits can be when they count a woman out. <laughs> but since we are here tonight among family and friends, I also want us to be honest with ourselves as Democrats. We might be headed for another one of those long primary fights that lasts for months. We're two states in with 55 states and territories to go. We still have 98% of our delegates for our nomination up for grabs. And Americans in every part of the country are going to make their voices heard. That's right. The question for us Democrats is whether it will be a long, bitter rehash of the same old divides in our party or whether we can find another way. 
Senator Sanders and Mayor Buttigieg are both great people, and either one of them would be a far better president than Donald Trump. I respect them both. But the fight between factions in our party has taken a sharp turn in recent weeks. With ads mocking other candidates and with supporters of some candidates shouting curses at other Democratic candidates. These harsh tactics might work if you are willing to burn down the rest of the party in order to be the last man standing. They might work if you don't worry about leaving our party and our politics worse off than how you found it. And they might work if you think only you have all the answers and only you are the solution to all our problems. But if we're going to beat Donald Trump in November, we are going to need huge turnout within our party. And to get that turnout, we will need a nominee that the broadest coalition of our party feels like they can get behind. cannot afford to fall into factions. We can't afford to squander our collective power. We win when we come together. You know, the Reverend Jesse Jackson once said, it takes two wings to fly. And I think he's right. Our campaign is best positioned to beat Donald Trump in November because we can unite our party. We can unite this party and this country by mobilizing people behind ideas that are not only popular with huge majorities of the American people, but that also accomplish structural change for our broken government and our rigged economy. We can unite people around a wealth tax on the very richest Americans so we can invest in education for all our children. We can unite people around ending corruption in Washington, ending the corruption that has meant stagnant wages, rising costs, and a tighter and tighter squeeze on the middle class. We can do that. <laughs> ending corruption that leaves more and more working families with less and less hope for a better future, and that has crushed people of color even harder. Ending the corruption that has shortchanged our kids, our schools, and the very survival of the planet they will inherit. <laughs> Families in America today are running out of time. We have faced decades of shrinking opportunity, decades of rising inequality, decades of a widening racial wealth gap. Big business has captured and used government to serve its own interests at the expense of smaller businesses and the expense of the American people. I believe in markets, but markets without rules are theft. Markets without rules perpetuate racial discrimination. And for too long, the rules have been rigged against people who just want a level playing field. 2020 is our time to change who makes the rules. Now, it was never my plan to run for office of any kind. We're glad you did. Well, good. plan. And I have been in this fight, though, this fight for working families for decades. I fought credit card companies as they tried to trick and track consumers. I fought our own banking regulators to hold them accountable during the financial crash. I fought to build a new federal agency to protect consumers from predatory financial <laughs> In this fight, I ran for office 
because I saw that families were being squeezed harder than ever, and too many politicians were not getting enough done. I'm here to get big things done. Because here's the thing about politicians. Whether they're offering vague platitudes or powerful rhetoric, they will ultimately face the same test, actually getting anything done in a Washington that is badly broken. Americans from all political backgrounds don't need a bunch of flowery words to explain this. They know deep down in their bones exactly why government doesn't work for them. It's corruption and we need to call it out for what it is. The corruption that gives lobbyists a louder voice than voters. The corruption that lets big companies pay nothing in taxes while small businesses pay full freight. The corruption that ensures that nothing ever changes on gun violence or climate policy or drug prices, even though nearly everyone in America wants change. And let's be specific here. On a day when career prosecutors showed more backbone than almost every Republican senator standing up to this president, Americans of all political stripes are gravely concerned about the corruption of a Trump Justice Department that abandons the rule of law to give sweetheart deals to criminals who commit their crimes on behalf of Donald Trump. And yes, Roger Stone, I'm looking at you. Tonight, 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 I have a message for our party and for this nation. Our best chance of beating Donald Trump is with a candidate who can do the work, and I mean the hard, disciplined work. A candidate who can build a campaign to unite our party, and a candidate who can build a movement that is ready to take on corruption and win. can take on corruption in Washington is if we're not beholden to it. Let's just check the facts. Amy and I are the only candidates in this race who are not either billionaires or supported by super PACs. And unlike other candidates, I don't fund my campaign by spending time behind closed doors sucking up to wealthy donors. is powered by you. It is powered by people. And over the past year, I've had the chance to shake hands or hug way over 100,000 people in more than 220 town halls in 29 states in Puerto Rico. And you know, there are a lot of differences among us. We come from different backgrounds, different religions, languages, and experiences. We have different dreams and different aspirations. We feel the urgency of this moment in different ways. But with all of those glorious differences, for the most part, we want the same things. We want an America where decisions in Washington aren't bought and paid for by lobbyists and big donors. We want an America where every person has a voice in our democracy. We want an America where fossil fuel companies don't have a vice grip on our planet. An America where we can breathe the air and drink the water. An America where every child can dream big and actually have a chance to make it. 
Because no matter the color of your skin, who you love, how you worship, or what zip code you live in, you deserve an America where you are safe and your opportunities are just as good as anyone else's. see that America. That America is within our reach. And if you can imagine that America, if you think it's worth fighting for, then join us. Go to ElizabethWarren.com right now, pitch in a few bucks, sign up to volunteer, get involved with our campaign. This moment will not come our way again. So tonight, Tonight, I'm here to say thank you. Thank you to every volunteer. Thank you to every organizer, to every door knocker, to every phone banker, for every $5 donor. Thank you. Thank you for helping build a movement to take back our democracy and to rebuild it from the grassroots up. And, and while I'm thanking everyone, I want to take just a moment, where are you, to thank my sweetie Bruce. And I also want to thank the good boy who posed for one selfie after another, our Bailey. The fight we're in, the fight to save our democracy, is an uphill battle. But our campaign is built for the long haul. And we are just getting started. I am grateful down to my toes for what our campaign has been able to, to accomplish so far. My plans for this country have been influenced by letters pressed into my palms by little girls. My will to fight has been strengthened by the people who have whispered their dreams in my ears. My determination to lead a movement has been forged by the tens of thousands of people who have said they are ready to fight for an America they know we can be. Because if we have the hope that comes with dreaming big, if we have the courage to fight hard, we are going to win. Thank you. Elizabeth Warren addressing her supporters here in New Hampshire. Let's go to my colleagues, James Homan and Amber Phillips. Elizabeth Warren uh, giving a message to her supporters. James, talk about, share these lines. A lot of times on the campaign trail, what message does she need to give tonight, not just to her supporters here in New Hampshire, but people in Nevada? People in Nevada. She has 11. My colleague Kevin with the Hope Over Fear placard is going to be the start of the line. For those with accessibility needs, please stay in your section. We will come to you. Ready. 
Hey, we've got some new updates for you here in the Election Insight Center back in Washington, D.C. So with about a third of the vote in, we're seeing some really interesting trends. Let's get started on this map. We've got Bernie Sanders in the purple, Pete Buttigieg in the green, Amy Klobuchar in the indigo, and Elizabeth Warren in the orange. And what you can see is, with a little bit reporting in every county, we're seeing a wide wall of Bernie Sanders support. And then there's some places where he's doing particularly well. So here in Hillsborough County, He's got 28.3% of the vote. He's running pretty far ahead of Mayor Pete Buttigieg and competitors Amy Klobuchar, who are at 22.6 and 19.9, just about 20% there. Joe Biden, a distant fourth at just around 10%. Now, we're seeing some other places where that is not quite as pronounced. There's a real neck and neck race here in Merrimack, which is home to the big city of Concord. And we're seeing that Bernie Sanders has barely, a, not even a single point lead over Pete Buttigieg here. And actually, this is a similar case in nearby Rockingham, where we're seeing just about a one point lead between Sanders and Buttigieg here. And that's really one of the themes of the night. It looks like Bernie Sanders is pretty far ahead, but we've got a little bit more insight for you on that. And for that, I would like to come over here to our senior data scientist, Lenny Bronner. Lenny, you've been running our model for the first time tonight. Are you seeing anything that's interesting that maybe gives us a little bit of insight beyond these raw vote totals? Yeah, definitely, Jeremy. So what we're seeing is that the race seems a lot closer than it seems like from the results we're getting in. It doesn't seem as if Bernie Sanders, Bernie Sanders might hold on to his lead, but it, we'll see how it proceeds for the rest of the night. We have a couple interesting things that come out of the model. Some of these are, it seems that uh, Bernie is holding on to something like 37% of his voters from 2016, which is substantially lower than I thought, and also probably lower than what he held on to in Iowa. Uh, other things that we're seeing is that it seems that Buttigieg is able to get voters from both Hillary Clinton and Bernie Sanders in 2016, which is really interesting. We already saw that when you presented that diagram before, that Buttigieg was able to get some uh, Bernie Sanders support from 2016, but it seems to have gone up even further in um, gone up even further in New Hampshire, where he seems to be getting votes, approximately equal number of votes from Hillary Clinton and Bernie Sanders. Uh, and the third most interesting thing that I found is that uh, Amy Klobuchar seems to be Hillary Clinton's successor this time around. She's getting approximately 40% of, of Hillary Clinton votes in 2016. Uh, this is really outstanding and interesting because those raw vote totals can be a little bit misleading. Lenny, for a little bit more on that, for that Klobuchar vote, a thing that we were talking about just a couple minutes ago was that for Amy Klobuchar and Pete Buttigieg, it looked like the span of possible outcomes was relatively wide. But for Bernie Sanders, that span of possible outcomes was relatively short. Is there anything in that that gives us some insight into how these candidates might fare later in the evening? Yeah, that's absolutely right. And I think the reason that that's happening is there seems to be very little variation in Bernie Sanders' results that he's getting in the townships that we've seen so far. He's doing as well as the model would think he was doing in basically all townships. But the Bernie, uh, sorry, Pete Buttigieg and Amy Klobuchar seem to be doing quite well in some townships and a lot not as well in uh, some of these other townships. So basically the variation is higher. So the model thinks that they're probably going to perform worse than Bernie Sanders, but do think that there's an outside chance that they might perform exceedingly well tonight. Well, these are the kinds of things that we've been watching here in the studio. And for more on that, we're going to kick it out to Rhonda in New Hampshire. Rhonda? That's right. We are still at the Amy Klobuchar party. And, you know, the crowd here, they're very excited right now. It's a very lively group. I have with me uh, an Amy Klobuchar supporter, Chris Cody. He is a New Hampshire resident, has lived in Concord for the last few years. Chris, you just told me off camera that you at first were a supporter of Pete Buttigieg. But you changed your mind at the last minute. Tell me what changed your mind and you decided to go for Klobuchar. The last debate, I really loved. I think she's really smart. I, I, I just really like her temperament which I think is really important and part of this debate coming up for the president. So um, Amy's, yeah, she's been my... Is there an issue that she talks about uh, that resonates with you? Um, climate change is definitely one of those things that I'm definitely, like, on, on board with Amy for. It. So, yeah. Yeah, I've heard that a lot, actually, from other New Hampshire voters, that it's climate change. It's also health care. A lot of people are talking about health care. Health care is the other one. Yeah, no doubt about it. Right. Now, you told me also off camera that you wanted to meet her while she was in town campaigning. Tell me a little bit of, you know, when you met her. This Was it yesterday? Um, it was a couple days ago. She's staying in the hotel next to my work, and I kind of did the little, like, hey, like, knocking on, you know, knocking on the door where she was doing, like, a private... Um, round table and um, she was so nice she came like opened the door and like came out gave us a hug and I, I, it's really appreciated that part of it and that kind of that so also with the, the debate solidified my, my vote tonight 
Now, one thing that I heard over and over over the weekend and also today is that most New Hampshire voters really want to vote for someone who can beat Donald Trump. Do you feel that she's the strongest candidate? Because there have been many people saying that she's not exactly that strong to take on this, the current president. So I'm going to say no. But I do feel like her momentum is going to go somewhere very soon. And that's why I did, like, when I was in the, in the ballot box today, looked at it and I said yes. So I do think there's something that's going to start coming soon. Yeah. And, you know, I know a lot of uh, New Hampshire voters are independent voters. In fact, the state has over 40 percent of independent voters. That's over the national average. You know, what does that say about New Hampshire? Um... You know, I looked at the numbers today before, right after I voted, and 52, 48 or 52 percent of people were still undecided. That says a lot about this country. It's not just about the state. The, the country is in, in, a, in a position where they're looking to create something. And I, I think that it's, it's going to—I'm hoping, I'm hoping for a Democrat. You know, um, I don't know. We'll see. Chris, thank you so much yes. for uh, spending some time with us. I'm going to send things to my colleague, uh, Jorge Ribas. Jorge, what's going on where you are? Hey, Rhonda, how are you? We're here at the Buttigieg event. As you can see behind me, it's totally filled up now. And I'm joined once again by Post Politics reporter Chelsea Jane. Chelsea, thanks for joining us. Yes. Um, I wanted to ask you. Uh, I was talking to a voter down, down there, and she mentioned that she, was, she wasn't disappointed with uh, Buttigieg's second place, but she was surprised by Klobuchar's third place. And so do you think she represents any kind of threat to him? And, like, what does that mean for his campaign? Yeah, you know, with a third of the results in, I think she's a lot closer to him than we thought she would be maybe a day ago, maybe even earlier today. Um, you know, we heard a lot of Buttigieg people wondering about the Klobuchar, uh, and I think that it certainly seems to be real. I mean, there's a lot of results yet to come and um, obviously nothing certain, but she's she's closer than I think anyone thought she would be as, you know, when we came to New Hampshire. So I think she's a threat to him in that, you know, there's still real no clear favorite for the moderate side of the party to take on Sanders. Um, and as they continue to try to sort that out, you know, Buttigieg needs to kind of hold off everyone, and that includes her. So leaving here... Uh, will go to Nevada and then South Carolina. And both those states are much more diverse, obviously, than Iowa and New Hampshire have been. A lot has been made about that and whether Buttigieg will struggle in those states. Can you talk a little bit about that? What do you think is coming up for him? How does he appeal to more minority voters? You know, I think one of the interesting things is that while he has struggled with black voters, and that's obviously a problem in South Carolina, he actually has one of the more formidable organizations in Nevada. He's voiced his own radio ads in Spanish there, you know, for some of the Latino communities. So they've made a real push there to, to reach out to the Latinx communities to get him, you know, visible. And then they've also done a lot of what they did in Iowa, which is reach out to counties that are maybe Republican-leaning, maybe, you know, more independent-heavy, and say, you know, if you don't like Trump, here's your alternative. So they've kind of got a two-pronged approach out there. and. You know, if the organization part pays off the way it did in Iowa, he could be in good shape. But I think South Carolina could be, you know, will be really telling for him because he has struggled to get black support. And uh, a lot of the candidates have. But obviously for him, that's just been a more prominent, prominent narrative. Um, his attacks mostly have focused on Biden and Sanders. Obviously, those have been the two front runners until now. Does he change his tactic at all? Does he go against Klobuchar? Like, does he? What does he do? Does he start ignoring Biden? I don't know. What does he do next? Yeah, he certainly ratcheted it up against Sanders this week, as it was clear that the two of them would sort of be vying for the top spot. Klobuchar has not been afraid to go after him. Um, she has been pretty focused on Pete in, in several debates. But you know, I think, it, you know, at this point, they don't want to. They don't want to punch down. But if she's right there, you know, it's it's definitely something they're going to have to you know, try to draw some distinctions with, because she certainly hasn't been afraid to do that. And sh frankly, she has some of the same struggles he does with, with minority voters, just doesn't have the track record. So, you know, it could be kind of an interesting race between those two, you know, very different people um, for a really similar group of voters. Um, well, thanks, Chelsea. Thanks for joining us. Uh, Hannah, I'm going to kick it over to you. You're at the Warren event. How are you doing? Hi there. Um, so I am here at the Warren party with Ben and Kate, who are two volunteers for the Warren campaign. And first of all, I just want to know how you are both feeling. I'll start with you, Kate. This has been an exhausting process, but I honestly, taking part in it was incredibly inspiring, and I continue to be inspired by Elizabeth, and I'm 
very glad that I participated in her campaign here in New Hampshire. So it's, the results are still coming in, but it's looking like she's not necessarily doing as well as she had hoped. Are you still hopeful? Oh, absolutely. I mean, I, I think what we're seeing is that Iowa and New Hampshire aren't necessarily the bellwethers that we've had in the past. Um, and that going forward, maybe it's time that another state starts first that's a little bit more representative of the actual United States. So you're a New Hampshireite saying you would, you see how your candidate might have been harmed by this? How so? I don't think she's necessarily harmed by it, but I do think that other candidates have benefited from it. Um, New Hampshire is very white, and there's currently one candidate who doesn't poll at all and is doing very well. So Who's that candidate? It's Pete, Mayor Pete. So, Ben, uh, you're do having a bucket list item being interviewed, you said earlier. How are you feeling tonight? Excellent. It's, it's I, the end's in sight, which will be tomorrow morning. And it's like, I'm so tired. I've been doing this since June. I've been knocking doors since June, almost 3,000 doors. And thinking about the fact that I'll not be doing that in a couple of days is really kind of weird because I have just been all out for a war and since, since April when I, they said, got a hold of me. They said, hey, Ben, would you like to work for us? And I said, okay. And, I, and then I said, can I canvas in May? And they said, no, no, we're not starting until June. I was like, so I was ready to go out. I was ready to go all in for her. Day so one. are you not a, such a hardcore Warren fan? Are you not a little more disappointed that she had hoped to, you know, she had been managing expectations, but it doesn't seem that she'll even get a third place tonight. I, I'm very confident in the organization and the skill of her team and where they're going and her message, which is top notch and the right message for the country. And so do you think her strategy of sort of clawing delegates from all parts of the country, is that... Is that an inspiring message, do you think, for gaining supporters and donors? Yeah, I mean, I think we saw this week that some of her Iowa staffers deployed to places like uh, Missouri, where I assume that candidates don't necessarily campaign. And I, I trust in the vision of where we are going forward. I, her, her organization is just top-notch. I cannot speak highly enough about the organization here on the ground in New Hampshire. It was the most organized campaign I've ever seen in my entire life. Um, and her staffers are just the best that I've ever seen. I mean, her campaign manager here in the state, Liz Wester, is probably one of the best staffers in the game. So you said that um, Mayor Pete, Pete Buttigieg, has been doing very well. I'm curious why you think there is a little overlap, if you think there is, between interests in these candidates, which have such radically different platforms. I think both candidates are incredibly inspiring, and that's where they have their overlap. They're also really talking about change. Both Pete and Elizabeth are definitely change candidates. Um, Pete, with this generational change, he's younger, but Elizabeth, with more of this uh, change specifically geared towards helping the middle class and fighting corruption. And I think in both instances, it really resonates with voters. So, Ben, you said you'd knocked on, like, 4,000 doors. Or did you have something to add about the, the Buttigieg question? All right, no, I want to make sure you get your bucket list uh, experience uh, just yeah. how you want it. You've knocked on 4,000 doors. Um, what did you find? Was, were people not as interested as you had hoped? No, I found there was a lot of folks who were very interested. The state is very engaged in the process. New Hampshire is, they were right out there. A lot of people wanted to talk to me about things. It was a lot of fun. I'm sorry to cut you off. I hope you've had a wonderful time. We have to throw it back to you guys. Hey, how are you doing? Thanks for that. And we're really excited because we've got additional votes for you tonight. Now, I want to caution that we're running a little bit behind where we've been in previous years, 2016, 2012, 2008. We had more votes at this point in the night than we have now. But it's not anything like Iowa. We're at 38% reporting, and we've got those 24 delegates that are up at stake. Now, we're taking a look at this map, and we're seeing the Bernie Sanders purple is covering a lot of the state. But something important has happened since the last time we talked, and that is that Mayor Pete Buttigieg has pulled ahead a little bit here in Rockingham. So you can tell the numbers aren't that high, but he was running about a point behind Bernie Sanders here the last time that we chatted. Now he's running a little under a point ahead of him. This isn't all of that far out of the ordinary. From what we talked to uh, Lenny Bronner a little bit earlier, we heard that Mayor Pete has a built-in base of support, and he's been sneaking voters away from those 2016 Hillary Clinton camp, as well as pulling from the old 2016 Bernie Sanders camp as well. Now, there's some other things that I'd like to show you about on this map that I think are a little bit interesting. 
Here in the city of Manchester, we're seeing about 40% reporting, and we've got Bernie Sanders with 28% of the vote. He's really far out in front, but we're expecting a lot of votes to come in this area still. And it's likely that Sanders is not going to hold this, uh, this lead entirely. Um, one of the things that is true about a lot of elections is that rural areas tend to count faster and urban areas tend to count a lot slower. So we see a really pronounced urban-rural divide. And what that means tonight is that Bernie Sanders' votes are going to count a lot faster than the votes for more establishment candidates like Pete Buttigieg or tonight Amy Klobuchar. For a little bit more insight on that particular setup, we're going to come over here and talk to Lenny Bronner. Lenny is a senior data scientist on our Election Insights team. Lenny, what are you seeing in tonight's results maybe since the last time that we talked? Yeah, so Jeremy, what you showed us before, approximately 40% of the precincts are reporting, but that doesn't translate quite so uh, neatly onto townships. <clears throat> Excuse me, we're at approximately 25% of townships reporting. So we're still a bit further behind there, but about 25% townships, our model starts to calibrate a bit and starts to look a bit better and it's more trustworthy. And basically, like I said last time, it does look closer than the raw vote totals would suggest, though less close than it did when I first ran the model. The really interesting takeaway, I think, is that uh, Pete Buttigieg seems to be really taking from both camps from 2016. He seems to be getting supporters um, who supported Bernie Sanders uh, four years ago and, and people who supported Hillary Clinton four years ago. And that's really quite surprising to me. That is an interesting trend and one we're going to be keeping an eye on. Now, for a little bit more in that, let's talk to David Byler. David is a Post Opinions columnist and data expert. David, what are you seeing in this latest batch of results that's really caught your eye? What are you thinking about when it comes to how the candidates and campaigns are performing tonight? Right. Well, two things right off the top. First, the main finding is that Joe Biden and Elizabeth Warren are really not doing well compared to their pre-election polls, while Klobuchar is doing very well. That's sort of the big takeaway here. But if we drill down a little bit deeper, um, we have Bernie Sanders, Pete Buttigieg, and Amy Klobuchar ahead. Now, Bernie Sanders is the only one of these three who has consistently showed you know, decent polling with non-white voters. This is an area that Klobuchar and Buttigieg have had a lot of trouble with. So if those three manage to make it out, that may end up being a good state of affairs for Sanders if he can be in first. That's true, because the next states that we have coming, Nevada and South Carolina, are places where there are more non-white voters than these fairly non-representative states of New Hampshire and Iowa. Is there anything in these results that you think is uh, leaning that there are people who maybe should call it quits after tonight? Are there folks who are wildly underperforming who maybe should give it up? Yeah, so we've already seen Andrew Yang give up and call it quits. We've seen Michael Bennett. I wouldn't be surprised if we saw Deval Patrick follow suit. Um, but I would be interested in what Warren does within the next couple of weeks because Iowa and New Hampshire were supposed to be sort of her excellent state. She's made signals about sticking it out. But I would be interested to see where she goes. Pete Buttigieg is definitely keeping sort of his campaign alive with these strong finishes. Same with Klobuchar. Joe Biden doesn't have any reason not to stick it out to South Carolina. But it'll be interesting to see where his support goes and if he sort of limps along or if he has some kind of resilience or resurgence. Fabulous. Thank you a lot for that, David, and also you, Lenny. Uh, Y'all's insight has been invaluable, and we're going to continue having more of that insight for you throughout the night. But for now, we're going to toss it back to Libby in New Hampshire. Libby? Great. Thank you so much, Jeremy. So I'm with my guests, Amber Phillips and James Homan. So Andrew Yang out, Michael Bennett also out. Uh, let's talk a little bit more about these candidates who are bowing out or are being very closely watched. They've got to get on the board in some way tonight to perform. Um, we, we heard from our colleagues who were reporting on Andrew Yang that he's not endorsing anybody yet, although certainly he's got his ears open to people, um, and that he regrets going so big in Iowa. Now, there's just the question of did candidates sink too much into a state that was sort of a mess? Um, but Yang, James, also put a ton of resources here into New Hampshire. He did, Libby. He yeah. went to Phillips Exeter Academy, which he liked to talk about. He spent a lot of time here. He actually had a quite large staff. Yeah. Uh, he worked worked it really hard on college campuses, uh, and, and it just didn't work. He just, uh, you know, I think as Amber made the point earlier, people liked him, they didn't love him, and they didn't want him to be the Democratic nominee, uh, especially after Donald Trump. You know, I think the idea of taking a chance on someone who has no prior elected office isn't where the Democratic electorate is right now. You know, I talked to a former Democratic Congressman, Paul Hodes, and he was saying um, voters aren't choosing someone based on character. You there, there is this factor that Amy Klobuchar and Joe Biden are trying to display, but they're not choosing someone based on like this charisma. Okay, that's who I want to be president. They're trying to make a calculation. That's very di very different decision. And so Andrew Yang is this person who is you know, 
this character, but he hasn't been like someone who could be president. Let's go now to Rhonda Colvin. Libby, I'm here with our colleague, Alexandra Petri, who is also attending the Klobuchar party and doing some reporting here. Alexandra, you've been to some of her other events here in New Hampshire. What have you been seeing? What stood out to you? Well, what stood out to me was, especially compared to uh, the Biden event that I also went to, was that there was sort of joy in the room. And like she was making puns. She joked about building a fridge to the future. She was riffing on the energy of the crowd. She like was joking about Donald Trump and sort of a, talking about how he was complaining to the president of Canada about cutting him out of the home alone movie and going, who does that? And so, like, people I talked to were sort of enthused by her. Like, it wasn't the most uplifting rhetoric or possible, but they thought, I found a person that I like, was what I was hearing. Yeah, our colleague Jenna Johnson also told us that her jokes play very well here in New Hampshire. So you've been seeing that as well, that people are really sort of attracted to, you know, her style, her personality. Uh, I believe they're, they're getting some reporting right now about Klobuchar. Um, we're hearing some some claps in the crowd. But Alexandra, you know, a lot of people are saying she might be popular here, but will she be popular in the next states? Will she be in, will she be popular in Nevada or South Carolina? Do you think that that personality that you've seen here will transition into those other states? I, it's difficult to know, but I feel like with Klobuchar, it was one of those things where, like, you're traveling in your suitcase and you think you only have, like, four clean pairs of socks, and suddenly you notice, hey, there's this fifth pair of socks that's perfectly usable. I don't have to go to the place where they get new socks anymore. I don't have to buy CVS socks. And so people are saying, hey, here's that exciting fifth pair of socks. And so uh, she could be that in Nevada as well. Yeah. Have you talked to any New Hampshire voters during your time here? And what have they been saying? Well, so the people I talked to at her rally actually drove up from Alabama, and they've been doing this every year for, or not every year, because then they, like, every three years, they'd be like, what's going on? Why am I not, why is there no uh, primary happening? Uh, but every four years, and they were just, they were like, we found our candidate, we're excited. So they're not from New Hampshire, they were stoked. So if she can hang on a few more states, I think, and get people into her rooms, potentially there's a chance. If more people vote for her than vote for the others, she can prevail. All right. Well, thank you very much, Alexandra. And I'm going to send things now to Joyce Co. Joyce? Hey, Rhonda. I'm at the uh, Bernie Sanders watch party, and I have Ellen here from Hopkinton, New Hampshire. Um, Ellen has been supporting Bernie Sanders since 2016. How do you feel tonight? He looks like he's going to have another great night in New Hampshire. I am so excited. I can't stand it. I couldn't eat all day. I couldn't sleep. I, I, I am so excited. I am. <laughs> I'm over the moon excited. I, you've been you've been hosting some Sanders staffers since January. You said, "What has that been like?" It has been a, an amazing experience, a fabulous experience. I don't know if I just lucked out and got two amazing young men. And over the course of the last six weeks or so, they brought friends home, and it, their enthusiasm, their momentum, their commitment, their passion, their passion for this candidate is just palpable and just endless. That's an experience that's so unique to these early primary states. You know, not everyone in America gets to uh, host some staffers. What, what, what do you take away from the experience of this whole primary process? Um, to be brave, take chances, open your, open your home, your heart to these people, that it does matter, that um, these young staffers, it's, they're going to inherit this planet, this country, and anything I can do to support their efforts to make this the country they want to live in and can thrive in and grow in. And you, you called the experience life-changing. Why yeah. is that? Life-changing in that I took a big risk, and the, the return on this investment of a few rooms in my home, as many groceries as I can shove at them, um, the reward has just been tenfold. It's just their excitement, their energy, their teaching me. Um, I, 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 it's... It's, um... You're speechless. What? You're speechless. I am. I truly am. I am. And I've just been feeding off their energy. And I... Um... Yeah. I, and I feel like I've, I've inherited a few more kids, a few more children who will forever be part of my, my 
my family. They are part of my family. How exciting is it in here for you? Obviously, people are cheering because uh, CNN is on this uh, camera behind us, um, and people are really cheering because this is the presence here. How does it feel for you seeing the numbers tonight? Uh, amazing. I, I, I'm so thrilled. I'm not shocked. I've been feeling it all over the last few weeks. I, but it feels awesome. It, 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 it is the hard work's paying off. His approach is paying off. The grassroots movement is paying off. People feel heard. People um, are have have a voice, have an impact, and they feel it. I, I think they feel it. I feel it. I, I, I don't think I'll ever be complacent again. I feel like it does matter what I can contribute as a volunteer, as a ho whatever I can do. It really does matter, and. Um, I'm so, so honored that I was asked to do this, and um, yeah, it just, it ended my cynicism about politics. It really just um, has changed my perspective. Well, thank you so much for joining us and chatting with us, Ellen. Um, a lot of excitement here at the Bernie Sanders campaign because it's looking like it could be a very good night for him. I'll send things over to you in the studio, Jeremy. Hey, thanks for that. You know, we've got some more interesting insight for you. It's not just live votes and analysis that we have, but also a little bit more about exit polling. And for more on that, I'd like to introduce our polling analyst, Emily Guskin. Emily, tell us a little bit about what's going on with Amy Klobuchar. It looks like she's doing exceedingly well tonight. She's in third place overall. Is there something in those exit polls that sort of explains her rise tonight? So we're seeing her doing pretty well in a few interesting groups and one of those groups are people who attend religious services at least weekly and she's according to early exit polls getting about three in ten of those voters which when you break down everything by so many candidates is a pretty large chunk she's also doing pretty well among late deciders and there's a pretty large share of late deciders according to this uh, these early ex exit polls um, She's splitting those voters with Buddha Judge for the most part, but she's doing pretty well among that group. And she's also doing very well among seniors 65 and older, which we know older people tend to show up and vote on election days. Well, for more about that, David Byler, our post opinion columnist and data analyst. David, what are you seeing in these Klobuchar numbers? What does it tell you about the path forward to Nevada, maybe South Carolina? Uh, these numbers are really interesting, and they tell me a few things about Klobuchar. One, her support from older voters suggests she might be siphoning some off from Joe Biden. He's a candidate who's been doing well with older voters for the entirety of this primary, and that's a group that doesn't always get sort of taken into Bernie Sanders' camp. It's someone who she could sort of take if she's trying to expand her coalition outwards. Late deciders also make sense. She had what was lauded as a good debate performance just a few days earlier. Uh, she's sort of getting that surge that many people predicted in Iowa, but that didn't really materialize. She's kind of getting it in New Hampshire, which is interesting. And I'm also interested in the religious attenders numbers because in past elections, Amy Klobuchar has a reputation for winning groups that are sort of outside of the Democratic fold and posting higher margins than people who are at the top of the ticket. So I'm kind of wondering if that pattern ends up showing up in primaries as well. You know, those things are really fascinating. But a thing that's been on my mind has been what's happening to Joe Biden. It looks like those numbers are down quite a bit from the initial polls. Was there anything, Emily, in those exit polls that tell us something about what happened to Joe Biden tonight? Well, one thing that David mentioned and we've seen in exit polls actually is that 65 plus group. And he didn't get that much support from those senior voters. Um, about one in 10 polled for him. Also, foreign policy voters. He pulled in 43% of them in Iowa, caucus goers. And and in New Hampshire, he's only getting about two in 10 of them. So that's not as good as he did in Iowa. Also, among voters who want to return to Obama's policies, you'd think that would be a really strong group for Biden since he's running as by the Obama candidate. He was his vice president, after all. And they're not pulling for him in as large numbers as one would expect. Um, 
let's see, four and ten, I can't read my notes, but um, the, uh, more of them are going to Klobuchar and Buttigieg than, than we're going for. That is fascinating. And David, you know, we're watching this campaign have trouble, but it looks like there might be strength ahead, right? We've got Nevada, we have South Carolina, where there's a higher proportion of non-white voters. What does the Biden camp see in front of them that maybe brings a little bit of uh, happiness, a little levity to a campaign that seems a bit maybe unhappy? happy tonight. Right. So we actually have some survey data from Nevada and from South Carolina, but it's relatively old. It's before Biden had taken these hits. And he generally does well in those states because they have more diverse electorates, electorates with a number of moderate voters, uh, electorates where people associate him strongly with President Obama, who is an extremely popular figure in the Democratic Party. So with Biden, you have sort of more friendly and familiar territory going forwards. But I'm going to be really interested to see whether or not that actually holds holds up. Um, electability has been one of Biden's key selling points, both in the polls and on the stump. He kind of alludes to it or even just talks about it directly some, oftentimes. And it'll be interesting to see if he loses two elections in a row, do voters still think he's electable? I think that's an open question. All right. We've got results for you coming up probably. But in the meantime, we're going to take it back to New Hampshire. Libby, it's for you. Thanks so much, Jeremy. I am here with my guests, James Homan and Amber Phillips. Let's talk about delegate count. We've been hearing about the polls and sort of seeing momentum and things like that. Let's talk delegates. How important are the delegates out of New Hampshire, James? Well, they're, they, they are important because it does contribute to momentum. And this is going to be a likely, as Elizabeth Warren said in her own speech, mm -hmm. a delegate contest that could last to the convention. Remember, we have Michael Bloomberg, uh, who's literally spent hundreds of millions of dollars in the states that will vote on Super Tuesday. And so the, if, the, if the field does stay as divided as it is, if Elizabeth Warren keeps competing, uh, the, the, the delegates could be divided. And that could allow someone like Bernie Sanders to do what Donald Trump did in 2016, which is even as a majority of the party doesn't want him to be the nominee, continue to accrue delegates in a way that becomes unsurpassable. We don't know the results here tonight, and it's possible Sanders underperforms, but he could still get a lot of the delegates. And we are getting some information. Mm -hmm. uh, Edison Research, uh, which is the, the company that runs the exit poll, projects based on an analysis of the returns that because you, they didn't get to 15%, neither Joe Biden nor Elizabeth Warren are going to get any delegates at all from New Hampshire. So they'll come away with no delegates. And I think that that's it. that is a gut punch. Remember, we're, we called Iowa based on delegates, not based on the popular vote. It does matter. And Elizabeth Warren, when you think about how much time she spent here, how she did lead in the polls last year, how much money she invested here, to emerge with not a single delegate is, is really a a body blow for Elizabeth Warren's campaign. She's from a neighboring state. Yeah. I mean, a, a lot of the media market uh, in New Hampshire, in yeah. the n the dense voter population areas, hears from Boston. Yeah. They hear about Elizabeth Warren and what she's doing on Capitol Hill. It, it's just, I, I, I said coming into this, Libby, I think she had the most to lose tonight because I don't see how she spins not winning any mm -hmm. delegates, if that is indeed what happens. Where Joe Biden can say, oh, I was never meant to compete here. South Carolina is where I'm really going to, you know, flex my muscle. I don't know what Warren says. And you can't, if Elizabeth Warren can't win in New Hampshire, it's not clear where yeah, she where wins. She and it should be noted that there, the history is, is important here, too. No Democrat in modern history has won the nomination without finishing first or second in New Hampshire. And, and you know, the, obviously Donald Trump shows anything can happen. But it's, I think if you're looking at Joe Biden and you're looking at Amy Klobuchar, you start to see a situation where their money's going to dry up. It becomes very hard for them. If you're a voter in the Nevada caucuses the Saturday after next, uh, what do you, are you going to vote for, for Warren or are you going to vote for one of the top four finishers? Since you probably here? had two or three other choices. You know, right. now her campaign tried to put a positive spin on this before the results were even cast. We heard Annie Linsky talk about this from Warren's headquarter parties. Um, and they said, listen, they pointed out that like something like 95% of the delegates have yet to be decided. Mm -hmm. This is a long campaign. Warren in her speech alluded to the fact that she's in it for the long haul. She's going to try to be this unity candidate. Her campaign also predicted, though, that she's going to get within the top two or three of every single Super Tuesday state. That's like 14 states and a couple other territories. 
how does she do that without the money and the momentum? Because she's not, you know, taking time off the campaign trail to do fundraisers. She's, you know, making those pitches for ElizabethWarren.com. And so far she's been raising money doing that. But it was based off the promise of who she's going to be and how she's going to win. That's right. Momentum not only equals votes and attention, it also equals money. And we're seeing the candidates, we've sort of had off the record sense of what the candidates were doing, but now they're sort of sending their schedules, they're making the final decisions. And both, Amy, so Amy Klobuchar tomorrow going to New York City for a fundraiser, Pete Buttigieg going to Indiana for a fundraiser tomorrow, and then going to California doing a fundraiser in San Francisco and Palo Alto. And it's because, you know, they wanna, they wanna get cash off the success to keep their campaigns going. They're willing to have high dollar fundraisers, but it's a reminder of how much, I mean, this, it's obviously a critique of the system, but the money does mm -hmm. matter. Mm -hmm. And and it becomes hard to get people to chip in five bucks here and five bucks there, even if they like Warren, even if she's their second choice, if she's not winning delegates. Right. Yeah, Warren in particular has tied money to momentum mm -hmm. by saying, come give me money. I'm not going to go to you guys. You know, she bashed Pete Buttigieg for this wine cave <laughs> fundraiser to debate. It was a high, prof high profile moment for her that did bring some scrutiny to Pete Buttigieg and the system. Mm -hmm. Warren has skewed that, and, and to have the kind of game plan she has to raise money and have ads organized in Nevada and South Carolina, you have to have people want to come to you. Let's check in now with Rhonda Colvin, our colleague who's with the Klobuchar campaign in Concord. Hi, Rhonda. Hi, Libby. Yes, I'm here with Bert Cooper. He is a New Hampshire voter. Bert, you said that off camera, you said that uh, Amy Klobuchar was not your first pick a few weeks ago. What led you to make that decision today to vote for her? Um, I went to see her uh, speak at New Hampshire Technical Institute here in Concord, and she really seemed like she was a good uh, blend of different things. I mean, she wasn't uh, she wasn't so into herself like I think some of the candidates are, and you know, she seemed really pretty natural. And she's moderate, and I think I think she's more likely to be able to pull in some of the people who had voted for Trump in the past. I'm worried about, you know, making sure that we have enough people to defeat Trump. And I think a moderate voter is, I mean, moderates are, are going to be important in the upcoming election. And I don't know. She seemed more with it than uh, Biden, because um, I think, you know, Biden obviously also would appeal to moderates. But I, it, she's she's got the experience. Um, you know, she she's. Uh, got an extra 20 years on uh, Buttigieg, and she's been in, in the Senate. And so I think she's got the life experience that's really important in getting people to compromise, because it, it's all about compromise at, in the end. Did you watch her at all in the, the last three weeks? She was uh, in the Senate uh, with the impeachment trial. Did you follow her? I know she, she told a lot of voters and reporters that she can walk and chew gum at the same time. She could campaign, but also do her duty as a senator. Did you? What did you think about that? Did you watch her at all during that? I have to say, I'm not. I don't recall whether I actually saw her in the Senate. Um, I and actually, I was telling your other reporter that. I, I was worried. That I didn't think that she was that powerful a candidate until I actually heard her speak. And when I heard her speak um, here in Concord, you know, I, I was very impressed. And, you know, she really seemed like she could reach out to everybody, you know, both the, both the Bernie bros and the, uh, and, and the people who voted for Trump, um, whereas I'm not sure everybody will relate to her the same. I mean, for the other candidates, like Elizabeth Warren, I'm not sure everybody's going to relate to them the same way. Um, but as far as the Senate, I, do, I do, honestly don't remember. I don't remember. And I I only saw her in the debate. Um, I've only watched one debate. So. And was it Friday's debate, yes. the last one? And a lot of people yeah. are saying that was a turning point for them. She looked that great. That she performed well. Yeah, she looked great. And, and so I think, you know, that convinced me that she's... Um, a lot stronger than I thought she was until, you know, before I actually listened to her speak and, and you know, saw what she was about. And, and I think my wife is an independent, and I think my wife was impressed, too. Um, my wife's more moderate. And so I, I think that she's going to appeal to a, a very broad portion of the population, um, and I hope she does well, does well in Nevada and 
South Carolina. Yeah, that's really the question right now. Yeah. People say that she is attractive here, but yeah. will that translate in South Carolina, where there's a lot of minority votes, or uh, Nevada, where there are also a lot of minority votes there as well? A lot of people are worried yeah. that tonight might be somewhat of a fluke, and these next states are going to be really a testing point for her campaign. I, I, I don't know. I mean, I guess the question is, are, are we in New Hampshire... Um, how how similar are we to other people? You know, you know. I think that we voted. I don't know if we voted for Barack Obama or not. I know I did, but you know, in the presidency, yes, you did. Yeah, with uh, so, yeah, when he was against McCain. <laughs> right. No, but in the in the primary. But um, but I, you know, I think at the end of the day, we share a lot of com commonalities, um, and particularly in the middle, maybe we share less commonalities towards the towards the edges. Um, so, but There's I have those root issues and the core issues. Yeah, yeah. So I think the the, the bulk of the to, if it's the bulk of the issues that we're, we're sharing, I think that she stands a decent chance. Um, I'm hoping that other people give her a chance and you know give her a chance to to t talk to them and try and get their vote because I mean I think she's persuaded quite a few people and. New Hampshire in a very short time. So if she has the same opportunity in those other states, uh, I think that's great. I Thank you so much, Bert. Sure. Thank you for uh, uh, set, taking some time out for us. Sure. I do want to let you know that Amy Klobuchar is expected to be addressing this crowd very shortly. So just want to let you know that. Libby, I'm going to send things back to you. Great. Thank you so much, Rhonda. Appreciate that. Uh, so we talked earlier about how Amy Klobuchar hasn't necessarily had to take the punches on the chin that some other candidates have had to suffer. Let's talk about somebody else that hasn't had to go through that, that, that punching yet. Michael Bloomberg. Okay, so he is someone who we are hearing about here. He is choosing to enter the race in kind of a non-traditional, unorthodox way. But he is starting to get more, more scrutiny, James. Yeah, so he... Uh, was mayor of New York for 12 years. And one of the things that came out yesterday was audio of him speaking at an Aspen Institute function a few years back. He was defending his stop and frisk policy, something that a few months ago he apologized for after refusing to do so for years. And it is a reminder of his very spotty record on, on a lot of these racial mm -hmm. issues. And it's notable because he's actually gotten a surprising number of endorsements from African-American leaders. Uh, a lot of mayors in southern cities uh, have, have gotten behind him. Big name mayors like uh, from Richmond and, and, and Washington, D.C., actually, mm -hmm. uh, both African-Americans. And, uh, and, and so I think you're going to start to see Bloomberg get take some hits from the, the, the moderate he's crowd. rising in a couple national polls that have come out this week have shown, here's this mayor who's not even competing in Iowa, New Hampshire, spending literally, what, what is the number, James? You've had it. it it's, it's, it's like $350 yeah. million. Dollars. An insane yeah. amount of money on ads in states that aren't even voting yet. And, and in a way, he's not have, he's building a ground game through the money, but he's not having to be out there talking to voters on the debate stage, running into other candidates, getting questions from reporters. So he is getting this media, this scrutiny on his record in a roundabout way. But I think you're right, Libby, to cast him as this candidate who's like the shadow over the campaign. That, and we have yet to see what that means for the campaign. And, and Bernie Sanders loves the Bloomberg being in the mix with of, of Michael Bloom. Hey, we're here back in the studio in DC and we have a really great set of updates for you. So we're running at about 51% reporting, which is really interesting. And it means that some of these patterns that we were seeing early in the night are starting to become a lot clearer. So let's talk about some of those patterns and set up the stage for you. We've got Bernie Sanders in the purple, we've got Pete Buttigieg in green, Amy Klobuchar in indigo, and Elizabeth Warren in orange. Now, what we're seeing tonight is that Bernie Sanders has 27 and a little bit percent of the vote. We've got Pete Buttigieg with about 23 and a half. We've got Amy Klobuchar a little under 20 percent. Then we have Elizabeth Warren in a distant fourth at right around 10 percent. This numbers have not changed too much since the last time we talked, but the number of votes really has. We're at like about half of the total vote has been reported, which means we've got about half remaining. Now, for some interesting insight, I'd like to point out places where Mayor Pete Buttigieg is doing particularly well and maybe ahead of what we expected, particularly here in Rockingham. 
Buttigieg has widened his lead. He had about a one-point lead the last time we talked. Now we're looking at two and a half, maybe even more. And that's interesting for us because this is a relatively large area. This has the cities of Dover and Portsmouth. These are areas where they're semi-urban and they're places where there are a lot of voters, which means that this is a place where Buttigieg can maybe help start even the score, uh, places where Bernie Sanders maybe isn't doing quite so hot. Now, let's look at some of the other big population centers. Manchester is relatively important for us. We've got 52% uh, reporting here in Hillsborough County. Bernie Sanders pretty much running away with it here, 27% of the vote. Uh, Pete Buttigieg a distant second with 23%. So now for a little more insight into what these raw vote totals are showing us, let's talk to our data scientist, Lenny Bronner. Lenny, what have you been seeing inside these vote totals? What do you see that could help us make some more sense of this? Yeah, Jeremy, so when I talked to you last, I said that the race seemed a little bit closer than the raw vote totals seemed to suggest and that doesn't seem to be the case anymore. It now looks like these Bravo totals basically project outwards for the rest of the night. That being said, you know, there is a lot of uncertainty. And as I mentioned previously, there was this weird distinct surge that Pete Buttigieg might, um, that might happen to him. And that is still a possibility, but it does seem a lot less likely. The main thing that sort of changed between my last update and what I can tell you now is that it seems that Bernie Sanders is holding on to more of his voters than I initially thought. Initially, I thought he was holding on to between 30 and 40 percent of his voters, but it seems more likely that he's holding on to between 50 and 60 percent of his 2016 voters. Um, exit polls seem to say put the number at around 62 percent. I think my model is putting that number at around 55 percent. When in doubt, I would you know trust the exit polls more than my model. Um, but the numbers are seeming to, seemingly um, to converge at the moment. That seems like the kind of thing a data scientist would, in fact, say. Now, do you have any insight about those candidates who are underperforming a little bit tonight? Maybe something on Elizabeth Warren or Joe Biden. Are there places where the model shows that they have room to improve, or does it really look like they're basically going to be uh, riding at about the same spot? Yeah, so it basically thinks that the, that they're going to be doing as well as they are now. I mean, like extrapolating forward, you know, another 50% of the vote coming in. Um, that being said, it does the model does think at the moment that Elizabeth Warren is going to do a bit better than Bernie Sa uh, than sorry than uh, than Joe Biden, um, but it is sort of a close match for fourth between the two of them. Um, what's interesting, what I've sort of seen is that Joe Biden seems to be holding on to like getting 10% or so of uh, Hillary Clinton votes from uh, 2016, and that's a lot lower than I than I first thought. Um, if you look at sort of what happened to, in Iowa, he was getting maybe 15, maybe 20 percent possibly of her vote. And it seems that that's gone down even further. That's fascinating. And we're going to have more of those insights for you throughout the night. As soon as we get results, we'll bring them to you. Until then, we're going to send it to Jorge in New Hampshire. Hey, how are you doing? So I'm here with Nick Scalera. Nick has been volunteering for Buttigieg for, you said, about a year now. Close Can you talk a little about what the last couple of days have been here? And you're from Nashua. So let's talk a little bit about what it was like for you um, in your hometown and, and, and around New Hampshire um, campaigning for, for Pete. I mean, it's amazing. The atmosphere and the community all around it is just so spectacular. There's really no words to describe it. Uh, this past weekend, I've been knocking on doors around Nashua, uh, going around asking people, one, if they're just going to vote, and two, who they're going to be voting for. And it's been so positive. People are just so excited that there's going to be a change coming, whether that be Pete or someone else. Obviously, I hope it's Pete. But there's change coming, and we're excited for it. So let me ask you, having been with, uh, with the campaign for a year, what has the mood been like changing-wise since the early days compared to what it's like now? And, and also, like, as you were out talking to people, were there other candidates that people were bringing up? And, you know, obviously you're, you're campaigning for Pete, but what, who other names did you people talk to you about? I mean, yeah, I mean, we started off a very underdog story uh, coming up with nearly no national recognition. And now today we're in second place in New Hampshire where we won Iowa. It's just, it's very fulfilling to see where we've come and very energized to see where we go. Um, here and around the area, a lot of people have been very, as we're seeing right now, a lot of people are down between Pete and Bernie, uh, kind of like the more progressive and more moderate approaches, and people are starting to see their favorites. And I think it's going to be exciting to see where tonight ends up, going from Iowa to here. Okay. Okay. Well, thanks, Nick. Uh, former Vice President Joe Biden is about to speak right now, so we're going to go to him. I hope you love me as much as I love you guys. <laughs> I've been coming here a long time. When I die, I want to be reborn in Charleston, actually. I like the low country, you know what I mean? <laughs> Look, uh, I hope, uh, I, thank you. Please sit down if you have a seat. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I am, uh, I'm Jill Biden's husband, and I work for Cedric Richmond. 
and David Mack is taking me to school. <laughs> well, look, I know some of the other senators came over. They came up to see me. They're in session right now, and I uh, thank them for making the effort. There's so many people here for me to say thank you, thank you, thank you. So I just spoke to our folks up in, uh, up in uh, uh, New Hampshire, and uh, they did a good job. But I want to tell you, the people of Nevada are watching, and uh, I want to make it clear we praise their diversity as a state, and I'm going to be out there seeing them very soon. Tonight, though, I, we just heard from the first two of the 50 states. Two of them, not the whole nation, not half the nation, not a quarter of the nation, not 10 percent, two. Two. Now, where I come from, that's the opening bell. Not the closing bell. And uh, the fight to end Donald Trump's presidency is just beginning. Just beginning. Thank you. It is important that Iowa and Nevada have spoken, but look, we need to hear from Nevada and South Carolina and Super Tuesday states and beyond. And look, we're moving in an especially important phase. Because up till now, we haven't heard from the most committed constituency of the Democratic Party, the African-American community. And the, fast, and the fastest growing segment of society, the Latino community. I want you all to think of a number, 99.9%. .9%. That's the percentage of African-American voters who have not yet had a chance to vote in America. One more number. 99.8. That's the percent of Latino voters who haven't had a chance to vote. <laughs> so when you hear all these pundits and experts, uh, cable TV talkers talked about the race, uh, tell them, it ain't over, man. We're just getting started. Our votes count, too. <laughs> We're not going to let anyone take this election away from you. Look, I've said many times, you can't be the Democratic nominee and you can't win a general election as Democrat unless you have overwhelming support from black and brown voters. It's just really simple. No, it's a natural fact. It's true. It's absolutely true. And folks, you know, all those Democrats who won uh, against incumbents, uh, from Jimmy Carter to a guy named Clinton, to a guy named Obama, my good friend, guess what? They had overwhelming African-American support. Without it, nobody's ever won. No, really. And you all know you own my heart. <laughs> Look, more important, should you not win the Democratic nomination for president, you shouldn't be able to win it without black and brown voters. Yes. Too often, your loyalty, your support, your commitment to this party have been taken for granted. I have never once in my career since I got involved as a kid taken it for granted. And I give you my word as a Biden, I never, ever, ever will. Now, if you want to know what any other candidates are going to do in the future, the tendency is to look at the past. Well, I left a law firm when I was a kid with a great job in a fancy law firm that, that, uh, that to become a public defender, to fight for the people in the community I used to work in, in the East Side, because they couldn't afford a lawyer. On the county council, I fought against redlining. In the U.S. Senate, I passed the extension of the Voting Rights Act for two decades, the Violence Against Women Act. And by the way, I had the back of a great president named Barack Obama for eight years. And by the way, we increased access to capital for African-American entrepreneurs. Let's get something straight. Give it a chance. They do just as well as anybody else, and quite frankly, better. And they build neighborhoods. They build all communities. Rock and I were able to reduce the federal population. And speaking of HBCUs, I got $70 billion coming to HBCUs. Not a joke. The minority universities, look. We saved the automobile industry. We passed Obamacare. We stopped insurance companies from discriminating against people with pre-existing conditions. And on top of all of that, we built an economy that Trump is bragging about. Yeah. This guy squandered his father's fortune. Now he's squandering the economy we gave him. They all think I'm kidding. I'm not. <laughs> so, Mr. President, Instead of talking about impeaching Barack Obama, <laughs> you should be saying, thank you, President Obama. Thank you, thank you, thank you. But folks, look, we have so much more to do. 
I promise you, as your president, you will be partners at shaping the policy to make sure every single American has an opportunity. The thing that I've never liked, and I was chairman of the Judiciary Committee for years, I don't know what you need best. I listen. You all, the leaders of the black community, know what you need best. We don't listen enough. We take for granted. You know what you need. You know what your families need. And I've never not listened to you. First, we need to defend and build on Obamacare. Trump wants to get rid of it. Even some of the folks in my own outfit in the primary want to take it away. But I'll never let that happen. Yeah. Folks, I was proud to serve as President Obama's vice president for eight years for the honor of my life. And he'd become a close personal friend the whole family has been. Matter of fact, our granddaughters and his daughters are best buddies. They went to school together for 12 years in the same small class, well, actually 10 years. But they're still hanging out with one another, even though they go to different schools. Where are you? I'm up in Michigan State. I'm up at the University of Michigan. What are you doing there? I came up to see my, you know. Anyway, <laughs> all I know is I get to pay for the plane ticket. Anyway. <laughs> but I was never prouder than the day that uh, we passed Obamacare. And here's what we're going to do. We're going to expand out. We're going to eliminate. We're going to get rid of all the executive orders that had curtailed it. We're going to increase funding into research for finding cures. Too many of our families are dealing with cancer, diabetes, yeah. African-Americans, maternal health disparities. Look at them. In the United States of America, today, today, there's an incredible disparity. It's, it's sinful. It's sinful. It's an indictment of the entire system. And by the way, you all know education is a great equalizer. We need to treat it that way. Every child has the same capacity when they're born. Every one of them have the same capacity. Every child has, deserves a great education, no matter what your zip code or your income level. And I put my money where my mouth is. We're going to triple Title I funding to give our teachers the pay raise they need, make sure every, every three. By the way, we're losing. We already are 115,000 teachers short. By 2025, you're going to be a quarter of a million short. And who's going to get shortchanged? The people that you darn right they are. And look, we're going to give every teacher a pay raise. And then that's we're going to continue the criminal justice reform that President Obama and I started. We're going to end all private prisons. And no more jail time for addiction. You go into mandatory treatment. Build more treatment facilities, not prison systems. And make sure marijuana convictions, their entire records expunged. So when asked by a job application, have you ever been arrested? You'll be able to say legally, no, I have not. Folks, folks, let's think about this. There's so much. And by the way, all these states that are out there legalizing marijuana and legalizing medical use of it, we should take a big chunk of those profits and put them into prison reform and treatment. Yeah. Treatment, treatment, treatment. Yeah. Look, and just as important, we have to be a country of second chances, for God's sake. No, think about it. We all talk about second chances. What do we do? Someone gets out of prison or gets out of a tough spot, and we say, you're denied all the things that can help you. From returning to your communities, we're going to give you 25 bucks and a bus ticket. You end up under a bridge. We need to eliminate all those barriers to success. We've got to make sure all the collateral consequences are eliminated. Look, people coming out of prison, people coming back from serving their time, people coming back out of recovery, they should be able to get Pell Grants. They should be able to get housing. They should be able to get all the things that give them a chance. And while they're there, we should be teaching them skills. It makes no sense. It makes no sense to keep it a penal system. Look, we're a great country, and we have great people. We have the greatest workers in the world. But you should be paid like we're the greatest workers in the world. The background I come from, not dissimilar, except it was he's in Louisiana, I was in Pennsylvania, in Scranton. We have too many families working their tails off just to make men's meet. Too many people I know did what my dad did, and you know him now here in South Carolina, who made what I call that longest walk up a short flight of stairs to tell their son or daughters, honey, sorry, we can't live here anymore. Daddy, mommy doesn't have a job. You're going to go home and live with grandpa for a while, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make it. We're going to be able to do it, and I'll come back, and I'll make sure when I'm able to get a place, 
will bring you all together again. People having trouble keeping the roofs over their heads. When my dad walked up those stairs, I remember in 2446 North Washington Avenue, I'm doing it in Scranton, I was in third grade. And he looked at me and he said, I promise you it's going to be all right. He believed it was. He believed it. And he was right, because then if you took a shot, you got a chance, you're able to do it. Today, think of all the people who can't look at their kids and say, it's going to do, we're going to be able to do it, because the deck is stacked the way it is today. I mean, it really genuinely is. We have two-thirds, we have over 50 percent of all the people who are working class or middle class think their children will never achieve the same standing they had. What a god-awful conflict, you know. It, 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 uh, just makes me mad. Look, we're going to invest in our families and our communities. We're going to invest in roads and bridges, broadband, water systems, school buildings, rural infrastructure. We're going to invest in Jim Clyburn's 10, 20, 30 plan to get finally to those areas that were been left behind, the bulk of what needs to be done. And by the way, I make no apology to anybody for it. It's in the interest of everybody the wealthy, the semi-wealthy, the middle class, the working class, that everybody does better. When they do, everything works for everybody. Yeah. Everything. We got to make sure black and brown families and businesses have the same sought to, to, to accumulate wealth. Look, folks, you live in a black neighborhood, you have the same exact house, the guy lives across the highway in a, in a white neighborhood. Same exact house, same condition. Yours is valued at less. You pay more for insurance. How do you get a chance to accumulate wealth? Well, I tell you what, that's not how you're going to fulfill the dreams. I really mean it. You know, we're not going to invest in six, these tax cuts for the wealthy and corporations. The system's already rigged in their favor. That $1.9 trillion that Trump gave away to the top 2%, we're going to invest in families instead. I really mean it. I've done it. There's no limit to what we can get done in the next four years. But first, we have to beat Donald Trump. Yeah. Folks, folks, I believe her. I said it when those folks came out of those fields carrying those torches. I never thought I'd see it. When those folks came out of those fields in Charlottesville. Close your eyes and know what you saw on television. and I will beat Donald Trump. My heart, my heart is full tonight. My heart is full tonight. While there are still ballots left to count, we have beaten the odds every step of the way. We have done it on the merits, we have done it with ideas, and we have done it with hard work. Because we are resilient and strong as the people of this great nation. Thank you to our incredible staff and our unstoppable volunteers. Uh, my wonderful husband, John, our daughter, Abigail, and the people of New Hampshire. Because of you, we are taking this campaign to Nevada. We are going to
to South Carolina. And we are taking this message of unity to the country. Because we know in our hearts that in a democracy, it is not about the loudest voice or the biggest bank account. It is about the best idea and about the person who can turn those ideas into action. We know that we cannot win big by trying to outdivide the divider in chief. We know that we win by bringing people with us instead of shutting them out. Donald Trump's worst nightmare is that the people in the middle, the people who have had enough of the name calling and the mud slinging yeah. have someone to vote for in November. I I cannot wait to bring our green bus around the country. Yeah. I I cannot wait to win the nomination. I cannot wait to build a movement and win with a movement of fired up Democrats, of independents and moderate Republicans that see this election as we do. We see it as an economic check on this president. We see it as a patriotism check. And we see it as a decency check. Because in the end, we know that what unites us is so much bigger than what divides us. And we know, we know that we believe, so many of us believe, that the heart of America is bigger than the heart of this guy in the White House. Tonight is about grit, and my story, like so many of yours, is one of resilience. I announced my candidacy in the middle of a Minnesota blizzard, and there were a lot of people that predicted I wouldn't even get through that speech, but not the people of my state and not the people of New Hampshire, except then they predicted that we wouldn't make it through the summer. We did. Then they predicted we wouldn't make it to the debates. And man, were we at the debate in New Hampshire. <laughs> what we've been is steady, we've been strong, and we've never quit. I think that sounds pretty good for a president. But across, across the months and months and miles of this race, we redefined the word grit. You see it with our happy, scrappy campaign. You saw it, you saw it in our 10 county, 30 hour tour in the middle of a nor'easter. Let's not forget that. You saw it in our early morning diner stops and our late night rallies. And yes, you saw it on that debate stage. Just like so many of you out there, I know a little bit about resilience. My grandpa worked 1,500 feet underground in the mines in northern Minnesota. He never graduated from high school because his parents were sick. He had nine brothers and sisters, and he had to help raise them. And every day he would go down in that cage in that mine carrying a lunch bucket that my grandma would pack. His youngest sister, Hannah, was only eight years old when they put her in an orphanage, and he vowed after his parents died that he would go and get her. And two years later, he borrowed a car, he went to Duluth, and he brought her home. He, he and my grandma saved money in a coffee can in their basement to send my dad to a two-year community college. My dad then became a newspaper man. My mom, she was born in Milwaukee, the site of our next convention. And she came to Minnesota and taught second grade until she was 70 years old. And I still meet people that say she was their favorite teacher. 
So I stand before you today as a granddaughter of an iron ore miner, as a daughter of a teacher and a newspaper man, as the first woman elected to the U.S. Senate from the state of Minnesota, and a, and a candidate for president of the United States. because we live in a country of shared dreams, that no matter where you come from, no matter who you know, no matter the color of your skin, no matter where you worship, no matter who you love, that you can make it in the United States of America. I, I didn't have a perfect life. My dad struggled with alcoholism his whole life, and by the time John and I got married, he got his third DWI. And then the judge said to him, you got to decide, jail or treatment? And he chose treatment. And in his words, he was pursued by grace. I believe that everyone in this country should have that opportunity to be pursued by grace. When Abigail was born, we thought it was going to be this perfect thing, but she was really sick and she couldn't swallow and she was in intensive care. And back then, the insurance companies had a rule and they kicked me out of the hospital, even though she was in intensive care in 24 hours. And a few months later, I went to the legislature, worked with a number of legislators, and we passed one of the first laws in the country guaranteeing new moms and their babies a 48-hour hospital stay. <laughs> That's how I do my work. <laughs> and as my friend Elizabeth noted earlier tonight, people told me, just like they told her, that they didn't think a woman could be elected. In my case, it was elected to the US Senate. No woman had ever done it before. But I came back, I defied expectations, and I won. And I have done it. And I have done it over and over again in the reddest of red districts and the bluest of blue districts. And when I got to the US Senate, people told me, oh, it's so hard to get things done. Well, in that gridlock of Washington, DC, I have passed over 100 bills as a lead Democrat. Because I did not give up. And tonight in New Hampshire, as everyone had counted us out, even a week ago, Thank you, pundits. <laughs> I came back and we delivered. We have been on quite a journey together, and you've learned this about me. I never give up. But my story is nothing compared to the resilience that I've seen all over this country. The mom in California her lost, who lost her child to gun violence. And even through her grief and heartbreak, she has joined the fight to keep our children safe. The immigrant who works two jobs and still struggles to put food on the table, but is determined to raise her kids in America so that they have a better future. The farmer who's facing bankruptcy because of bad Trump policies, but persists in working the land, just like his parents and his grandparents before him. America deserves a president who doesn't give up or give in just because a decision is hard. America deserves a president who is as resilient as her people. <laughs> America deserves a president who's going to take on the challenges of our time, climate change and affordable education and college, yeah. immigration reform, justice and democracy, and yes, bringing down the cost of health care. Our country cannot take another four years of Donald Trump. The rule, the rule of law can't withstand another four years of a president who thinks that he is above it. Our collective sense of decency can't handle another four years of a president who doesn't care about it. 
Our democracy can't tolerate another four years of a president who wants to bulldoze right through it. And our American dream cannot tolerate a president that thinks he can choose who lives it. He, the president, might as, as, might as well have a sign on his desk that says, the buck stops anywhere but here. <laughs> he literally, he blames everyone. He blames, think about this, for anything that goes wrong. He blames Barack Obama. He blames the city of Baltimore. He blames the head of the Federal Reserve that he appointed. He blames the energy secretary that he nominated. He blames the city of Baltimore. He blames the entire kingdom of Denmark. Who does that? And my favorite recent one, he blames the prime minister of Canada for cutting him out of the Canadian version of Home Alone 2. That's what this guy does. That is Donald Trump. I think we can do better because for the people of this country, when things go wrong, they don't have anyone to blame. They just have to pick themselves up. And I can promise you this, when I am behind that desk, I will take responsibility instead of passing it on. I will reach across the aisle and work with Americans in good faith instead of picking fights. I will bring this country together instead of tearing it apart. Some of you have heard the story about Franklin Delano Roosevelt. So he was beloved, and when he died, they put his body on a train, and it went through the countryside to Washington, D.C. And people would spontaneously stand next to those rail tracks to show their respects. And the story goes that one guy was standing there sobbing. Regular guy had his hat across his chest, and this reporter says to him, sir, did you know President Roosevelt? Do you mind me asking, did you know him? And the guy says, no, I didn't know President Roosevelt, but he knew me. He knew me. That is what's lacking right now in the White House. That empathy, that ability of a president to put himself or herself in the shoes of the people of this country. What is lacking is that sacred trust between the people of this nation and the President of the United States. And my friends, I will restore that trust. If you are having trouble deciding between filling a prescription or filling your refrigerator with food, I know you and I will fight for you. If you cannot decide how you're gonna stretch that paycheck to pay for your rent or pay your mortgage, I know you and I will fight for you. And if you are having trouble deciding how you're gonna pay for the child care for your kids and the long-term care for your parents, I know you and I will fight for you. If you want, if you want, a Democratic nominee who can make our tent bigger, who can make our coalition wider and our coattails longer. I know you and I will fight for you. And if you feel stuck in the extremes of our politics and you are tired of the noise and the nonsense, you have a home with me. If you want a nominee who can stand up to Donald Trump on that debate stage, which you well know I can do. I need your votes, yes. And I'm going to need those votes of the people in Nevada, yes. And I'm going to need the votes in South Carolina and beyond. But most of all, I need your hearts. I don't have that big bank account. I don't have that big name as some of the other people uh, that are in this race. And I am not a newcomer with no political record. But what I do is get things done. What I have is your back. So I ask you to join us at amyklobuchar.com. Join our campaign. Join our campaign. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, New Hampshire.
culture. We are on to Nevada because the best is yet to come. Now, I want to thank a few people before we start the music and everything. <laughs> Uh, who have been here with me in New Hampshire uh, from the very beginning. And I am so proud uh, to have their help and support. It has meant the world. Uh, first of all, my great state director, Scott Merrick. Right over here. And my campaign manager and our team, Justin Bowen. So we've just heard from Senator Klobuchar, who is giving somewhat of a victory speech. This room is electric right now. I've covered several election watch parties, and I can tell you this one has a lot of enthusiasm. The people here really are supportive of this candidate, and perhaps surprised because she was not supposed to make it this far. In fact, one of the key words she kept saying in this speech right now is resilience, that she had resilience, that that snowstorm announcement when she declared her candidacy, she wasn't expected to go, you know, months after that. And she outlasted a lot of big names. She outlasted uh, her colleague, Senator Cory Booker, uh, Senator Kamala Harris, and others. And so right now, she's really taking this all in, that she had a pretty big victory tonight. And if we can take a look at the current standings right now, she's in, in the number three spot. She has beat out uh, Joe Biden. She has beat out uh, Elizabeth Warren in this state, and now is just under uh, Sanders and and Pete Buttigieg. So this really was is an interesting night to watch for Senator Klobuchar. She's also mentioned her very first sentence was, I'm Amy Klobuchar and I will beat Donald Trump. And what that is, what that says to the people in this room is that electability question. That's what we've been hearing from voters about their number one concern is who can beat Trump. And that is exactly what she addressed in her first line right now. So uh, right now I'm going to send things uh, to Libby, who uh, is there in Manchester. Libby? Great, thank you so much, Rhonda. Appreciate that. I'm with Amber Phillips and James Homan. So notice that Amy Klobuchar has that uh, right on the top of her screen. Text the number. So Amy Klobuchar uh, making a pitch to voters, not just in New Hampshire, of course, but elsewhere. James, a lot of her speech, if you've been listening to her, were so familiar with this narrative, the story. It was nothing new. But as she started out, as Rhonda said, you know, hello, America. I am Amy Klobuchar. Amber, this is like a chance for her to introduce herself to the wider electorate. Yeah, she's been on the debate stage a couple times. When fundraising or not meeting the donor threshold. Um, but she is really solidly second, maybe even sometimes third tier candidate, I'd describe her. And tonight is a moment where Amy Klobuchar, the senator from Minnesota, who is not really a national figure, just beat, most likely, based on the results we're seeing, Joe Biden and Elizabeth Warren. That's, that's huge for her. Let's go to Jeremy Bowers with some more of our latest results. Jeremy. Hey, thanks a lot, Libby. You know, that's not too far out of the scope to say that Amy Klobuchar is really overperforming, but I want to give you the high-level view of what's happening in New Hampshire tonight. And with about 66% of the vote in, what we're actually seeing right now is that Bernie Sanders is doing very well. He's dropped off a little bit from where we were the last time we talked. He was in the high 27% for the state. Now he's at about 26.5%. And he's in that purple color, remember. We've got Pete Buttigieg here in the green, Amy Klobuchar in indigo, and Elizabeth Warren in orange. Now, the numbers that we're really seeing that are interesting is this second place fight between Pete Buttigieg and Amy Klobuchar. Uh, a little bit from the map about how that's working. So what we're seeing is uh, this lead for Pete Buttigieg expanding in Rockingham County. And this is really interesting for us because he'd had a lead here earlier tonight, but that lead was at less than a point. And now it's stretched to a little bit more than two and a half points. That's a relatively large lead for him. And this is an area with a lot of voters. And this is gonna help him pick up slack throughout the evening. And it might be a place where he can help kind of stay away from Klobuchar. Now, Speaking of Klobuchar, let's take a look at some of the places where she's doing particularly well. Um, I'd like to take a look here and take a look at Merrimack County. Now, Bernie Sanders and Pete Buttigieg, really close here. We're looking at Bernie Sanders with about 24.5%, Pete Buttigieg a little less than that, and here Amy Klobuchar is within 1% of Pete Buttigieg and within just 2% of Bernie Sanders. This is actually doing very well for her. She's well ahead of her polls that were coming in, and those results are things that she can be really proud of tonight. 
Now, for a little bit more inside those raw vote totals, we have standing by our data scientist on the Election Insights team, Lenny Bronner. Lenny, what do you see inside these numbers that are giving you uh, a little bit of something? What what interests you? In yeah, this? so I'm going to caveat this a little bit. We've been seeing the number of uh, precincts reporting sort of increase throughout the last couple of minutes, uh, the last 20 minutes or so. But unfortunately, I haven't been able to see the same thing happening on the townships reporting side, which is the, mo the data that I need to run my model. We've been stuck at around 55% reporting there for you know half an hour or so. So I don't really have you know fresh off the press uh, new predictions at the moment. But I will say what I do find interesting is sort of in this race for second place is sort of where Pete Buttigieg and Amy Klobuchar's voters are coming from. And it seems basically that uh, Pete Buttigieg is keeping a lot of uh, fewer Hillary Clinton voters than I first expected. And it seems that really Amy Klobuchar is doing ex exceedingly well with 2016 voters who voted for um, Hillary Clinton. That is fascinating. Now, with a little bit more on what that means for the candidates in the long run, let's talk to David Byler. David is a columnist in the Post Opinions Department, and he is also a data analyst. David, what are you seeing? Is there anything in this that uh, you feel like is a big takeaway for you tonight? Yeah, so the fight for second place that Lenny was talking about is actually bigger than one might expect. So I'm looking here at a survey from CNN and the University of New Hampshire, uh, and it asked New Hampshire voters who they believed would win sort of ahead of the, ahead of the primary. And Bernie Sanders ran away with it. I see 59% here and everybody else in the you know single digits almost with the exception of Buttigieg. So essentially what that means is that if you have a surging second place candidate, they can gain momentum heading into the next contest. We saw that in a way with Pete Buttigieg in Iowa. He sort of tied Bernie Sanders for first because there were different me metrics released. But if someone surges, that has downstream effects that can really make a difference in the race. And if Sanders wins but meets these sort of widely set expectations, then it may not benefit him as much as he hopes. It's kind of a, a weird process in that way. That is really fascinating. Now, it's important for us to remember that in 2016, Bernie Sanders won every single county in New Hampshire. And here we're seeing that Pete Buttigieg has enough support in places like Rockingham County and other places that are maybe a little bit smaller but still have reasonable amount of support for him. Carroll County, he's running ahead of Sanders. But look here, Sanders isn't even in second place. He's in third place behind Amy Klobuchar. Now, some of these areas are really small and by themselves, they don't make a huge difference. But what they do is they show us a lot about a pattern of voting. And what we're seeing is that P Bernie Sanders has an expansive uh, number of voters. So he's uh, everywhere across the state. He's doing reasonably well in rural areas. He's doing reasonably well in the suburbs. He's doing reasonably well inside the cities as well. It's that other, those other two candidates, the Pete Buttigieg and Amy Klobuchar, who are really splitting up that central Hillary Clinton vote. And we see that they're doing particularly well in certain areas. Pete Buttigieg in places like this in Carroll County, uh, and again, Rockingham. And then we're seeing Amy Klobuchar doing really well in these townships that are right outside of cities. She has a smaller number of townships that she's doing particularly well in, but that's good enough for us. Now, the last thing I'd like to point out, we're at about 67 and a half, maybe a little bit higher than that percentage reporting. We're running about 10% behind what we would have expected based on the 2016, the 2012, and the 2008 uh, primary numbers. And so it's important to remember that we're just because we're a little bit behind, it means that we won't have quite as much vote information to give you, and we have a little less certainty when it comes to our model. Uh, until then, we're going to pass it back to Joyce in New Hampshire. Hey, Jeremy, we are back at the Bernie Sanders watch party where the crowd has really started filling out. I'm joined by Desmond uh, Cadigan, a volunteer from New York, actually. Um, Desmond, what makes someone give up a couple weeks of their life to come out on the trail for a candidate that they, that they believe in? I really think it's passion. It's really, it's a crazy kind of passion where if somebody really believes that they can help change the world, then they... They will sacrifice a lot of things in order to make that happen. What do you think about what's happening here tonight with this big showing of a crowd and the numbers that are slowly start, slowly starting to come in? I think that the energy is palpable in here. Everybody's excited about Bernie. We've worked so hard. We've frozen you know, our butts off, literally, uh, knocking on, I think, like the majority of doors in New Hampshire. I, I don't know the stats exactly, but we worked really hard here. and. I think that I think that we're feeling pretty good. You know, we're still. I'm still personally cautiously optimistic, but I feel really good. I was standing at the polls at the precincts most of the day, 
And uh, I, just the feedback, you can feel it, you know, if you're any kind of a sensitive person. What is your story to, to supporting Bernie Sanders? You said you supported him in 2016, and obviously you're out here tonight for him. What was the starting point in all of that? I mean, he just has always spoken to me. I always thought I was like, I'm, I grew up, I was born and raised in Canada, so... You know, I never thought that anything that he was proposing was that radical, actually. I always thought that it was just kind of common sense. It's like it's the government's job to make sure its people are taken care of and they're healthy and they're well-educated so that they can take care of themselves. And I never thought it was a radical idea. And so it just was a, a normal thing for me to support, I think. What has changed in your opinion and your observation from 2016 to 2020? Well, obviously, we're not running against Hillary Clinton, which I thought was a very divisive figure. I thought she ran a terrible campaign, and with the establishment, you know, Democrats really, like, forcing her down Democrats' throats, I thought that was just a recipe for, for disaster. And that's exactly what happened. And, you know, we know uh, all about the sort of games that the establishment Democrats play against a, a left candidate, like a progressive candidate like Bernie Sanders. And I don't think we're going to tolerate it this time. I know it's a completely different story. And I sometimes resent them making the comparison between 2016 and this one because there is no comparison. That was a different race. Hillary Clinton was a completely different sort of candidate. And now we're running against like the whole kind of spectrum of the De Democratic Party. So I don't think people should really base it on that alone. We were talking earlier about what you call the mythological black vote. Can you explain that a little bit? And what do you have to say about the black vote? I just, you know, I hear all that condescension that happens with candidates and with pundits, especially, you know, the black vote is this. But I know, I know you can't win a presidential election without the black vote. As minimal as it is, I know it's a powerful vote. And I know they see through BS really quickly. And I think that they will, uh, they will see through it this time and they'll vote in the right way. Do you think that Bernie Sanders can get the black vote? Absolutely, 100%. That the whole myth from last time, I thought it was exactly that. It was a myth. And I don't know anybody that didn't vote for Bernie Sanders in 2016, anybody black or any other ethnicity. You know, Bernie Sanders is a candidate that speaks to everyone, every human person. And so, yeah. I thought that was very condescending and also a little bit insulting, them taking for granted like our, our mentality, like we vote, we vote in a model, like we live in a bubble and we vote all at the same time. It was a bit insulting and I'm glad I'm not seeing too much of that happening, but I'm seeing a little bit of it happening. This is certainly a different race, like you said, than 2016. Thank you so much for chatting Thank with you. us. Thanks I really for appreciate me. it. Yeah, of course. All right. Um, I will send it back to you, Libby. Thanks so much, Joyce. Uh, we're going to look at the numbers and talk about these numbers a little bit that we're seeing so far. Now, we've heard tonight that Bernie Sanders is doing well, James, but there's really not that much of a difference between Bernie Sanders in first and Pete Buttigieg in second. I mean, when you look at just raw vote numbers, considering how many advantages Bernie Sanders came into this night with. Yeah, absolutely, Libby. It's sort of amazing, really, when you look at how close it is. They're only separated by 4,000 votes. Obviously, it's too close to call. Three in 10 votes are still out. And the story of the night really is the, the new fight between Buttigieg and Klobuchar for the moderate lane. I think Biden's performance tonight, Warren's performance tonight, pushed them out. You're going to see a lot more attacks from Klobuchar on Buttigieg over his lack of experience. Uh, and, and that is targeting the kind of college-educated, white, lib moderate to liberal voters who supported Hillary Clinton in 2016. Buttigieg and Klobuchar are now the main two competitors for the kind of the core of that Clinton vote. Yeah, and, you know, with those Sanders numbers, James and Libby, Libby I, I want to see how he explains this, because we talked about how well he did four years ago in New Hampshire. He cleaned up the state. I mean, one Democratic strategist uh, was pointing out to me that he won nearly all but a handful of the 220-some counties and municipalities here four years ago. I, how does he go forward and say, just trust me, guys, the rest of the nation is going to buy into what I am selling, that we need to do something big to defeat President Trump? 
when he has these numbers and, and showing that, you know, really home base for him is also torn between moderate lanes, Buttigieg and Klobuchar as well. I, I don't know how he explains that. So we're looking, of course, at a poor performance at this point by Elizabeth Warren and Joe Biden. Warren came out nice and early, James, as a way of sort of preempting any disappointment as the night went on, it certainly seemed. Joe Biden, out of the state in South Carolina, as we heard uh, the former vice president talk and address supporters in South Carolina, what were your thoughts? Yeah, Libby, it was sort of remarkable how kind of explicit he was in his, in his racial appeal to African-Americans, saying, I delivered for you. It was a very backward-looking speech. Here's what we did. Barack and I, he said repeatedly, and it's because for Biden, South Carolina is and always has been his firewall. Now, the question is, will it hold? Uh, it, it's not a sure thing that it will. The fact that he went there shows that he's kind of putting all of his chips on South Carolina, which would allow him to survive into Super Tuesday. If Biden is able to perform well in South Carolina, what it means is that the moderate vote is going to continue to be divided, which could be a lucky break for Mike Bloomberg, who's waiting in the wind. But also Bernie Sanders, who, even if he's not running up the totals he did last time, is still going to accumulate a lot of delegates tonight. Yeah. One number that came out today in a Quinnipiac University poll on Joe Biden that I think should make him very nervous is his support among black voters declining by 22 points since before the Iowa caucus. That's in a week. I I don't know what could be behind that. This is just one poll. But... But for Biden to go out and, and be in South Carolina tonight and say, essentially, trust me, guys, I represent the real Democratic Party, not this New Hampshire and Iowa older white voter coalition, is is not a sure thing, is my point with Biden. You know, someone else is trying to connect themselves to Barack Obama is Michael Bloomberg. We're seeing ads where he's connecting himself uh, to the former president. Uh, so uh, a lot of people are cognizant of looking at the past, even as they try to convince voters they are the past to the future. Let's head back to our hub in Washington and Jeremy Bowers of the Election Insight team. Jeremy. Hey, thanks a lot, Libby. You know, we've got some more results for you. So we're at about 70% reporting here tonight in New Hampshire. And this is a pretty big deal because we're seeing a little bit of tie between Sanders and Buttigieg. Those results are starting to tighten a little bit. And we're also seeing Amy Klobuchar continue on with that really strong surge of votes. And then we have a distant third place Elizabeth Warren. What you see here on the map is Sanders in purple owns several of the counties here. But the more important and more interesting thing isn't that. Sanders won every county in the state in 2016. What's an interesting sign of how tight this race has become is that Pete Buttigieg owns three of those counties, one of which is actually a relatively large population hub down in Rockington. So for a little bit more on what these numbers mean for the candidates, let's bring in David Byler. David is an opinion columnist for the Post Opinion and also a data analyst and a pretty swell fella. David, what do we see for these top three candidates tonight? It really looks like a three-person race right now. Thanks, Jeremy. Yes, it really does look like a three-person race. And with all the talk about Klobuchar's surge and Buttigieg's surprise win in Iowa, it's easy to forget that Bernie Sanders is actually in the lead. He's the one who's expected to win, according to pre-election polls and the results we've gotten so far. He's sort of the tortoise in this race, if you will. Other candidates have surged upwards, but he's kind of had his base that has stuck with him and stuck with him, and he's just barely started to inch up over the last month or so. Now, Sanders, uh, the media cycle has been his enemy a little bit. Um, Buttigieg was sort of declared winner because he won state delegate equivalents when it was more of a tie in Iowa. So he's hoping to get some momentum off of this. Buttigieg is showing in this election that he can still hang with his demographic. Uh, He does very well with older voters usually, with white voters. Uh, States like this are good for him. So he's hanging well with that. And Klobuchar is becoming quickly the story of the evening. She's the one that's hardest to project out what this means for her because her coalition to start out with is not super broad. She was making sort of an early stand in Iowa and an early stand in New Hampshire. And if she gets a bump in the next few days, We don't actually know with whom that bump will come. So that's our three big candidates. Again, Bernie Sanders with about 27% of the vote, Pete Buttigieg with about 24, and Amy Klobuchar at about 20. Now, there are some other interesting stories in the night that I'd like to make sure we get to talk about. First, let's start with Joe Biden. This has been a rough night for the Biden campaign. They're not even in New Hampshire right now. They're in South Carolina. They're looking ahead. What does tonight mean if Joe's numbers continue the same way right now that they continue through the rest of the night? Right. So Biden, for weeks now, has been setting 
high expectations, lower and lower and lower in Iowa and New Hampshire, has been trying to sort of tamp it down. Even in the last debate, he sort of started out, his opening salvo was about, I didn't do well in Iowa, and it doesn't look like I'm going to do well in New Hampshire. But it's pretty hard to spin 8.5%. Um, this is, it's, it's hard to think of a way in which this is a great or excellent night for Biden. Now, we'll have to wait and see. It's possible he has more resilience in South Carolina than most think. But we have seen a drop off in the last few national polls. He's been losing steam there, right as Michael Bloomberg has increased his standing. So, so far over the course of the last week or so, it's been pretty bearish indicators for Biden, though he's still in the race. Now, let's talk about somebody else who had really interesting poll numbers coming into tonight and was really expected to do well and maybe doesn't have that much of a path forward. Joe Biden at least has South Carolina and Nevada to talk about, where there are non-white voters that he does particularly well with. Elizabeth Warren, this is her area. These are the her people. This is where she should be doing well. And with 9.3% of the vote and just 18,000 votes, she's well behind our three front runners. What does this mean for the Warren campaign going forward? Yeah, Warren was sounding optimistic in her speech earlier tonight, was saying we're going to move on, so on and so forth. But like you said, it's hard to figure out exactly where she goes from here. New Hampshire is supposed to be a state that's sort of tailor-made for her. Uh, it's hard to think of exactly how she comes back in Nevada and South Carolina. Um, she's sort of a consensus candidate who's not building a consensus right now. And that's a high risk, high reward strategy. It's high reward if you actually bring the party together and get it unified fast, like some candidates do. But it's high risk in scenarios like this, where you can't become the second choice of a large number of voters, and you aren't the first choice for enough of them. And you post a disappointing showing that's going to make your donors and some of your voters unhappy. Well, you know, I'm going to kick it back out to the map one more time. Just want to show you where we are with 72.3% of the vote in. We're showing Sanders with a relatively commanding lead. Pete Buttigieg closing that gap behind. Amy Klobuchar doing really well. And Elizabeth Warren a distant fourth. With that, we're going to toss to Jorge in New Hampshire. Jorge, to you. Hey, how are you doing? So we're here, and as you can see, it's getting super loud. Uh, the crowd behind us chanting, President Pete and right now just waving their banners up in the air. I'm joined right now with Frankie Straccia, who's a resident of Amherst, New Hampshire. And Frankie, off camera, you were talking to me about how you'd seen virtually every major candidate through this election. That's and so correct. I'm wondering, having seen all these candidates, what got you on board with uh, Buttigieg? So I, I support Pete for two main reasons. One is that he's got the best breadth of experience of the major candidates. He's been in the private sector, he's been in government, he's been in the military, and he understands something about the world outside of America. I'm watching the documentary on Vietnam, and President Johnson admits that he did not understand how people from other countries think. And when once you become president, it doesn't matter how much you know about your home state and the Senate, you have to know, understand the whole country, and you have to understand the world. And I think Pete d exemplifies that. Having, having seen other candidates, you know, one of the criticisms of uh, Buttigieg is that he doesn't have experience. That, that's one of the things that Biden went after him quite strongly about. And you're saying that, no, that, that having experience is beyond having experience in Washington. Exactly. He's got a different range of experience. And I'd like to say Biden's, you know, not one to talk because he was eight years younger than Pete when he first became a senator. And let me ask you, you know, tonight, he, he's right now he's in second place behind Bernie. Yes. Um, are there any surprises for you in terms of how he's doing, how Amy Klobuchar is doing? Is there anyone that you're looking at being like, well, I, I didn't think that person would be doing as well or as poorly as they are tonight? I think for me, the two surprises, and by the way, Amy's my second choice. Amy's doing much better than I expected, and Biden's doing much worse than I expected. Now, Elizabeth Warren from nearby Massachusetts, you know, she put a lot of money, a lot of effort into her time here. You had said you'd seen her yes. maybe once or twice. Once. Um, are you surprised at how she fared tonight as well? No, because I think what's happened with Elizabeth is that I feel like she stopped answering questions and every and just sort of had these talking points. She started sounding like a, a tape loop. And I think people just got tired of that. Whereas Pete actually answers the questions. And I don't know if you've noticed, it's almost like 
He pauses before he answers, which indicates he listened to the person. He's thinking about the answer, whereas it didn't sound like Elizabeth was listening to the person. You don't want a president who doesn't listen to people. We have one like that right now. We don't want another president that doesn't listen to people. That's actually something that I'm talking to voters at different events said a lot, that even if they weren't on the Buttigieg bandwagon yet, they did appreciate his uh, pragmatism, how he was calm when he answered questions. Yes. Now, I had some people that tell me that, that, and I don't know if this is your case or maybe in your social circle, people who, who like Bernie Sanders but were afraid that he would push away too many moderates. In, in people you talk to and your friends, your neighbors, what, do you have people like that that maybe voted for him in 2016 but are, are looking at Buttigieg now as someone who's more electable? Well, actually, no. I'll, I'll be honest with you. A lot of my friends are Republicans, and my best friend's a Bernie supporter, okay. as is her husband. So I, I can't answer that question. That's not been my experience. Okay. Yeah. Well, Frankie, thanks a lot for talking with us. Okay. And Libby, I'll toss back to you in Manchester. Great. Thank you so much, Jorge. Uh, so you can see there where things stand. James, put this in perspective for us, though. We're still waiting for votes to come in here tonight. Yeah, absolutely. You know, Bernie Sanders got 60 percent of the vote in 2016 against Hillary Clinton. And, you know, obviously the, the moderates are splintered. And we've talked about why that's such a huge issue and, and why it does matter. But if you kind of add together the moderates in this race, you know, they're, they're, it's more than 50 percent of people who are kind of unabashedly moderates. And Buttigieg is an interesting figure here. We haven't heard from him yet tonight. When he got into the race a year ago, obviously he was an unknown, had finished third in the race for DNC chair, the Democratic National Committee chair last year. He initially positioned himself in the liberal lane. Uh, you know, he endorsed Medicare for all. He was kind of out there. He was talking about making the Supreme Court 15 seats. He was playing footsie with reparations. He was sort of trying to play to the Bernie side of the party. He had famously won an award for writing an essay about how Bernie Sanders was a profile in courage. And then when that lane got crowded with Kamala Harris and others, Elizabeth Warren, who were trying to go for the Bernie Sanders supporters, he sort of drifted toward the moderate lane. And it has been kind of an, an obvious, massive success. Mm. Uh, and he's, he, he's maintained, I think, some of the liberals that he initially appealed to a year ago, but he also is now sort of perceived as this reasonable, moderate candidate uh, because that's that's the tone that he's taken. I want to put a uh, reasonable, moderate candidate, though, in, in quote you. marks yeah. because of this primary we're in. Right. And, and just take a pause and look how remarkably left it I'm is. I'm so glad you say that, yeah. Buttigieg will come on the debate stage, he said this before, and said, listen, I would be the most progressive president ever elected just based on like a couple of my baseline issues that allow me entrance into the, today's Democratic Party. Klobuchar's campaign was saying the same thing to me when I asked them, well, you know, how do you like try to bridge the Bernie Sanders people? And they said, listen, we're progressive too. Um, and I, that's when, as this fight continues and, and if it becomes something that's like Sanders versus one or two of the Warren, or the, excuse me, the more progressive camp, uh, sorry, Sanders versus one or two of the more moderate camps, like that is a discussion and a fight that they're going to have to have. Can the moderates say to the Bernie Sanders people, listen, I'm still really, really progressive compared to, you know, 2008, even 2012. And that's what Elizabeth Warren was trying to do. So there was a she stopped at a yeah. diner yesterday and a woman said, I really I'm liberal, but I think we should support a moderate because I want to beat Trump. And Warren said, I am in the middle between Bernie on the one side and Klobuchar and Buttigieg on the other. But, it, you know, it's hard to be a consensus candidate if you don't if there's no consensus behind you. And that strategy obviously didn't work here. I think people at this point are seeing it as this binary choice, but you're absolutely right. Uh, Bernie, if he's going to win, is going to have to expand his coalition and he's going to have to bring in some people who don't support him right now. And likewise, someone like Klobuchar is going to have to convince liberals that she's uh, you know, with them on most of the issues. But I, Amber's so right mm -hmm. that if you look at Hillary Clinton's proposals in 2016 for government spending, for example, it's a tiny fraction of what every Democrat in this field is talking about. And it is a reminder of the, the party is much farther to the left. In some ways, it's Bernie Sanders' contribution legacy is that he sort of moved what social scientists call the Overton window of the debate, that now it's sort of a given that we're going to have universal health care, that we're going to have a $15 minimum wage. And so even if even as Sanders doesn't get those votes, he absolutely has pulled the party to the left. 
You see there we've got uh, updated numbers. Uh, let's compare this to four years ago and the, the fight in the Republican Party, okay? So, James, you, you made the important point to tally up these numbers here for the moderate-ish candidates yeah, exactly. that, that people have, have <laughs> voted for versus Bernie Sanders. Uh, but there was this question of like, okay, if you, know, if you take Bernie Sanders out of this, who stays strong? Talk to us about four years ago and this question of how other candidates pulled together the vote, but separate from that was Donald Trump. Now, I'm not trying to compare Bernie right. Sanders to Donald Trump, but there is this question of where they fall on the spectrum. And if all these candidates say, look, we've got a lot of support for a more moderate candidate, but who's, who's going to drop out? Who's going to clear the lane so it's a head-to-head, -head, a progressive versus one of these more moderate? And that's that's the kind of the collective action problem that mm -hmm. Democrats are facing. And it is, uh, you know, you hear from a lot of, of people who are sort of frustrated that Joe Biden denied some of these younger candidates the opportunity to shine this year because he crowded up the field and took up all the fundraising. Donald Trump's an interesting case because by this time, four years ago, here in New Hampshire, this was his first win. He finished second in Iowa, and he was sort of transcending ideological boundaries. You know, we, he wasn't kind of a traditional conservative. He was saying a lot of things that appealed to independents. And New uh, Hampshire, and, it's an, as we talked about, it's exactly. an important state to get those independents. And totally. And so he was able to, I think he got some, some kind of non-conservatives but he was also getting some ideologues. And Sanders isn't doing that right now. Sanders has a, a pretty limited base. I think there are some red flags for him in the exit polls and the numbers that suggest that he's not expanding the electorate uh, like he needs to do to be able to win the nomination. And, you know, a win is a win. Uh, if he wins, nothing's been called. But uh, but there are definitely, there. there's, it, I think it's a reminder that four years ago, uh, while the Republican race at that point was so fragmented, the Democratic race was a two-way race, and a lot of the people who voted for Bernie Sanders did so because they were really voting against Hillary Clinton. You know, that if, if there was some non-Clinton mm -hmm. candidate, that person would have gotten a lot of the votes that Sanders got, and, and people who were supporting him four years ago weren't kind of ideologically simpatico. Right. Yeah, just because Sanders comes out in the top two in these first top two states doesn't mean that he has a coalition. I, I just, I think we need to keep hammering home that point of how white these states are, how older these states are, um, you know, how much attention there are in these states, the media, you know, these voters take things seriously. We're going to get into like a much more diverse set of states in the next coming weeks. We're going to have 14 states on one day alone. Um, you know, Nevada, and which have caucuses where Sanders should shine because there's this organizing effort here. But I just don't think that Democrats have settled their head versus their heart debate you know, just because Sanders comes out on top in these two states, like those exit polling we saw of six and 10 Democratic voters say, I still want someone who can beat Trump. That's my top priority. And, and Sanders has uh, tried to make that point that he can beat Trump precisely for that reason. Just like when we heard from Amy Klobuchar, she said, I'm Amy Klobuchar, as you said, yeah. and I can beat Donald Trump. Some advantages, you know, I mentioned the red flags, but we should mention some advantages that Sanders does have which is he has a lot of credibility with organized labor. Mm -hmm. And Joe Biden had those relationships. I think a lot of unions would have endorsed some of the other candidates, but Biden, they didn't want to endorse Biden, but Biden froze the field. If Biden fades, mm -hmm. I think there are unions who might actually get behind Sanders. He, yeah. You know, he comes from the organized labor movement. That is huge in Nevada. The culinary workers, the most sought after union endorsement really that mm -hmm. there is, they, that could swing Nevada. They could decide to endorse if it's gonna be a close race. So he, that's something working for Sanders. What is the big wild card is, can he make inroads with non-white voters? He struggled so badly four years ago, but he spent all the time since trying really hard to, to court those communities of color. Yeah, uh, we talked a lot uh, in the media about how Buttigieg has you know, been polling loader, lower with non-white voters, specifically black voters. Sanders has kind of gotten a pass this time around. I feel like that's not something he's had to confront because it, it was an issue to the degree that it was discussed in 16. Um, one of the things that, that's coming up, you know, as we're trying to look forward mm -hmm. to the coming weeks is, you know, Booty Judge has gotten such a hard time, deservedly so, for just not having any, you know, real uh, resonance with the black community. But Amy Klobuchar has even less. Amy Klobuchar has none, you know, in, in every national poll. It doesn't mean it's not going to change. Uh, you know, four years ago, Bernie Sanders won by more than 20 points here, lost by like 40 points in South Carolina. Uh, Amy Klobuchar in a, that Quinnipiac poll that Amber mentioned a few minutes ago was at 0% among African-Americans. Buttigieg was at 5%, still 
not impressive. So I think there's, as we start to scrutinize Klobuchar more, because she's now really in the hunt, she got the bronze ticket out of New Hampshire, she's going to start to get questioned about her record as a district attorney, about her relationships with, with black voters, about her lack of African-American staff, uh, which Bernie does have. Those are all things that are, are going to confront her in the coming days and weeks. What did Bernie Sanders learn from 2016 when it comes to a state like South Carolina, even Nevada, and heading into Super Tuesday? That you, it's a, it, that you have to build relationships. Mm-hmm. I think he realized that he didn't try to court a lot of these people. Sanders is, is not a natural politician. He's, he actually doesn't really like people you know that really um you know he likes some you know he, like, he likes speaking to big crowds but he doesn't like kind of the, He's the more back ideas slapping than people yeah and, and the transactional nature of politics and and so i think he didn't go you know meet with the 10 state senators you have to meet with to be a credible contender and you know and kind of go campaign for them when they had races and that in hopes you know that he wasn't about chits and those kinds of things. That's changed. Mm-hmm, now mm-hmm, he is. Mm-hmm. Sanders you know, has had an active political operation. He's had people who have kind of done the things that a, a traditional, conventional politician is supposed to do. And he's gotten better at it. But he still doesn't enjoy doing it. You know, someone like Joe Biden loves that yeah. stuff. That's his favorite part of it, yeah. the game of it. Uh, Amy Klobuchar clearly enjoys the kind of backslapping nature of politics. Sanders, you know, I think is a, is a proud curmudgeon. Uh, and, and, and that's and part of his appeal to, to some of his supporters. His I, I think is. the question is, those lessons learned, though, h- how does he apply them and sort of and, and work them uh, in the next states heading forward? Let's go back to Jeremy Bowers for the latest numbers. Uh, we've got some results uh, still coming in. Jeremy. Yeah, absolutely, Libby. We actually have a race call tonight, which is so interesting for me to get to talk to you about. So let's take a look here at the map. We've got a race call, not in the Democratic primary that we've been watching all night, but in the Republican primary that is also happening at the exact same time here in New Hampshire. And it's not a surprise, but we are prepared to call this race for President Donald Trump. Now, the thing that you see on this board that might be a little bit interesting is that you see the president has 86% of the vote here, but we're seeing Bill Weld with about 8%, almost 9% of the vote. And the question that you might have is, is this normal for a president to have uh, a challenger with this much? Well, that may not be true in other states, but it's certainly true in New Hampshire. This is one of those places where an incumbent president can see 8, 9, almost 10% going to a challenger, and it's not essentially particularly meaningful because there's not going to to be a delegate for Bill Weld that comes out of this. Now let's get back to that Democratic primary that everyone is so interested in and take a little bit of a look at what's happening there. So the numbers aren't moving too much. We're at about 77% reporting. Remember, we've got Sanders in the purple, we've got Buttigieg in green, Amy Klobuchar here in indigo, and Elizabeth Warren in orange. The map looks about the same as the last time we talked, but some of these numbers are tightening. Bernie Sanders is now the front, still the front runner at about 26%, but we have Pete Buttigieg at a little over 24, Amy Klobuchar holding steady at number three there with 20% report or 20% of the vote, and Elizabeth Warren distant fourth, 9.3%. Now, one of the things that we see in this race is that Bernie Sanders that is only about a two-point margin over Pete Buttigieg. But we feel relatively confident in saying that he has a really strong lead. And for a little bit more on why we have some of that confidence, I'd like to bring it over here to Lenny Bronner. Lenny is a data scientist here on the Elections Insight team. Lenny, you've been running a model tonight that gives us an idea of where we think there are votes left for each of the candidates. And you've come to this conclusion that it looks like Bernie Sanders has a pretty strong chance to close out the night tonight. Why is that? Give me a little bit of insight from the model and what you're seeing. Yeah, so basically what we're seeing is that, you know, this 2% gap has persisted for a while now. It's closed a little bit, now it's opened up a little bit more. But basically, uh, Pete Buttigieg is running out of votes um, left to be counted. That means that it becomes, as this gap uh, persists, it just becomes more and more likely that Bernie Sanders is going to hold on. Uh, That being said, you know, the confidence intervals of those two of our two estimates for Pete Buttigieg and Bernie Sanders remain overlapping. So like in no way can we say that Bernie Sanders is definitely going to win this. But it just seems, you know, to become it seems that it's more likely than it was. That's right. Now, when Lenny is talking about confidence intervals, the thing that he is mentioning is that these are essentially like uh, multiple worlds, scenarios in which each of the candidates, uh, you know, perform in a particular way. And we run hundreds of them, thousands of them sometimes. And in some of those scenarios, Pete Buttigieg pulls ahead and beats Bernie Sanders. But in more of them, Bernie Sanders stays ahead. Now, that's the insight that we have for you here in the studio. As those votes come in, we'll continue keeping you up to date. Until then, we're going to kick it back to Libby in New Hampshire. Back to you, Libby. 
Thanks so much, Jeremy. Uh, let's talk about some of the people we haven't been talking about tonight. Tulsi Gabbard is someone who put a ton of effort into this state. Michael Bennett did as well. He has now dropped out. Andrew Yang, despite having some regrets about Iowa, uh, also put a lot of time and energy into the state. He has now dropped out. Um, let's talk about Tom Sawyer. Let's talk about Tulsi Gabbard. How have they uh, impacted the conversation coming into tonight? Uh, I, it's, it's a little difficult to say because yeah. they were like these such third tier candidates in in this race. I mean, Tulsi Gabbard and Andrew Yang have their niche support. And and I think they are niche candidates that that draw people to their charisma. And if Tulsi Gabbard, some of the more um, different foreign policy positions than the Democratic Party, um, especially the Middle East foreign policy, she tends to align herself with President Trump. I talked to a Republican leaning voter who said he's voting for Tulsi for that reason. Um, but they, they just like I have not seen any of them expand their base beyond these niche moments. I mean, Andrew Yang got a conversation started on a national level about universal basic income, right? Yeah. UBI, yeah. which is which is something I think significant in terms of like people now understanding and knowing what that is, and right. he did talk about uh, reparations and, and things like that. Yeah. Um, but what is your take on, on on some of these other peripheral candidates? I mean, we should say Joe Biden only got about ten thousand more votes than Tulsi Gabbard which is kind of a, a remarkable thing that the former vice president, I think Gabbard did get a lot of Republican votes. She's on Fox News all the time. She's uh, a, a you know very popular, uh, and, and she kind of terrifies establishment Democrats in a way, but they think that she could run as a third-party candidate. She made a comment at a town hall a couple days ago hinting that maybe she will. Uh, and, and so that I think she is kind of in some ways, as far as establishment Democrats are concerned, and frankly Sanders the Sanders campaign. She was the co-chair of Sanders' campaign in 2016. They see her, see her as a, a skunk at the garden party. Uh, you know, it is a, it is remarkable that Deval Patrick, there's so much dissatisfaction. People don't love the candidates. Um, at that state party dinner on Saturday night where all the candidates spoke, Deval Patrick's campaign actually paid for 800 tickets for spectators to sit. And they bust out people from Massachusetts to sort of a cheering section for Patrick. And he went after Bernie spoke. And Sanders kind of everyone stayed to see Sanders, including the Buddha judge and the Klobuchar and the Warren supporters. And as soon as Patrick started speaking, everyone filed out of the arena. But it was interesting because Patrick gave a pretty good speech, actually. He clearly had worked hard on it. And he was saying, you know, we need to reject false choices. And he sort of nodded to every campaign and tried to position himself as what Warren's trying to do. And there just no one was listening. And and he and, and part of that was he got in way too late. But to your question, he had no impact on on this race and and you know it, it's hard to see how he suddenly will have an impact in south carolina you know, i've got uh, ronda colvin standing by so let's head to ronda colvin uh, uh who is still at the klobuchar event ronda that's right. We're still here, although people are starting to leave. Amy Klobuchar has left. She stayed around and shook hands for a little bit to thank her supporters here in New Hampshire. I'm joined uh, by my uh, colleague, Jenna Johnson, who has been sitting here as well watching things. Jenna, what happens next here? You know, she spoke very confidently that she's going to take this to Nevada, take this to South Carolina and do well. But, you know, she does not have that same appeal that we are seeing uh, to minority voters. So what do you think she's going to have to do in those two states to kind of keep her momentum? Yeah, well, first of all, she has momentum right now. Um, this was a big night for her, um, really blowing past expectations. And this takes her from the lower tier um, into kind of that core group of candidates who are being considered. But the problem is, um, going forward, it's a lot of states are coming up very, very quickly. And she is going up against candidates who are polling better nationally, who have a finance. lot more money uh, and who have bigger organizations than she does. Um, you know, her staff is very confident about Nevada, uh, which will be having the caucuses there. Um, you know, but she hired her first staff there in late November. Other campaigns have been there for months. Um, you know, I mean, a big sign of um, where her head is at right now is her next big announced event is a big fundraiser tomorrow night in New York City. She needs to raise a lot of money really quickly um, and try to catch up um, so that she can contend with these other candidates in all of these states that we have coming up. So it's really face time with those voters and fundraising are her next steps. Jenna, thank you so much. We're going to go ahead and send things to Libby uh, and Manchester. 
Great. Thanks so much, Rhonda. So this question of money is a big one. And as you heard, Amy Klobuchar has got to hit it hard, James. She does. She has to raise a lot of money. She raised $3 million online. That's an impressive yeah. sum. She doesn't have a super PAC. She's competing against Mike Bloomberg in these Super Tuesday states. She's She can ride free media. She is you know very accessible. But that will only get you so far. You have to build an organization in these states. So the question is, will the money materialize? And you know, one of the, the things is, like the, when you're really ideological, Bernie Sanders and Elizabeth Warren have been able to raise so much money online because they really activate and fire people up. Klobuchar is a moderate. It's not a you know, it, it's harder to raise small dollars in large amounts from you know people who are kind of mild mannered and and talking about the need to to relax and calm things down. That doesn't play well online. Especially when you're like Bernie Sanders has this progressive lane and then she's competing with Buttigieg supporters. Um, you know, like he has been he has has his rise as this kind of star darling candidate among the Obama people who maybe didn't favor Biden or aren't, you know, don't like Warren or Bernie because they're too liberal. How does Klobuchar take those people and convince them to donate to her? I'm her well, what we, one of the big things is this question and who can beat Donald Trump. We just, right, I could throw a stone and hit the building right across the street. We saw Donald Trump speaking here last night in Manchester, you know, really trying to take the attention and, and say, all the all eyes are in New Hampshire. I will be in New Hampshire. And you know, I'm, I'm interested to hear wh what you guys think in terms of how effective that was for Trump, but also how effective it may have been for Democrats' messaging as they were here to say, Okay, I've got a foil. Let me tell you about how I'll beat Donald Trump rather than sort of the, the th throwing stones at each other, Amber. Yeah, Biden was really close to where Trump was. I got tra caught in traffic trying to go to his event, and, and Biden said, framed it as, look, Trump is in Manchester. I'm in Manchester. He's after me. He's scared of me. And that's when I saw Biden in particular. It was like he put on an old pair of jeans and get talking about the general election. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I want someone out of the White House who's going to be buddies with Vladimir Putin. He was yelling. His voice was booming. People were cheering. Uh, he tried to frame it as, as, like, Trump is here for me. Mm -hmm. I also heard people on the other end of this polling spectrum, like Michael Bennett, say similar stuff, like Trump is here trying to mess with us Democrats, trying to get us to divide each other. Um, it was a smart play on the president's part because it got them talking about it. And yesterday was the day the president released his budget. And so it, it did offer a good peg for a lot of people. You know, it's a yeah. Bernie Sanders at his rally that I saw, uh, you know, said that it's a statement of, of priorities. These are the president's priorities. These are my priorities. And, uh, and and so, you know, Trump is a helpful foil for everyone. I think they all kind of yesterday were content to attack Trump instead of each other on the eve of the primary. And so is someone like Amy Klobuchar or Pete Buttigieg able to make that appeal to the small dollar donors saying, I am the most likely candidate to beat Donald Trump? Yeah, and she can also, they can raise, they, they're, Amy Klobuchar is happy to take yeah. maximum contributions. Amy Klobuchar would love to raise the kind of money Buttigieg has raised. Despite her jabs at the wine cave. <laughs> exactly. uh, yeah, she, she I think Amy Klobuchar would love to have a, a fundraiser in that wine cave. You know, uh, <laughs> can I point out one interesting but kind of prickly question on electability yeah. is Amy Klobuchar's gender. Mm -hmm. And I point that out because studies and, and even polling bared this out in the very early beginning of the race that Democratic voters were skittish because Hillary Clinton lost. She talked a lot about how her gender was a part of that. Is another woman going to lose to President Trump, we nominated them. That was at the very beginning last summer of this race. I talked to Amy Klobuchar supporters who spent days and days and days and days knocking on doors all day long, and I said, did that question come up? They told me no, mm -hmm. that, that like gender has kind of faded from the background from their perspective. It, it's not something that makes Democrats skittish. I'm interested, to, you know, there's something I'm watching for as that plays out going forward because we don't have, in terms of race, a diverse top group of Democratic candidates, but there is diversity in other ways, gender, people to judge sexual orientation. It, you know, how does that work with the Democratic Party that still doesn't really know the sure way to beat Donald Trump and why they lost four years ago? We're seeing the latest numbers come in with 79.7% uh, of precincts reporting. You can see there how things are shaking up, uh, uh, shaping up rather. You know, the thing that is just so astounding, really, are those are those low numbers there for Elizabeth Warren and Joe Biden, James. Yeah, so neither Warren nor Biden is going to get anywhere close to 15 percent, which is what they need to to be viable to take any delegates away from New Hampshire. It really is devastating for Warren. I mean, it's it's just it's hard to see how she wins 
uh, a state. So there's more than 50 contests. You can have more than 1,100 field staffers. But what's the state she wins? What's the, you know, it, it, is it Massachusetts, uh, you know, on Super Tuesday? And that, I think, is a, is a big problem. And, and Biden, it, it, that African-American support we're going to have to watch, will that fire hall, firewall hold? I don't think it's a, it's a sure thing. The money, Biden also has a cash crunch. Biden's been canceling ad buys. Uh, he's relying on big dollar donors, but that money hasn't been materializing. And his campaign had been really concerned about money. Uh, so, so they can just like, you know, Kate, uh, Biden's deputy campaign manager said yesterday, this is like the World Series and New Hampshire's game two. Game two we're going right. to play through game seven. But at a certain point, if you're, you don't have a bullpen, uh, you can't make it. You can't force a game seven. I will mention we are watching uh, both the Sanders stage as well as the Buttigieg stage. It looks like uh, Pete Buttigieg will be coming out soon, and we'll bring that to you as soon as he uh, as soon as he does uh, take the stage uh, in front of his supporters. Uh, so, if you're these candidates like Elizabeth Warren, where are you putting your efforts right now? We already know that Joe Biden is sinking it all in the South Carolina. He's already there tonight. But if you are Elizabeth Warren, what are you looking at in terms of your calculation? You have to go to Nevada, and that is such a tall order for her for any candidate because Nevada is a caucus so it's like Iowa you have to have extreme organizing skills you have to have passionate people who are willing to pay for a babysitter to spend hours you know going to these caucus sites um, you know Nevada has had to switch up at the last minute how they're going to count these ballots based on what happened in Iowa that being said to put a point in Elizabeth Warren's column, early in the summer, we I met with Nevada Democratic officials and they were asked, well, who's already on the ground there? Warren is a name that kept popping up. But Warren is also someone who's extremely well organized in New Hampshire as well. That That's sort of her skill is getting volunteers in each precinct to be knocking on doors earliest point that they can. I'm, it, it, it comes down to Nevada for her. I. I I think I'm willing to say that at this point, she has to have a strong showing there. Yeah, I think that's right. You know, I think she they 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 want to play in South Carolina. Uh, she, you know, she's spent a lot of time there. Uh, her events in South Carolina have drawn mostly white crowds. Uh, she struggled. You know, she even had an event at a black church, kind of during the the post service thing. But it was an almost entirely white audience that showed up. Uh, so, you know, that's that's a it's a real challenge for Warren, too. So if you're Michael Bloomberg, you are watching all of this unfold. You are thinking about where you put your energy money, not so much of a concern for him. What do you what do you take away from this night? What do you what do you think about? Full steam ahead. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> for Michael Bloomberg, I think it, it um, completely rewrites how you campaign. Uh, you have a lot of money and money can build infrastructure. Uh, for him, whereas it used to be the other way around. You get infrastructure, you get people knocking on doors, you get support up, you get people to donate. Michael Bloomberg has been able to essentially use his money to buy ads and also set up infrastructure in these Super Tuesday states. And that's what I'm hearing very early on is that he's not just someone on TV, that he could be someone with an actual campaign infrastructure on Super Tuesday, which would be big for him. And he, he's going to continue to roll out endorsements tomorrow and beyond. Uh, I think, you know, he, after the Iowa chaos, he told his staff, double what I'm spending. Uh, he authorized them to double their ad buy and double the staff. They, you know, they're hiring up as fast as they can. He had a conference call yesterday with tech executives in Silicon Valley. He said, I don't want any of your money, but please recommend your best people. I'd love to hire your top analytics people to come work for me. So, you know, and for Bloomberg, that's all a drop in the bucket. You know, it's yeah. less than 1% of his net worth. He's going to be fine. Uh, and his play, he, I think, is going to be, if he's watching the results right now, he's going to be very happy that Klobuchar did as well as she did, mm -hmm. you know, and, and kept it close with Buttigieg mm -hmm. because that will prevent Buttigieg from sort of emerging as the anti Sanders stop Sanders candidate. Mm -hmm. The fact that they're only separated uh, Buttigieg and Klobuchar by 10,000 votes does mean that, uh, that Buttigieg isn't going to kind of be able to say, I'm the guy, get behind me. Klobuchar will also be going around saying that a divided field uh, is good for Mike Bloomberg. But we are going to have to have this conversation um, soon. Is the Democratic Party saying, let, you know, the people in D.C., the more moderate lane saying, let's stop Sanders. How do we do this? And let's talk about this idea of, like, stopping Sanders. And who is saying that? And there's so much pushback, obviously, from Sanders supporters and a lot of frustration. You know, don't, don't, don't orchestrate this. Don't engineer this, right? Didn't we learn something? four years ago, but let's talk about who has the concerns about Bernie Sanders. So the, um, 
the Jewish community very concerned about Sanders is Sanders is Jewish, but his record on uh, Israel and Palestine uh, that was a, a Jewish Democratic group spent seven hundred fifty thousand dollars on attack ads against Sanders in Iowa. Uh, that group. Uh, was not and we'll talk here. more about that in just a moment. I just want to mention Pete Buttigieg is coming out. We're also watching the Sanders stage, so we're going to keep our eye on, on all of this that's unfolding. Let's go now to uh, the Pete Buttigieg event here in New Hampshire. so much. One more time for our phenomenal New Hampshire State Co-Chairs. Thank you for your leadership and thank you for your commitment. Thank you to our extraordinary national co-chair, Congresswoman Annie Custer, who knows how to raise the roof and how to get out the vote. Thank you to Chaston, the love of my life, who keeps me grounded and makes me whole. I want to congratulate my competitors and their supporters on their campaigns here in New Hampshire. I admired Senator Sanders when I was a high school student. I respect him greatly to this day, and I congratulate him on his strong showing tonight. And I want to congratulate Senator Klobuchar, Senator Warren, Vice President Biden, and all of our Democratic candidates and supporters. And I know that we all share the spirit that we heard from some of our volunteers at a poll site earlier today who welcomed a competing candidate with chance of vote blue no matter who. We are on the same team. Now, over the past year, some two dozen campaigns have crisscrossed this state, each laying claim to the ability to bring people together, turn out the vote, and move Americans toward a brighter future. <laughs> that too. And here in a state that goes by the motto, live free or die, you made up your own minds. You asserted that famous independent streak. And thanks to you, a campaign that some said shouldn't be here at all has shown that we are here to stay. So many of you, so many of you turned out. Die-hard Democrats, independents unwilling to stay on the, side, on the sidelines, and even some newly former Republicans ready to vote for something new. Ready to vote for a politics defined by how many we call in instead of by who we push out. So many of you chose to meet a new era of challenge with a new generation of leadership. So many of you decided that a middle-class mayor and a veteran from the industrial Midwest was the right choice to take on this president, not in spite of that experience, but because of it.
Now our campaign moves on to Nevada, to South Carolina, to communities across our country. And we will welcome new allies to our movement at every step. We will go forward thanks to the work of our extraordinary team of staff and organizers and volunteers. I may be biased on this, but I'm also right. We have the finest team in politics today. You don't just represent me well, you inspire me. And I cannot say enough how thankful I am to our extraordinary team. <laughs> Thank you. And we know that team stretches across the country. We go forward fueled by hundreds of thousands of grassroots supporters from the woman in Minnesota who donated in honor of the wife she lost to lung cancer, to the veteran from Connecticut who sent $19.68 in honor of the year that he served in Vietnam. This campaign belongs to them. And if our campaign moves you, I hope you'll go to PeteForAmerica.com and chip in whatever you can. And we go forward knowing that this is our chance, our only chance, not just to end the era of Donald Trump, but to launch the era that we know must come next. Yeah. And the stakes, the stakes could not be higher. We cannot afford to miss the mark or to miss this moment. We must get this right. With Americans living under an unaccountable president, who will cut taxes for corporations and then cut Medicare, Medicaid, and Social Security for the rest of us, we must get this right. When people of color fear for their own place in their own country, while infants are torn from their parents at the border, we must get this right. And when a commander-in-chief pardons war criminals and punishes war heroes while systematically demolishing the credibility of our country in the eyes of the world, we dare not risk four more years of this presidency. We must get this right. clear-eyed about the challenge before us, and we must be equally clear about the choice at hand. My competitors and I share the same fundamental goals, bringing balance to our economy, guaranteeing health care to every American, combating a climate crisis and a rising tide of gun violence. But we do differ in what we believe it will take to make that happen. In this election season, we have been told by some that you must either be for a revolution or you are for the status quo. But where does that leave the rest of us? Most Americans don't see where they fit in that polarized vision. And we can't defeat the most divisive president in modern American history by tearing down anybody who doesn't agree with us 100% of the time.
Americans want the freedom to make choices for themselves on health care or on any other issue, not to have Washington decide for them. And a politics of my way or the highway is a road to reelecting Donald Trump. Vulnerable Americans do not have the luxury of pursuing ideological purity over an inclusive victory. We also, we know this. We also know better than to try to defeat such a disruptive president by relying on the same Washington framework and mindset. After all, if today's Washington were serving America well, a guy like Donald Trump would never have come within cheating distance of the Oval Office in the first place. So to win and to govern, we need to bring new voices to our capital. We need to get Washington starting to work more like our best-run cities and towns rather than the other way around. And I know that when you talk this way, you might get dismissed as a naive newcomer. But a fresh outlook is what makes new beginnings possible. It is how we build a new majority. And election after election has shown us that putting forward a new perspective is how Democrats win the White House, and we will win the White House. So as we take this campaign to the rest of the country, let's welcome that debate. Let's have that debate. Let's debate what the best way forward is, the best way to earn the White House, and the best way to unify this country. And the answers, they lie in a vision that brings Americans together, not only in the knowledge of what we must stand against, but in the confidence of knowing what we are for. This is the powerful majority we are gathering together, from Davenport to Dover, from Carson City to Columbia. It is a coalition of addition, not subtraction. It is a movement reaching into church basements and barber shops, into universities and union halls, carrying the same values with us everywhere we go. We saw that coalition awakening. We saw it tonight in cities and suburbs, from the seacoast to those industrial towns too often left behind. And together, we are building a future where there will be no such thing as an uninsured American or an unaffordable prescription. That's what we can deliver with a plan most Americans can get behind. Medicare for all who want it, ensuring care for every American, but trusting you to choose whether you want it and when you want it. Yeah. Together, we will stop enabling corporate greed and start raising wages, empowering workers, and making good on the idea that one job ought to be enough. Together, we will stop sending our young people into the teeth of endless wars and start recruiting every American We're go into now fight to, uh, for Bernie our Sanders. You can future. see he is getting ready to take, he's on the stage and getting ready to do our supporters. We'll move from Pete Buttigieg over to Bernie Sanders.
Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, New Hampshire. <laughs> Thank you, New Hampshire. Let me, let me take this opportunity to thank the people of New Hampshire for a great victory tonight. And, and the, let me thank the thousands of volunteers in New Hampshire. Thank you. Who knocked on doors in the rain and the snow and the cold. The reason that we won tonight in New Hampshire, we won last week in Iowa, It's because of the hard work of so many volunteers. And let me say tonight that this victory here is the beginning of the end for Donald Trump. behind us, popular vote in Iowa and the victory here tonight. We're going to Nevada. We're going to South Carolina. We're going to win those states as well. And tonight, I want to take the opportunity to express my appreciation and respect for all of the Democratic candidates we ran against. Pete Buttigieg. Amy Klobuchar, Elizabeth Warren, Joe Biden. And what I can tell you with absolute certainty, and I know I speak for every one of the Democratic candidates, is that no matter who wins, and we certainly hope it's going to be us, we are going to unite together. We are going to unite together and defeat the most dangerous president in the modern history of this country. And the reason I believe we are going to win is that we have an unprecedented grassroots movement from coast to coast of millions of people. The reason that we are going to win is that we are putting together an unprecedented, multi-generational, multi-racial political movement. And this is a movement from coast to coast, which is demanding that we finally have an economy and a government 
that works for all of us, not wealthy campaign contributors. And I want to thank all of those people who have worked and contributed to our campaign, but make the point that in this point in the campaign, we are taking on billionaires and we're taking on candidates funded by billionaires. But we are going to win because we have the agenda that speaks to the needs of working people throughout this country. Health care is a human right, not a privilege. The wealthy and powerful will start paying their fair share of taxes. We will make public colleges and universities tuition-free and cancel all student debt. Unlike Donald Trump, we know that climate change is very real and an existential crisis for our planet. We are prepared to tell the fossil fuel industry that their short-term profits are not more important than the future of our planet. We are going to end a racist and broken criminal justice system. We are going to pass comprehensive immigration reform. Our gun safety policies will be determined by the American people, not the NRA. And under our administration, it will be women, not the government, who control their own lives. Now, our campaign is not just about beating Trump. It is about transforming this country. It is about having the courage to take on Wall Street, the insurance companies, the drug companies, the fossil fuel industry, the military industrial complex. So tonight I want to thank the people of New Hampshire for this great victory thank our volunteers and urge all Americans to join our effort to transform this country at berniesanders.com. It's on to Nevada, it's on to South Carolina, it's on to win the Democratic nomination, and together. And together, I have no doubt that we will defeat Donald Trump. Thank you all very much.
Bernie Sanders greeting his supporters here in New Hampshire, walking off stage uh, to the cheers and on to Nevada and South Carolina for Bernie Sanders. Let's go back to our Election Insights team in Washington, led by Jeremy Bowers. Jeremy, what's the latest? Hey, thanks a lot, Libby. You know, a little bit has happened since the last time we talked to you. We've got some more votes, but no big changes in where the candidates are sitting. So let's take a look at that map and see what's going on. We are about 85% reporting now. We're getting pretty far into the night. Bernie Sanders continues to hold this 26% to about 24.5% lead over Pete Buttigieg. A reminder again on those colors, we've got Bernie Sanders in the purple, Pete Buttigieg in the green, Amy Klobuchar in the indigo, and Elizabeth Warren in the orange. The thing that you're going to see on that map, though, is that we have just two colors. We've got that Bernie Sanders. He's covered an awful lot of counties. He's done really well tonight in spreading out his support. But then we have Pete Buttigieg, who's won three counties tonight and has done a really good job in a couple of places that we didn't necessarily expect him to do well. Um, I'd like to point out a handful of other things that are looking really interesting about the race tonight. Now, this is the downtown Hillsboro is where we see the town of Manchester. Manchester is relatively large. It's an urban area that has a lot of voters. Earlier in the night, Bernie Sanders was doing very well here, upwards 28, 29% of the vote. Now he's fallen back to just 26%, Pete Buttigieg at 24 and a half. That basically mirrors what they were like in the state as a whole. And it's not surprising given how many voters are in this area. Uh, if the voters here look like the rest of the state, it's going to pull the rest of the numbers down quite a bit. And it's going to make it so that everybody looks roughly the same. Another area that I'd like to point out here is Rockingham County, where Buttigieg has done well all night. He's extended that lead over Bernie Sanders by about 3.5%. He was at the 1, maybe 1.5% range earlier in the night. This is a relatively large area of strength for Mayor Pete Buttigieg. Now, Amy Klobuchar is in third place. She has 20% of the vote. She didn't win any individual county, but she won several townships, especially near urban areas. And this is a relatively uh, important theme of her area. All right, I, we have a little bit of breaking news. This is very interesting. We're able to call this race. We're gonna be able to call it for Bernie Sanders. He's got 26% of the vote. And that's an, that's an interesting thing. Now, we had told you earlier in the night that we felt fairly confident that Bernie Sanders was going to do well, and he did. He held on to that lead over Mayor Pete Buttigieg, um, and he did it by winning all across the state. Now, for a little bit more insight on how that works, I would really like to talk to David Byler. David is an opinions columnist and a really fascinating human being. David, let's talk to you about this. What is it that you see going forward now? Pete Buttigieg in second place, Amy Klobuchar in third, but we got a big winner in Bernie Sanders. We finally have a winner, a clear winner in a state somewhere. What does this mean going forward? Yeah, so it means a few things. One is that Amy Klobuchar has sort of a new lease on life. It was unclear exactly how she was going to keep going on, uh, even after her sort of lower finish in Iowa. But here, she sort of made a shocking uh, resurgence. She's going to be able to get money, get votes in a way that she hasn't before. Pete Buttigieg, you can say largely the same thing. He held up from Iowa. He avoided uh, sort of the Marco Rubio-like surge and fall in between Iowa and New Hampshire. So that works. Bernie Sanders is really the big question mark. In national polls, he's been seeing some modest gains recently, especially after Iowa and as Biden has diminished. But he may not get the press that he wants out of this because a lot of people were expecting Sanders to win. And it's an odd thing having to think about media narratives in this sort of race, but it's kind of the reality of what we see in the empirical data that if a candidate exceeds expectations like Klobuchar, they often get a downstream bump. But it'll be interesting to see if that holds up with Sanders or not. All right, we've got that race call. We're still waiting for a couple votes to come in, but it shouldn't change the outcome. With that, we're going to toss it back to you in New Hampshire, Libby. All right, great. Thanks so much, Jeremy. Let's get our reaction here in New Hampshire. So Bernie Sanders, the projected winner in this state. But what does that actually mean, James? Well, it, it does mean Bernie Sanders got the most votes in the first two contests. That's a yeah. big deal. You know, historically, that would mean that person would get the nomination. Yeah. Now, it does not necessarily mean that. Bernie Sanders going to be formidable, going to be in this through the last contest in June. I think mm -hmm. that's what this means. Mm -hmm. Also, there are warning flags. We're still waiting to get the total vote count. But when you look at the number of votes that have been cast, that have been counted, it's it's about on par with 2016. You know, it was so much for all the Democratic energy we've heard so much about. Similarly, in Iowa last week, the caucus turnout was much closer to 2016, far below 2008. So it shows 
some warning signs for Sanders that he hasn't has expanded his coalition. A win is a win, and he deserves credit for winning Iowa, or I'm sorry, winning New Hampshire, getting the most votes, finishing slightly behind on delegates. But it, it there aren't signs that he's expanding the base, that he expanded, he was able to activate his own partisans. And I think that those are warning signs uh, if moderates can sort of get their act together and coalesce behind a stop Sanders candidate. Yeah, I think it means uh, two things. One is exactly what you said. Did Sanders lose support from 2016? You know, someone said to me, he doesn't like Sanders in the Democratic Party. He's been campaigning for basically five years. How can he arguably spin this as a win, you know, momentum-wise, if he loses support in New Hampshire? And then I think we're going to start having conversations about the moderate Democratic lane. Um, you know, before Klobuchar had surged, someone in D.C. had also said to me, does she and others do the right thing and drop out so that there can be more of a decision in how that establishment wing of the party attacks Bernie Sanders? I don't know if that's still a conversation that's going to be had this soon, given how well Klobuchar is doing. And then Warren and Biden are such massive figures in the party right now. I don't think anyone's pushing them out. But I think... I think it's time for Democrats to start thinking about that. Well, and if it goes through, you know, if, if, if Warren and Biden say, OK, I'm going to fight through South Carolina, mm -hmm. you know, I have enough money, I can not spend that much. What that means is there's still going to be kind of a muddle. And South Carolina's the it's Saturday so before, close before Super, Super Tuesday. Tuesday. It's literally three days before. Yeah. And so I think if you have a scenario where they're, it, you know, the, the vote is fragmented the way it is here in New Hampshire, in South Carolina, it's going to mean that it's fragmented on Super Tuesday when more than a third of the delegates are awarded. And that's going to mean potentially Bernie Sanders has the most delegates and that, you know, that you, it, it's easy to start speculating about what's going to happen in July in Milwaukee and, and we'll be there every step along the way, but it's not unimaginable that you could very quickly get into a scenario if Buttigieg and Klobuchar and Bloomberg uh, keep kind of splitting the moderate vote and Sanders keeps plotting along at 25 to 30% that you could have a contested convention that's not decided on the first ballot in Milwaukee should be the first truly contested national convention since 1976 or 1968. Of course, I remember having these same conversations exactly. about and the I, Republicans I, exactly. four years ago. And, and, and you as, you, as you yeah. point out, it's, it's a long way to go. <laughs> let's go back to our colleague Joyce Coe, who's live with the Sanders campaign in Manchester. Uh, Joyce, I, I'd love to hear what your reflections are on tonight. Well, he had, uh, he kind of came out to a boisterous crowd, giving a very victorious speech uh, to this crowd that was just cheering for him and clapping for several minutes before he was able to um, even begin his speech. And that is sort of parallel to the reaction that we see at, sort of, at his campaign uh, events on a smaller scale, obviously. There were tons of people in this room, um, including Celine Levin. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, I wanted to ask you, what does that feel like to be in this room, being a supporter of Bernie Sanders as he's winning um, the first primary in the country? It's, it's stunning. It's, it's just invigorating and encouraging, and um, it's everything I hope for and more. You're from Massachusetts, and you have sort of volunteered your time um, caucusing for him. What have you seen from... Uh, talking to people in, in this area about, you know, seeing support for him or um, discussing various issues with them. Have you seen um, sort of this groundswell of support? I think that in New Hampshire, it's a very mixed community, but the people that are behind Bernie are incredibly passionate. The grassroots movement that has increased since 2016 is phenomenal. And and he's got more individual donors than any other candidate. And it's, it's, it's really heartwarming and invigorating. What will you do now that Bernie has won New Hampshire? What will you, will you continue to volunteer? What, what does it look like for you? I'm going to continue to volunteer in Massachusetts. Um, I'm going to possibly volunteer to monitor the, the voting behavior. Uh, I was talking to somebody here about that tonight, so I'm going to possibly get involved with that. I'm going to continue to donate money and, and work for Bernie. What do you think this win indicates for Sanders and the rest of the uh, primary process going forward? I think it's a huge win because the candidate field is so large. And 
when you really add together the progressives, they come up with a sizable percentage. And I consider that to be Andrew Yang and Elizabeth Warren and Tom Steyer. When you add those those percentages and votes in with Bernie's, it's, it's pretty sizable. All right, Helene, thank you so much for chatting with us. It's been a long night. I know you're exhausted. Well, it's been totally a pleasure meeting you and hanging out with you. Thank you so much. It's been a long night, but it's been a good night for uh, Bernie Sanders supporters here. I'll send it back to you, Libby. Joyce, uh, Joyce, I have a quick question for you. I saw you putting out on, uh, reporting yeah. on social media that when Pete Buttigieg came out on the TV monitor that some of the Sanders supporters started booing him. We're hearing all this call for unity from the candidates, but, but what is the mood in the room there? So, um, uh, Libby, the, the big screen that's behind me was um, playing Pete Buttigieg's victory speech when he came out and started speaking to his crowd, but obviously they were seeing the feed of that speech happening here. So when he came out, uh, we heard a, an overwhelming boo from the crowd. And then a couple minutes um, after his speech, we started hearing this chant, Wall Street Pete, Wall Street Pete. So those are two um, instances where we heard the crowd here at the Bernie Sanders event um, sort of vocalizing their... Um, just taste for Buttigieg, but as you heard in Sanders' speech tonight, he said that no matter who wins in November, um, that, that we will, you know, unite is what he said behind whoever that candidate is. All right, Joyce Coe, thank you so much. Appreciate that reporting. Let's check back in now with Jorge Ribas, who's live at the Buttigieg campaign event in Nashua. Hey, uh, Jorge. Hey, Libby. So you see behind me now, everyone's kind of clearing out and packing up, but just a little while ago, Buttigieg, Buttigieg came up and spoke to the crowd. Um, one of the most interesting things he said at the beginning is he thanked Bernie Sanders and Amy Klobuchar for such a strong showing, which was kind of an interesting phrasing to put because at the time, what we knew was that Bernie Sanders was leading in the race, and now we've, it's been called for him. Um, and then he talked a lot about his electability. He talked about beating Donald Trump. A lot of it was stuff that he talks about at his events and his rallies. Um, but it sounded very much like a victory speech. And he talked, he really made a hard point on his electability, electability, which is something that we heard from his supporters at all the events we went to, that they really liked the way he talked. They really thought he was the person who could beat Trump in November. Um, he also, you know, he mentioned going on to Nevada and South Carolina. And obviously, those are two states that are going to present different challenges for him. He has to win over the Latino vote in Nevada, and he also, he also has to look at the African-American vote in South Carolina. So going forward, he has to look at how to expand his voter base, and he also has to look at uh, candidates who are surging, Bernie Sanders in front of him, and then Amy Klobuchar coming up kind of on his heels. So he's got a lot of challenges going up in the next couple of weeks. Everyone here was very excited, really happy, but um, going forward, it'll be interesting to see what, how his campaign does that. Um, so Libby, that's it for me tonight here. Um, Oh, okay. Oh, so listen. Oh, Jeremy, back to you at uh, in DC. Yep. Hey, thanks for that. You know, we're pretty excited. We've got a wrap here on the things tonight. We've got Bernie Sanders called as the winner in New Hampshire. This is a relatively big deal. But the next step for us is to figure out what happens after New Hampshire. And for that, we're going to take a little look at the road ahead. So we've already got in our rear view Iowa with its 41 delegates and. Tonight, we have finished off New Hampshire with its 24. That's pretty good, but it's really not meaningful totals for either for the candidates who've won any of these races. It's certainly not going to make a dent in the 1900 that you need to win the convention. But coming ahead, we have some interesting states that are going to have uh, impacts on how the candidates campaign. Next up, we're going to have Nevada, uh, a Saturday and a half, uh, uh, not a full week, but two weeks from now. We have the Nevada caucuses on a Saturday night. Then we also have the South Carolina primary, where there are 54 delegates at stake. Now, the interesting thing about Nevada and South Carolina are that these are two places where there are a lot of non-white voters compared to places like Iowa and New Hampshire. And there's going to be different candidates who do well and do poorly here. Now, finally, after South Carolina, we've got the big mojo of 
Super Tuesday. Now, the deal with Super Tuesday is this. Each one of these four states was worth a, a little delegate haul for each of the candidates, but really nothing that mathematically makes a huge difference on what you need to win the nomination. Sure, there's going to be interesting things that are going to come up for the winners. They're going to be able to campaign more effectively. They're going to be able to raise money. They're going to be people who drop out, and that means that there are more votes to be gathered. But Super Tuesday is the first time at which that delegate haul actually starts making an actual dent on the number of delegates necessary in order to win. All right, that's the road ahead that we've got. I'm gonna have to kick it back to you in New Hampshire, Libby. All right, great, Jeremy, thank you so much. You know, th those delegate counts are so helpful to put things in perspective. But, okay, New Hampshire, small number of delegates, but significant in the national conversation. Hugely important, yeah. and, and what happens in New Hampshire won't stay here. It's going to have consequences in Nevada and in South Carolina. It's going to have huge consequences on fundraising. Uh, and, and I think that Amber's right. There's going to be a lot of conversation at the elite level. We, when, when the speeches started, we were talking about what is the Stop Sanders movement? Will there be a Stop Bernie movement? It's interesting because he's actually viewed much more favorably at this point than Donald Trump was in the Republican Party four years ago when you sort of started to see the Never Trump movement emerge. Trump's unfavorability number was really high. One of the things you saw during last Friday night's debate was uh, the moderator read the question that uh, the comment that Hillary Clinton had recently made uh, and, and said, Hillary Clinton says, you're, no one likes you. You've never gotten anything done. And Joe Biden gave Sanders a hug. Yeah, and he walked out of the podium. Said, and right. Him. And then Klobuchar said, Sander, Bernie and I have worked on a bill on prescription mm -hmm. drugs together. And so I think one of the complicating things kind of with the with getting a stop Sanders to movement together for the establishment is he's not a detested figure the way that Trump was, at least at, you know, at this mm -hmm. point four years ago. Obviously, that changed later. And so I think you could see a scenario where Sanders is still chugging along with 25 to 30 percent going into these these other early states. There's just this 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 issue, though, of the candidates who keep saying and keep emphasizing party unity, mm -hmm. talking about each other in you know complimentary terms in a night like this. They were able to pivot and attack Trump, especially since Trump was here in New Hampshire just last night. But then I think it's not insignificant that you hear from Joyce reporting at the Sanders event that the crowds are booing when Pete Buttigieg comes on the monitor. So, so there is this real question of, you know, who, who who wags the dog there and who leads that? And are the supporters of Sanders going to take his cue if they do need to pivot their support someplace else? Yeah, that's a tough question. You know, I'm, th I'm thinking of the reverse to that question yeah. is do, do moderate Democratic yeah. leaders support him? Senator Joe Manchin, a, a really leader of that wing of, of kind of the more conservative Democrats, said today, he was not sure if he would vote vote for Bernie Sanders if he were the nominee. And one question about Bernie Sanders and you know becoming the nominee, you know, there's this question about would he bring out the vote? Who would he bring out? But there is a growing concern among these moderate Democrats who are down the ballot, especially the House members who come up every two years, whose names will appear on the ballot with whoever is the Democratic nominee. Can a voter go in the ballot booth and support both Bernie Sanders and a moderate Democrat in some you know suburban district in Pennsylvania? So that's part of the, you know, the anxiety and concern among the moderates. And they're the ones who are going to have to prosecute that case. Right. Uh, Anthony Brindisi is another good example. He gave an interview to the Syracuse newspaper today, upstate New York. It's a district Trump won by 15 points. A Democrat picked it up in the 2018 midterms. He said, people in my district do not want Elizabeth Warren or Bernie Sanders to be the nominee. I'm not sure I could support him. It's going to be people like Brindisi and Manchin who are saying that because I think the dynamic we're going to have in the coming 10 days is... Well, Buttigieg and Sanders have sort of gone after each other as useful foils. They're appealing to different kinds of voters. The exit polls make that clear. And so the contest, I think, is going to be Klobuchar and Buttigieg sort of going back and forth. And there's not really, it's not clear who, other than maybe Elizabeth Warren, has an incentive to go after Sanders, which is, you don't want to fight the last war. You don't want to draw too many comparisons to 2016. But that was what happened with Trump was, you know, Rubio was, they, they all kind of, there was a collective action problem. And, and I think that that is in the short term, probably going to work to Sanders's advantage. Listen, socialism polls, according to a Gallup survey, about as well as atheists to be a president of the United States. And Sanders is unrelenting in describing himself as a democratic socialist. He gave a speech this fall, this fall excuse me, about why that is not only an okay term to use, but in his mind, a winning term. You know, it fits in with his narrative of a revolution. Let's do something really big to unseat Trump and make the country better. 
I do not know how Democrats and the establishment deal with that. And one of the things that's going to be fascinating, Amber's absolutely correct, is is Sanders is sort of like, and you could see it, you know, on the on his and his wife's face and their family, like, gosh, we could be the Democratic nominee for president. And and it, you know, if you're the Democratic nominee, you have a, an even money chance of being president. And and it will be fascinating now that we finish these first two states to see if Sanders starts to walk some of that stuff back. He's been so consistent on so many issues for so long. If all of a sudden Sanders says, well, I'm not really a socialist, you know, that to try to build his coalition, that will be a huge moment. And that's obviously a difficult balancing act because part of the appeal to voters is that he's not like a conventional politician. On the other hand, you know, if Sanders is running around calling himself a democratic socialist, it's very difficult to imagine him carrying a state like Florida. You know, where there are so many people who've experienced a different kind of socialism, but socialism all the same. We've talked a lot tonight about electability. We've talked about the the candidate's character. We've talked about uh, sort of where they are on the political spectrum. We haven't talked a lot about issues. And, of course, you know, these candidates have these stump speeches. They've been going out and giving all around New Hampshire, Iowa, just a few short weeks ago, where they're talking about issues. And I want to get a sense from you, James, about, you know, how health care is really a big part of this conversation here in New Hampshire in particular, um, and, and where that's left someone like Bernie Sanders or, or a Pete Buttigieg or Amy Klobuchar in relation to the electorate. So one of the, it's, it's amazing. So our exit poll shows healthcare by far the top concern for vote for Democratic voters. And amazingly, the majority of people support Medicare for all. So even though Sanders won with, you know, less than 30% of the vote and None of those other candidates in the in the top support Medicare for all. There is actually a desire. There's sort of this feeling that the healthcare system is broken. This is one of the oldest states in the country. Uh, people have sort of seen firsthand a lot of these challenges, and so it has come up. I've been struck. It, it came up a lot. Healthcare came up a lot in Iowa, but I've been here now. Seven, this is my seventh day here. Every event I've gone to, a voter's asked about it. Someone's gone up to one of the candidates on the rope line and talked about it, and Sanders is speaking to it unapologetically mm -hmm. and maybe even if people don't agree with everything he do or they like their doctor and don't want to lose their private insurance the fact that sanders is so outspoken on healthcare, i do think helped him because that is there was a, another poll that came out this week that said more than 50 percent of democrat of democratic rank and file people said they want the candidates talking more about health care that was like three times any other issue and so I think that that is going to be one of those things. And it's, it's part of the explanation, too, for why Warren faded, which is that she couldn't really it, she, it took her a couple months to explain the middle ground between Medicare for all and what she came up with. And and Buddha judge has sort of stuck to the slogan of Medicare for all who want it. And Biden has said, let's expand Obamacare. And that's sort of where Klobuchar has also been this right. They have a public option. Mm -hmm. So I, I do think that the exit polls suggest, you know, Nevada is also a really old state. Um, as is South Carolina. South Carolina is a little younger. Nevada is a lot of retirees. Uh, so it's it, it's it's the same similar situation where there's a lot of old people who are, and, and actually, interestingly, you know, Sanders doesn't do as well with old people. Buttigieg mm -hmm. did well with old people. And a lot of older voters, people over 55, uh, are concerned about Medicare for all. It tends to be less popular with older voters, just as socialism Who tends tend to, to be, be a little more popular. conservative. They tend to be more conservative, but they're also worried about losing what they have. Yeah. You know, they and and so young people, I think, are less kind of anxious about. And the, and we saw that with Buttigieg's speech, where he said it's it's a false choice to say revolution or status quo. Yeah. Those of us want something in the middle. And and Sanders is saying let's complete the revolution, and uh, and Biden is saying. Let's return to the Obama status quo. Right, and then you've got Amy Klobuchar, right. and uh, and and how she, she's she's sort of doing that. You know, this is not realistic. Let's let let's let's have some choice here. So tied to the question of healthcare is prescription drugs. Uh, also, the question, especially in a state like New Hampshire, opioid issues. Big, big, a lot of attention brought to that four years ago. Still a part of the conversation here in New, in New Hampshire. But as we go on to Nevada, prescription drugs and drugs and healthcare something on voters' minds. It'll be interesting to see which message really resonates. Yeah, and, you know, absolutely health care and all the, you know, the, yeah. the splintered off all issues. The tree, all, all, the, all the branches, yeah. Thank you. Our, our, our big, uh, for Nevada, as James pointed out, a state with a lot of retirees, there, the, you know, Nevada has, also has a lot of political activists on the younger side who tend, and I just, every time I go to a campaign event, they're nodding their heads and cheering, can't talk about gun control. That's huge. Mm -hmm. Immigration. There is 
a little bit less uh, divisiveness or disagreement than the Democratic Party on immigration, but that's still, you know, a massive issue because it's the defining issue for President Trump. So I think a candidate who can really seize the lane on immigration can give voters a preview of how they might go after Trump in the general election and speak to that electability argument as well. Amber, I love hearing you talk about Nevada since you reported from there. So you've got a lot of insight into that electorate. We'll be watching to see how you cover uh, the lead up to Nevada as well as South Carolina. You both have reporting yet to do tonight. Am I correct in that? Right. Do you have you <laughs> to gonna, file? Got to file a story tonight. So I'm going to write the Daily 202 for the morning. And you have to file the Daily 202, which means uh, recording a podcast at some point tonight <laughs> and getting out your newsletter in the morning. <laughs> Thank you so much I'm to the, both of you really for being a part to, of this. Be really. Part Thank you. Thank you. Um, what a night. Uh, thank you for joining us. And a huge thanks again to James and Amber for sharing another memorable New Hampshire primary tonight. And we really thank you, our viewers and readers, for choosing to watch all of this breaking political news with the reporters of The Washington Post. So whether you're watching on our homepage or on YouTube, please take a moment to subscribe to our newspaper so that you don't miss any part of this election season. I'm Libby Casey. Good night from New Hampshire.